A Christmas Carol, Stave Five, by Charles Dickens, read in English. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The end of it. Yes. And the bedpost was his own, the bed was his own, the room was his own, best and happiest of all, the time before him was his own, to make amends in. I will live in the past, the present, and the future, Scrooge repeated as he scrambled out of bed. The spirits of all three shall strive within me. Oh, Jacob Marley! heaven and the christmas time be praised for this i say it on my knees old jacob on my knees he was so fluttered and so glowing with his good intentions that his broken voice would scarcely answer to his call he had been sobbing violently in his conflict with the spirit and his face was wet with tears they are not torn down cried scrooge folding one of his bed curtains in his arms they are not torn down rings and all they are here i am here the shadows of the things that would have been may be dispelled they will be i know they will his hands were busy with his garments all this time turning them inside out putting them on upside down tearing them mislaying them making them parties to every kind of extravagance. "'I don't know what to do!' cried Scrooge, laughing and crying in the same breath, and making a perfect lacoon of himself with his stockings. "'I am as light as a feather. I am as happy as an angel. I am as merry as a schoolboy. I am as giddy as a drunken man. A merry Christmas to everybody. A happy New Year to all the world.' hello here whoop hello he had frisked into the sitting-room and was now standing there perfectly winded there's the saucepan that the gruel was in cried scrooge starting off again and going round the fireplace there's the door by which the ghost of jacob marley entered there's the corner where the ghost of christmas present sat there's the window where i saw the wandering spirits it's all right it's all true it all happened <laughs> really for a man who had been out of practice for so many years it was a splendid laugh a most illustrious laugh the father of a long long line of brilliant laughs i don't know what day of the month it is said scrooge i don't know how long i have been among the spirits i don't know anything i'm quite a baby oh never mind i don't care i'd rather be a baby hello whoop hello here he was checked in his transports by the church's ringing out the lustiest peals he had ever heard clash clash hammer ding dong bell bell dong ding hammer clang clash oh glorious glorious running to the window he opened it and put out his head no fog no mist clear bright jovial stirring cold cold piping for the blood to dance to golden sunlight heavenly sky sweet fresh air merry bells oh glorious glorious what's today cried scrooge calling downward to a boy in sunday clothes who perhaps had loitered in to look about him eh returned the boy with all his might of wonder what's today my fine fellow said scrooge today replied the boy why christmas day it's christmas day said scrooge to himself i haven't missed it the spirits have done it all in one night oh they can do anything they like of course they can of course they can hello my fine fellow hello returned the boy do you know the poulterers in the next street but one at the corner 
Scrooge inquired. I should hope I did, replied the lad. An intelligent boy, said Scrooge, a remarkable boy. Do you know whether they've sold the prize turkey that was hanging up there? Not the little prize turkey, the big one. What? The one as big as me? returned the boy. What a delightful boy, said Scrooge. It's a pleasure to talk to him. Yes, my buck. It's hanging there now, replied the boy. Is it? said Scrooge. Go and buy it. Walker! exclaimed the boy. No, no, said Scrooge. I am in earnest. Go and buy it, and tell him to bring it here, that I may give them the directions where to take it. Come back with the man, and I'll give you a shilling. Come back with him in less than five minutes, and I'll give you half a crown. The boy was off like a shot. He must have had a steady hand at a trigger, who could have got a shot off half so fast. I'll send it to Bob Cratchit's, whispered Scrooge, rubbing his hands and splitting with a laugh. He shan't know who sends it. It's twice the size of Tiny Tim. Joe Miller never made such a joke as sending it to Bob's will be. The hand in which he wrote the address was not a steady one, but write it he did, somehow, and went downstairs to open the street door, ready for the coming of the poulterer's man. As he stood there, waiting his arrival, the knocker caught his eye. "'I shall love it as long as I live,' cried Scrooge, patting it with his hand. "'I scarcely ever looked at it before. What an honest expression it has in its face. It's a wonderful knocker.' "'Oh, here's the turkey. Hello. Oh, how are you? Merry Christmas.' It was a turkey. He never could have stood upon his legs, that bird. He would have snapped him short off in a minute, like sticks of sealing wax. "'Why, it's impossible to carry that to Camden Town,' said Scrooge. "'You must have a cab.' The chuckle with which he said this, and the chuckle with which he paid for the turkey, and the chuckle with which he paid for the cab, and the chuckle with which he recompensed the boy, were only to be exceeded by the chuckle with which he sat down breathless in his chair again, and chuckled till he cried." Shaving was not an easy task, for his hand continued to shake very much, and shaving requires attention, even when you don't dance while you're at it. But if he had cut the end of his nose off, he would have put a piece of sticking plaster over it and been quite satisfied. He dressed himself all in his best, and at last got out into the streets. The people were by this time pouring forth, as he had seen them with the ghost of Christmas present and walking with his hands behind him, Scrooge regarded every one with a delighted smile. He looked so irresistibly pleasant, in a word, that three or four good-humoured fellows said, "'Good morning, sir, and Merry Christmas to you!' And Scrooge said often afterwards that, of all the blithe sounds he had ever heard, those were the blithest in his ears. He had not gone far when, coming on towards him, he beheld the portly gentleman who had walked into his counting-house the day before, and said, Scrooge and Morley's, I believe. It sent a pang across his heart to think how this old gentleman would look upon him when they met. But he knew what path lay straight before him, and he took it. My dear sir, said Scrooge, quickening his pace and taking the old gentleman by both his hands, how do you do? I hope you succeeded yesterday. It was very kind of you. A Merry Christmas to you, sir. Mr. Scrooge? Yes, said Scrooge. That is my name, and I fear it may not be pleasant to you. Allow me to ask your pardon. And will you have the goodness? Here Scrooge whispered in his ear. Lord bless me, cried the gentleman, as if his breath were taken away. "'My dear Mr. Scrooge, are you serious?' "'If you please,' said Scrooge, "'not a farthing less. "'A great many back payments are included in it, I assure you. "'Will you do me that favor? "'My dear sir,' said the other, shaking hands with him, "'I don't know what to say to such bonafide. "'Don't say anything, please,' retorted Scrooge. "'Come and see me. "'Will you come and see me?' "'I will.' cried the old gentleman, and it was clear he meant to do it. 
thank ye said scrooge i am much obliged to you i thank you fifty times bless you he went to church and walked about the streets and watched the people hurrying to and fro and patted the children on the head and questioned beggars and looked down into the kitchens of houses and up to the windows and found that everything could yield him pleasure he had never dreamed that any walk that anything could give him so much happiness in the afternoon he turned his steps towards his nephew's house he passed the door a dozen times before he had the courage to go up and knock but he made a dash and did it is your master at home my dear said scrooge to the girl nice girl very yes sir where is he my love said scrooge he's in the dining-room sir along with mistress i'll show you upstairs if you please well thank ye he knows me said scrooge with his hand already on the dining-room lock i'll go in here my dear he turned it gently and sidled his face in round the door they were looking at the table which was spread out in great array for these young housekeepers are always nervous on such points and like to see that everything is right fred said scrooge dear heart alive how his niece by marriage started scrooge had forgotten for the moment about her sitting on the corner with the footstool or he wouldn't have done it on any account why bless my soul cried fred who is that it's i your uncle scrooge i have come to dinner will you let me in fred let him in it's a mercy he didn't shake his arm off he was at home in five minutes nothing could be hardier his niece looked just the same so did topper when he came so did the plump sister when she came so did everyone when they came wonderful party wonderful games wonderful unanimity wonderful happiness but he was early at the office next morning oh he was early there if he could only be there first and catch bob cratchit coming late that was the thing he had set his heart upon and he did it yes he did the clock struck nine no bob a quarter past no bob he was full eighteen minutes and a half behind his time scrooge sat with his door wide open that he might see him come into the tank his hat was off before he opened the door his comforter too he was on his stool in a jiffy driving away with his pen as if he were trying to overtake nine o'clock hello growled scrooge in his accustomed voice as near as he could feign it what do you mean by coming here at this time of day i am very sorry sir said bob i am behind my time you are repeated scrooge yes i think you are step this way sir if you please it's only once a year sir pleaded bob appearing from the tank it shall not be repeated i was making rather merry yesterday sir now i'll tell you what my friend said scrooge i am not going to stand this sort of thing any longer and therefore he continued leaping from his stool and giving bob such a dig in the waistcoat that he staggered back into the tank again and therefore i am about to raise your salary bob trembled and got a little nearer to the ruler he had a momentary idea of knocking scrooge down with it holding him and calling to the people in the court for help in a straight waistcoat a merry christmas bob said scrooge with an earnestness that could not be mistaken as he clapped him on the back a merrier christmas bob my good fellow than i have given you for many a year i will raise your salary and endeavor to assist your struggling family and we will discuss your affairs this very afternoon over a christmas bowl of smoking bishop bob make up the fires and buy another coal scuttle before you dot another i bob cratchit scrooge was better than his word he did it all and infinitely more and to tiny tim who did not die he was a second father he became as good a friend as good a master 
and as good a man as the good old city knew or any other good old city town or borough in the good old world some people laughed to see the alteration in him but he let them laugh and little heeded them for he was wise enough to know that nothing ever happened on this globe for good at which some people did not have their fill of laughter in the outset and knowing that such as these would be blind anyway he thought it quite as well they should wrinkle up their eyes and grins as have the malady in less attractive forms his own heart laughed and that was quite enough for him he had no further intercourse with spirits but lived upon the total abstinence principle ever afterwards and it was always said of him that he knew how to keep christmas well if any man alive possessed the knowledge may that be truly said of us and all of us and so as tiny tim observed god bless us every one End of A Christmas Carol, Stave 5, by Charles Dickens. Read by Greg Giordano. A Great Tree, by Zona Gale. Read in English. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. I never had felt so much like Christmas, said Calliope Marsh, as I did that year. I wished, I says, when it got most time, I wished I knew somebody to have a Christmas tree with. Well, Calliope Marsh, says Miss Postmaster Sykes, looking surprised on purpose the way she does, Ain't there enough poor and neglected folks in this world to please anybody? I didn't say have a Christmas tree for, I says back at her. I says have one with. I don't know what you mean by that difference, she says, I'm sure. I don't know, I says, as I know either, but there is a difference somewhere. I'd kind of like to have a tree with folks this year. Why don't you help on your church tree? Miss Sykes asked me. They're going to spend quite a little money on theirs this year. I hate to box Christmas up in a church, I says. Why, Calliope Marsh, she says, shocked. I didn't want to hurt her feelings, I ain't never one of those that likes to throw their IDs in folks' faces and watch folks jump back. So I tried to talk about something else, but she went right on trying her best to help me out. The ward schools is each going to have a tree this year, I hear, she says. Why don't you go in on your ward, Calliope, and help out there? They'd be real glad of help, you know. I hate to divide Christmas off into wards, I says to her. Well, then, go in with a family, she says. Any of us will be real glad to have you, she adds, generous. We would. Come to ours. We're going to have a great big tree for the children. I've been stringing popcorn and cutting the paper for it whenever I got an odd minute. The Holcombs, they're going to have one, too. And Miss Uppers and Miss Merriman and even the Hubblethwaites and Abigail Arnold for her little nieces. I never see a year when everybody was going to celebrate so nice. Come on with one of us, why don't you? Well, I says, maybe I will. I'll see. I don't know yet what I will do, I told her. And I went off down the street. What I wanted to say was... I hate to box Christmas up in a family, but I didn't quite dare, yet. Friendship Village ain't ever looked much more like Christmas to my notion than it did that December. Just the right snow had come, and no more, and just the right cold, and no more. The moon was getting along so's about the night of the 25th it was going to loom up big and gold and warm over the fields on the flats, 
where it always comes up in winter like it had just edged around there to get sort of a wide front yard for its big show, where the whole village could have a porch seat. You know, when you live in a village, you always know whether the moon is new or to the full, or where it is and when it's going to be. But when you live in a city, you just look up in the sky some night and say, Oh, that's so, there's the moon, and go right on thinking about something else. Here in the village that December, everything was getting ready, deliberate, for a full moon Christmas like long ago. The moon and the cold and the snow and all them public things was doing their best together for our common Christmas. All but us. It seemed like all of us humans was working for it separate. Tramping along there in the snow that night, I thought over what Miss Sykes had said and about all the places she'd mentioned over was going to have Christmas trees. And I looked along to the houses, most of them lying right there on Daphne Street, where they were going to have them. I could see them all, one tree after another, lighted and streaming from house to house all up and down Daphne Street, just the way they were going to look. And then there was the little back streets and the houses down on the flats, where there wouldn't be any trees nor much of any Christmas. Of course, as Miss Sykes had said, the poor and the neglected are always with us. Yet. But I didn't want to pounce down on any of them with a bag of fruit and a box of animal crackers and set and watch them. That wasn't what I meant by having a Christmas with somebody. There'd ought to be some place, I was beginning to think, when right along where I was, by the market square, I come on five or six children kicking around in the snow. It was most dark, but I could just make them out. Eddie Newhaven, Arthur Mills, Lily Doran, and two, three more. Hello, folks, I says. What you doing? Having a carnival? Because it's on the market square that carnivals and some little circuses and things that belongs to everybody is usually celebrated. Little Arthur Mills spoke up. No, he says. We was just playing we selling a load of Christmas trees. Christmas trees, I says. Why, that's so. This is where they always bring them to sell. Big load of them for everybody, ain't it? They're going to bring an awful big load here this time, says Eddie Newhaven. Big enough for everybody in town to have one. Most of the fellows is going to have them. Us and Ned Backus and the Cartwrights and Joe Tyrell and Lifty, all of them. My, I says, what a lot of Christmas trees. Why, if they was set along by the curbstone here on Daphne Street, I says, just to please the children and make a little talk with them. Why, the line of them would reach all up and down the town, I says. Wouldn't that be fun? Little Lily claps her hands. Oh, yes, she cries, wouldn't that be fun, with popcorn strings all going from one to the other? It would be a grand sight, says I, looking down across the market square. There, hanging all golden quiet, like it didn't think it amounted to much, right over the big cedar of Lebanon-looking tree in the square, was the moon, crooked to a horn. Once, says Eddie Newhaven, when they was selling the Christmas trees here, they kept right on selling them after dark, and they stood them around here and put a little light in each one. It was awful nice. Wouldn't it be nice if they'd do that all over the square sometime? It would be a grand sight, says I again, but one that the folks in this town would never have time for. While I spoke, I was looking down across Market Square again, toward the moon hanging over the cedar of Lebanon-looking tree. There's a pretty good-looking tree there already, I says idle. What a grand thing it would be all lit up, says I, for not much of any reason, only to keep the talk going with the children. Then something went through me from my head to my feet. 
Why not light it some time? I says. The children set up a little shout, part because they liked it, part because they thought such a thing could never be. I laughed with them, and I went on up the street. But all the time, something in me kept on saying something, all hurried and as if it meant it. And little ends of ideas, and little jagged edges of other ideas, and plans part raveled out that you thought you could knit up again, and long, sharp notions, a little something like light, kept going through my head and going through it. Down to the next corner, I met Ben Corey, that keeps the livery stable and sings bass to nearly everybody's funeral and to other public occasions. Ben, I says, excited, though I hadn't thought anything about this till that minute. Ben, you getting up any Christmas Eve Christmas carols to sing this year? He had a new string of sleigh bells over his shoulder, and he give it a shift. I recollect, so's they all jingled. Well, he says, I did allow to do it, but I've spoke to one or two, and they dunno's they can do it. Some has got to sing to churches earlier in the evening, and they don't know's if they want to tune up all night. And the most has got to be home for family Christmas. There ain't, I says, no manner of doubt about the folks that'd be glad to listen, is there? Provided you had the singers. Oh, sure, he says. Folks shines up to music considerable Christmas Eve. It sort of, well, it. Yes, I says. I know, it does, don't it? Well, Ben Corey, you get your Christmas carol singers together in a caroling, and I'll undertake that there shan't nothing much stand in the way of their being out on Christmas Eve. Is it a bargain? His face lit up all jolly and hearty. Why, sure, it's a bargain, he says. I'll get 'em. I wanted to, only I didn't want to carol 'em any more than they wanted to be caroled. I'll get 'em, he says, and gives his bells a hunch that made 'em ring all up and down Daphne Street, that the moon was looking down at just as if it was public property, and not all made up of little private plans. With just room enough for us four and no more, or figures to that effect. I don't know if you've ever managed any kind of a revolution. There's two kind of revolutions. One breaks off of something that's always been. You pick up the broke piece and try to throw it away to make room for something that's growing out of the other part. And most everybody will begin to tell you that the growing piece ain't any good. But that the other part is the kind you've always bought, and that you'd better save it and stick it back on. But then, there's the other kind of revolution that backs away from something that's always been, and looks at it a little further off than it ever see it before, and says, "Let's move a little way around and pay attention to this thing from a new spot." And real often, if you put it that way. There's enough people willing to do that, because they know they can go right back afterward and stand in the same old place if they want to. Well, this last was the kind of a revolution I took charge of that week before Christmas. I got my plans and my ideas and my notions all planned and thought and budded, and then I presented 'em around, abundant. The very next morning after I'd seen the children, I started out. While I had kind of a glow to drape around the difficulties, so as I couldn't see 'em, I went first to the storekeepers, seeing Christmas always seems to hinge and hang on what they say and do, and I went to Eppleby Holcomb, because I knew he'd see it like I'd done, and I wanted the brace of being agreed with, like you do. Eppleby's store was all decorated up with green cut paper. And tassels and turkey red calico poinsettias, and it looked real nice and tasty. And the store was full of the country trade. The little overhead track that took the bundles had broke down just at the wrong minute, and old rich Miss Wiswell's felt soles had got stuck halfway, and Eppleby himself was on top of the counter trying to rescue him for her, while she made tart remarks below. 
when he'd fished them out and wrapped them up for her. Appleby, I says, would you be willing to shut up shop on Christmas Eve, or wouldn't you? He looked kind of startled. It's a pretty good night for trade, you know, Calliope, says he, doubtful. Why, yes, I says, it is. But everybody that's going to give presents to people will give presents to people. And if the stores ain't open Christmas Eve, folks will buy them when the stores is open. Is that sense or ain't it? He knew it was. And when I told him what I'd got hold of, straight places in my head, he says if the rest would shut, he'd shut and be glad of it. Abigail Arnold done the same about her home bakery, and the Gecker Jacks and two, three more. But Silas Sykes that keeps the post office store, he was firm. If that ain't woman foolish, he says, I don't know what is. You ain't no more idea of business than so many cats. No, sir, I don't betray the public by cutting them off of one evening shopping like that. It made a nice little sentence to quote, and I quoted it considerable. And the result was, the rest of them that knew Silas, head and heart, finally says, all right, he could keep open if he wanted to and enjoy himself, and they'd all shut up. I honestly think they kind of appreciated in a nice neighborly way, making Silas feel mean, when he'd ought to. It was a little harder to make the Sunday school superintendent see the thing that I had in my head. Of course, when a thing has been the way it's been for a good while, you can't really blame people for feeling that it's been the way it ought to be. Feeling seems made that way. Our superintendent has been our superintendent for most forty years, ever since the church was built. And, of course, his thought has kind of turned to bone in some places, naturally. His name is Jerry Bemis, and he keeps a little harness shop next door to the town hall that's across from Market Square. When I went in that day, he was resting from making harnesses, and he was practicing on his cornet. He can make a bugle call real nice. You can often hear it going up and down Daphne Street in the morning. And when I'm down doing my trading, I always like to hear it. It gives me kind of a nice old-fashioned feeling, like when Abigail Arnold fries doughnuts in the back of the home bakery, and we can all smell them out in the road. Jerry, I says, how much is our Sunday school Christmas tree going to cost us? Jerry's got a wooden leg, and he cannot remember not to try to cross it over the other one. He done that now and give it up. We calculate about twenty-five dollars, says he, proud. What we going to do to celebrate? Well, he says, have speaking pieces. We got a program of twenty numbers already, says he, pleased. And a trim tree, and an orange and a bag of nuts and candy for every child, he says. All the other churches is going to do the same, I says. Five trees and five programs and five sets of stuff all around, and all of them on Christmas Eve, when you'd think we'd all sort of draw together instead of setting apart and cliques. Land, I says out. That first Christmas Eve, wouldn't the angels have stopped singing and wept in the sky if they could have seen what we'd do to it? Hush, Calliope says Jerry Bemis, shocked. They ain't no need to be sacrilegious, is they? Not a bit, says I. We've been it so long already, worshipping around in sections like Hottentots. Well now, I says, do you honestly think we've all chose the best way to go at Christmas Eve for the children, filling them up with colored stuff and getting their stomachs all upset? We had quite a little talk about it back and forth, Jerry and me. And all of a sudden, while I was trying my best to make him see what I saw, I happened to notice his bugle again. There ain't no thrill in none of it, I was saying to him. Not half so much, I says, as there is in your bugle. When I hear that go floating up and down the street, I always feel like it was announcing something. To my notion, 
I says. It could announce Christmas to the town far better than forty-leven little separate trimmed-up trees. Why, Jerry, I says out sudden, listen to what I've thought of. A little something had come in my head that minute, unexpected, that fitted itself into the rest of my plan. And it made Jerry say pretty soon that he was willing to go with me to see the other superintendents. And we'd done so that very day. Ain't it funny how big things work out by homely means? By homely means? So because the choir leader in one choir had resigned, because the bass in that choir was the bass in that choir, and so they didn't have anybody there to train their Christmas music. And so because another congregation was hard up and was having to borrow its Christmas celebration money out of the foreign missionary fund, we got them to see sense. And then the other two joined in. The schools were all right from the first, being built like they are on a basis of belonging to everybody, same as breathing and one, two other public utilities, and nothing dividing anybody from anybody. And I began to feel like life in the world was just one great bud longing to open, so B it could get enough care. The worst ones to get weaned away from a perfectly selfish way of observing Christ's birthday was the private families. Land, land, I kept saying to myself them days. We all of us act like we was studying kindergarten mathematics. We count up them that's closest to us, and we can't none of us seem to count much above ten. Not all of them was that way, though. Well, if it just happens that you live in any town whatever in the civilized world, I think you'll know about what I had said to me. On the one hand, it went about like this, from Miss Timothy Toplady and the Holcombs and the Hubblethwaites and a lot more. Well, land knows it'd save us a lot of back-aching work, but will the children like it? Like it, I says. Try em. Trust em without trying em if you want to. I would. Remember, I couldn't help adding. You like to be with the children a whole lot oftener than they like to be with you. What they like is to be together. And, well... Do you honestly think it'll work? I don't see how it can. Anything so different. And, well, they ain't no harm trying it one year, as I can see. That can't break up the holidays, as I know of. But the other side had figured it out just like the other side of everything always figures. Calliope, says Miss Postmaster Sykes, are you crazy-headed? What's your ID? Ain't things all right the way they've always been done? Well, says I, conservative, not all of them. Not wholesale, I wouldn't say. But you can't go changing things like this, she told me. What'll become of Christmas? Christmas, I says, don't need you or me, Miss Sykes, to be its guardians. All Christmas needs is for us to get out of its way and leave it express what it means. But the home Christmas, she says, most like a whale. Would you do away with that? Then I sort of turned on her. I couldn't help it. Who's home, I says, stern. If it's your home, you mean, or any of the thousands of others like it where Christmas is kept, then you know, and they all know, that nothing on earth can take away the Christmas feeling and the Christmas joy as long as you want it to be there. But if it's the homes you mean, and there's thousands of them, where no Christmas ever comes, you surely ain't arguing to keep them the way they've been kept. But she continued to shake her head. You can do as you like, of course, she said. And so can everybody else. It's their privilege. But as for me, I shall trim my little tree here by our own fireside. And here we shall celebrate Christmas, Jetty and Nora and Father and me. Why can't you do both, I says. 
I wouldn't have you give up your fireside end of things for anything on earth. But why can't you do both? Miss Sykes didn't rightly seem to know. At least she didn't say. But she gave me to understand that her mind run right along in the self-same groove it had had made for it cozy. Somehow, the longer I live, the less sense I seem to have. There's some things I've learned from 25 to 30 times in my life, and yet I can't seem to remember them, no more than I can remember whether it's sulfite or sulfate of soda that I take for my Quincy. And one of these is about taking things casual. That night, for instance, when I come round the corner onto Daphne Street at half-past seven on Christmas Eve, I thought I was going to have to waste a minute or two standing just where the billboard makes a shadow for the arc light, trying to get used to the idea of what we were doing, used to it in my throat. But there wasn't much time to spend that way, being there were things to do between then and eight o'clock when we'd told them all to be there. So I ran along and tried not to think about it, except the work part. Most always, the work part of anything will steady you. The great cedar of Lebanon-looking tree, standing down there on the edge of the market square, and acting as if it had been left from some long-ago forest on purpose, had been hung round with lines and lines of strung popcorn, the kind that no Christmas tree would be a Christmas tree without because so many, many folks is set up stringing at nights of Christmas week, after the children was in bed, and has kept it careful in a box, so's it a do for next year. We had all that from the churches, Methodist and Presbyterian and Episcopal and Baptist and Catholic popcorn, and you couldn't tell them apart at all when you got them on the tree. The festoon showed ghostly white in the dark, and the folks showed ghostly black, hurrying back and forth doing the last things. And the folks was coming. You could hear em all along Daphne Street, tripping on the bad place that hadn't been mended because it was right under the arc light, and coming over the hollow-sounding place by Graham's drug store, and coming from the little side streets and the dark back streets and the streets down on the flats. Some of em had Christmas trees waiting at home, the load had been there on the market square, just like we had let it be there for years without seeing that the market square had any other Christmas uses, and a good many had bought trees. But a good many more had decided not to have any, only just to hang up stockings, and to let the great big common Christmas tree stand for what it stood for, gathering most of that little garland of Daphne Street trees up into its living heart. Over by the bandstand I come on them I'd been looking for. Eddie Newhaven and Arthur Mills and Lily Doran and Sarah and Molly and the Cartwrights and Lifty and six, eight more. Hello, folks, I says. What you down here for? Why ain't you home? They answered all together. For the big tree! Are you now, I says, just to keep on a-talking to em. Whose tree? I love to remember the way they answered. It was Eddie Newhaven that said it. Why, all of us's, he said. All of us's. I like to say it over when they get to saying mine and theirs too hard where I am. When it was eight o'clock and there was enough gathered on the square, they'd done the thing that was going to be done only nobody had known how well they were going to do it. They touched the button, and from the bottom branch to the tip-top little cone, the big old tree came alight, just like it knew what it was all about and like it had come out of the ground long ago for this reason, only we'd never known. Two hundred little electric lights there were, colored, and paid for private, though I'd done my best to get the town to pay for em, like it ought to do for its own tree, but they was paid for private. Yet. It made a little, oh, come in the crowd and run around. It was so big and beautiful, 
standing there against the stars like it knew well enough that it was one of them, whether we knew it or not, and coming up across the flats, big and gold and low, was the moon, most full, like it belonged too. And glory shone around, I says to myself, and I stood there feeling the glory, outside and in. Not my little celebration and your little celebration and their little celebration, private, that was costing each of us more than it ought to, but our celebration, paying attention to the message that Christ paid attention to. I was so full of it that I didn't half see Ben Corey and his carolers come racing out of the dark, they was all fixed up in funny pointed hoods and in cloaks and carrying long staves with everybody's barnyard lanterns tied on the end of them. And they run out in a line down to the tree and they took hold of hands and danced around it, singing to their voices top a funny old tune, one of them tunes that, whether you've ever heard it before or not, kind of makes things in you that's older than you are yourself wake up and remember, real plain. And Jerry Bemis shouted out at him, Sing it again! Sing it again! And pounded his wooden leg with his cane. Sing it again, I tell you. I ain't heard anybody sing that for going on forty years. And everybody laughed, and they sung it again for him and some more songs that had come out of the old country that a little bit of it was living inside everybody that was there. And while they were singing, it came to me all of a sudden about another night, most three hundred years before, when on American soil that lonesome English heart up there in Boston had dreamed ahead to a time when Christmas would come here. But faith unrolls the future scrolls. Christmas shall not die, nor men of English blood and speech forget their ancestry. Or any other blood or any other speech that has in it the spirit of what Christ came to teach. And that's all of us. And it fell to me as if now we were only just beginning to take out our little single lonely tapers and carry them to light a great tree. Then, just after the carols died down, the thing happened that we'd planned to happen. Over on one side the choirs of all the churches that I guess had never sung together in their lives before, though they'd been singing steadily about the self-same thing since they was born choirs, begun to sing... Silent night, holy night. Think of it. Down there on the market square that had never had anything sung on it before except carnival tunes and circus tunes. All up and down Daphne Street it must have sounded, only there was hardly anybody far off to hear it, the most of them being right there with all of us. They sung it without anybody playing it for them, and they sung it from first to last. And then they slipped into another song that isn't a Christmas carol exactly, nor not any song that comes in the book under Christmas, but something that comes in just as natural as if it was another name for what Christmas was. Nearer my God to thee, and lead kindly light, and some more. And after a bar or two of the first one, the voices all around begun kind of mumbling and humming and carrying the tunes along in their throats, without anybody in particular starting them there. And then they all just naturally burst out and sung too. And so I don't know who done it, whether the choirs had planned it that way, or whether they just thought of it then, or whether somebody in the crowd struck it up unbeknownst to himself, or whether the song begun to sing itself. But it come from somewhere, strong and clear and real, a song that the children had been learning in school and has been teaching the town for a year or two now, sung to the tune of Vakt am Rhein. 
the crest and crowning of all good, life's common goal is brotherhood. And then everybody sung, because that's a piece you can't sing alone. You cannot sing it alone. All over the market square they took it up, and the folks that couldn't sing, and me that can't sing a note except when there's nobody around that would recognize me if they saw me again, we all sung together there in the dark with the tree in the midst. And we seemed long and long away from the time when the leader in one of them singing choirs had left the other choir because the bass in the other choir was the bass in the other choir. And it was like the way things are had suddenly spoke for a minute, there in the singing choirs come out of their separate lofts, and in all the singing folks, and in all of us, all of us. Then up hopped Appleby Holcomb onto a box in front of the tree, and he calls out, Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas on the first annual outdoor Christmas tree celebration of Friendship Village. When he said that, I felt, well, it don't make any difference to anybody how I felt, but what I'd done was to turn and make for the edge of the crowd just as fast as I could. And just then there come what Elbleby's words was the signal for and out on the little flagstaff balcony of the town hall, Jerry Bemis stepped with his bugle, and he blew it shrill and clear, so that it sounded all over the town, once, twice, three times, a bugle call to say it was Christmas. We couldn't wait till twelve o'clock. We are all in bed long before that time in Friendship Village, holiday or not. But the bugle call said it was Christmas just the same. Think of it. The bugle that used to say it was war. And the same minute the big tree went out, all still and quiet, but to be lit again next year and to stay a living thing in between. When I stepped onto Daphne Street, who should I come face to face with but Miss Postmaster Sykes? I was feeling so glorified over that I never thought of its being strange that she was there. But she spoke up just the same as if I'd said, Why, I thought you wasn't coming near. The children was bound to come, she says, so I had to bring them. Yes, I thought to myself, the children know. They know. And I even couldn't feel bad when I passed the post office store and see Silas sitting there all soul alone, the only lit store in the street. I knew he'd be on the market square the next year. They went singing through all the streets that night, Ben Corey and his carolers. Silent night, holy night, come from my front gate when I was most asleep. It was like the whole town was being sung to by something that didn't show. And when the time comes that this something speaks clear all the time, well, it ain't a very far off time, you know. End of A Great Tree by Zona Gale Read by Jan McGillivray A Carol on the Birth of Christ by Thomas Tesser Read in English Was not Christ our Savior sent unto us from God above, not for our good behavior, but only His mercy and love? If these be true, as true it is, truly indeed, great thanks to God to yield for this, then had we need this our god for very troth to train to him the soul of man and justly to perform his oath to sarah and to abraham then that through his seed all nations should most blessed be 
as in due time performed, he would, all flesh, should see. Which wondrously is brought to pass, and in our sight already done, by sending, as his promise was, to comfort us, his only Son, even Christ, I mean, that virgin's child, in Bethlehem born, that Lamb of God, that prophet mild, with crowned thorn. Such was his love to save us all from dangers of the curse of God, that we stood in Adam's fall, and by our own deserved rod, that through his blood and holy name all that believe and fly from sin and are but the same shall grace receive. For this glad news this feast doth bring, to God the Son and Holy Ghost. Let man give thanks, rejoice, and sing, from world to world, from coast to coast, for other gifts in many ways that God doth send. Let us in Christ give God the praise, till life shall end. End of A Carol on the Birth of Christ by Thomas Tesser Read by Kangaroo Christmas Comes But Once a Year by Thomas Miller Read in English This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Old Christmas is come for to keep open house and scorns to be guilty of starving a mouse. Then come, boys, and welcome for diet the chief. There's plum pudding, roast goose, minced pies, and roast beef. Then let us be merry, and taste the good cheer, and remember old Christmas but comes once a year. Old Christmas Carol Those Christmas bells as sweetly chime, as on the day when first they rung, so merrily in the olden time, and far and wide their music flung, shaking the tall grain ivied tower, with all their deep melodious power, they still proclaim to every ear, Old Christmas comes but once a year. Then he came singing through the woods, and plucked the holly bright and green, pulled here and there the ivy buds, was sometimes hidden, sometimes seen, half buried neath the mistletoe. His long beard hung with flakes of snow, and still he ever caroled clear, Old Christmas comes but once a year. He merrily came in days of old, when roads were few and ways were foul. Now staggered, now some ditty trawled, now drank deep from his wassail bowl, his holly silvered or with frost, nor never once his way he lost. For reeling hero and reeling there, old Christmas came but once a year. The hall was thin with holly crowned, T'was on the wild deer's antlers placed, It hemmed the battered armor round, And every ancient trophy graced. It decked the boar's head, tusked and grim, The wassail bowl, wreathed to the brim, A summer green hung everywhere, For Christmas came but once a year. His jaded steed, the armed knight, Reigned up before the abbey gate, by all assistant to alight, from humble monk to abbot great. They placed his lance behind the door, his armor on the rush strewn floor, and then brought out the best of cheer, for Christmas came but once a year. The maiden then, in quaint attire, loosed from her head the silken hood, and danced before the yule log fire, the crackling monarch of the wood. Helmet and shield flash back the blaze, In lines of light, like summer rays, While music sounded loud and clear, For Christmas came but once a year. What though upon his hoary head Have fallen many a winter snow, His wreath is still as green and red As t'was a thousand years ago. For what has he to do with care, his wassail bowl and his old armchair are ever standing ready there, for Christmas comes but once a year. 
No marvel Christmas lived so long. He never knew but merry hours. His nights were spent with mirth and song, in happy homes and princely bowers, was greeted both by serf and lord, and seated at the festal board, while every voice cried, Welcome here, old Christmas comes but once a year. But what care we for days of old, the knights whose arms have turned to rust, their grim boar's heads and pasties cold, their castles crumbled into dust, Never did sweeter faces go, blushing beneath the mistletoe, than are to-night assembled here, for Christmas still comes once a year. For those old times are dead and gone, and those who hailed them passed away, yet still lingers there many a one to welcome in old Christmas day. The poor will many a care forget, the debtor think not of his debt, but as they each enjoy their cheer, wish it was Christmas all the year. And still around these good old times, we hang like friends full loth to part. We listen to the simple rhymes, which somehow sink into the heart, half musical, half melancholy, like childish smiles that still are holy. A masker's face dimmed with a tear, for Christmas comes but once a year. The bells which usher in that morn have ever drawn my mind away to Bethlehem, where Christ was born, and the low stable where he lay, in which the large-eyed oxen fed, to Mary bowing lower her head, and looking down with love sincere, such thoughts bring Christmas once a year. At early day the youthful voice, heard singing on from door to door, makes the responding heart rejoice, to know the children of the poor, for aunts are happy all day long, we smile and listen to the song, the burthen, still remote or near, old Christmas comes but once a year. Upon a gayer, happier scene, never did holly berries peer, or ivy throw its trailing green on brighter forms than there are here. Nor Christmas in his old armchair smile upon lips and brows more fair. Then let us sing amid our cheer, Old Christmas still comes once a year. End of Christmas Comes But Once a Year by Thomas Miller Read by Kangaroo Christmas Eve, Stands as 1 through 13, by Robert Browning This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Out of the little chapel, I burst into the fresh night air again. Five minutes full, I waited first in the doorway, to escape the rain that drove in gusts down the common center, at the edge of which the chapel stands, before I plucked up heart to enter. Heaven knows how many sorts of hands reached past me, groping for the latch of the inner door that hung on catch more obstinate the more they fumbled, till giving way at last with a scold of the crazy hinge, in squeezed or tumbled one sheep more to the rest of the fold, and left me, irresolute, standing sentry in the sheepfold's lath and plaster entry, six feet long by three feet wide, partitioned off from the vast inside, I blocked up half of it at least. No remedy, the rain kept driving. They eyed me much as some wild beast, that congregation, still arriving, some of them by the main road, white a long way past me into the night, skirting the common, then diverging, not a few suddenly emerging from the common self, through the paling gaps. They house in the gravel pits, perhaps, where the road stops short, with its safeguard border of lamps, as tired of such disorder. But the most turned in yet more abruptly, from a certain squalid knot of alleys, where the town's bad blood once slept corruptly, which now the little chapel rallies and leads into day again, its priestliness lending itself to hide their beastliness so cleverly, thanks in part to the mason, and putting so cheery a whitewashed face on those neophytes too much in lack of it, 
that where you cross the common, as I did, and meet the party thus presided, Mount Zion, with Love Lane at the back of it, they front you, as little disconcerted, as, bound for the hills, her fate averted, and her wicked people made to mind him, Lot might have marched with Gomorrah behind him. Well, from the road, the lanes, or the common, in came the flock. The fat, weary woman, panting and bewildered, down-clapping her umbrella with a mighty report, grounded it by me, wry and flapping, a wreck of whale-bones. Then, with a snort like a startled horse at the interloper, who humbly knew himself improper, but could not shrink up small enough, round to the door and in, the gruff hinges invariable scold, making my very blood run cold. Prompt in the wake of her, up pattered on broken clogs, the many tattered little old-faced peeking sister, turned mother of the sickly babe, she tried to smother somehow up with its spotted face from the cold on her breast, the one warm place. She too must stop, wring the poor ends dry of a draggled shawl, and add thereby her tribute to the doormat, sopping already from my own clothes dropping, which yet she seemed to grudge I should stand on. Then, stooping down to take off her pattens, she bore them defiantly, in each hand one, planted together before her breast and its babe, as good as a lance in rest. Close on her heels, the dingy satins of a female something past me flitted, with lips as much too white as a streak lay far too red on each hollow cheek, and it seemed the very door-hinge pitied all that was left of a woman once holding at least its tongue for the nonce. Then a tall yellow man, like the penitent thief, with his jaw bound up in a handkerchief, and eyelids screwed together tight, led himself in by some inner light, and, except from him, from each that entered I got the same interrogation. What, you, the alien, you have ventured to take with us the elect your station? A carer for none of it? A galio? Thus, plain as print, I read the glance, at a common prey, in each countenance, as of huntsman giving his hounds the tally-ho. And when the door's cry drowned their wonder, the draught it always sent in shutting made the flame of the single tallow candle in the cracked square lantern I stood under shoot its blue lip at me, rebutting, as it were, the luckless cause of scandal. I verily fancied the zealous light in the chapel's secret, too, for spite would shudder itself clean off the wick with the airs of a St. John's candlestick. There was no standing it much longer. Good folks, thought I, as resolve grew stronger, this way you perform the grand inquisitor when the weather sends you a chance visitor. You are the men, and wisdom shall die with you, and none of the old seven churches vie with you. But still— despite the pretty perfection to which you carry your trick of exclusiveness, and taking God's word under your wise protection, correct its tendency to diffusiveness, and bid one reach it over hot plowshares. Still, as I say, though you've found salvation, if I should choose to cry, as now, shares, see if the best of you bars me my ration. I prefer, if you please, for my expounder of the laws of the feast, the feast's own founder. Mine's the same right with your poorest and sickliest. Supposing I don the marriage vestment, so shut your mouth and open your testament, and carve me my portion at your quickliest. Accordingly, as a shoemaker's lad with wizened face in want of soap, and a wet apron wound round his waist like a rope, after stopping outside, for his cough was bad, to get the fit over, poor gentle creature, and so avoid disturbing the preacher, passed in, I sent my elbow spikewise at the shutting door, and entered likewise, received the hinges accustomed greeting, and crossed the threshold's magic pentacle, and found myself in full conventicle, to wit, in Zion Chapel meeting on the Christmas Eve of forty-nine, which, calling its flock to their special clover, found all assembled, and one sheep over, whose lot, as the weather pleased, was mine.
I very soon had enough of it. The hot smell and the human noises, and my neighbor's coat, the greasy cuff of it, were a pebble-stone that a child's hand poises, compared with the pig of lead-like pressure of the preaching man's immense stupidity, as he poured his doctrine forth full measure to meet his audience's avidity. You needed not the wit of the sibyl to guess the cause of it all in a twinkling. No sooner had our friend got an inkling of the treasure hid in the Holy Bible, whenever it was the thought first struck him, how death at unawares might duck him deeper than the grave, and quench the gin-shop's light in hell's grim drench, than he handled it so, in fine irreverence, as to hug the book of books to pieces, and a patchwork of chapters and texts, in severance, not improved by the private dog's ears and creases, having clothed his own soul with, he'd fain see equipped yours, so tossed you again your holy scriptures, and you picked them up, in a sense, no doubt, nay, had but a single face of my neighbors appeared to suspect that the preacher's labors were help which the world could be saved without, tis odds that I might have borne in quiet a qualm or two at my spiritual diet, or, who can tell, perhaps even mustered somewhat to urge in behalf of the sermon. But the flock sat on, divinely flustered, sniffing, methought, its due of Hermon, with such content in every snuffle as the devil inside us loves to ruffle. My old fat woman purred her pleasure, and thumb round thumb went twirling faster, while she, to his periods keeping measure, maternally devoured the pastor. The man with the handkerchief untied it, showing us a horrible wen inside it, gave his eyelids yet another screwing, and rocked himself as the woman was doing. The shoemaker's lad, discreetly choking, kept down his cough. "'Twas too provoking. My gorge rose at the nonsense and stuff of it. So, saying, like Eve, when she plucked the apple, I wanted a taste, and now there's enough of it. I flung out of the little chapel. There was a lull in the rain, a lull in the wind, too. The moon was risen and would have shone out pure and full, but for the ramparted cloud prison, block on block built up in the west, for what purpose the wind knows best, who changes his mind continually, and the empty other half of the sky seemed in its silence as if it knew what any moment might look through a chance gap in that fortress massy. Through its fissures you got hints of the flying moon by the shifting tints, now a dull lion color, now brassy burning to yellow, and whitest yellow, like furnace smoke, just ere the flames bellow, all a simmer with the intense strain to let her through, then blank again at the hope of her appearance failing. Just by the chapel, a break in the railing shows a narrow path directly across. Tis ever dry walking there on the moss. Besides, you go gently all the way uphill. I stooped under and soon felt better. My head grew lighter, my limbs more supple. As I walked on, glad to have slipped the fetter, my mind was full of the scene I had left. That placid flock, that pastor vociferant. How this outside was pure and different. The sermon now, what a mingled weft of good and ill. Were either less, its fellow had colored the whole distinctly. But alas, for the excellent earnestness and the truths, quite true if stated succinctly, but as surely false in their quaint presentment, however, to pastor and flock's contentment. Say rather, such truths looked false to your eyes, with his provings and parallels twisted and twined, till how could you know them, grown double their size in the natural fog of that good man's mind, like yonder spots of our roadside lamps, haloed about with the commons' damps. Truth remains true, the fault is in the prover. The zeal was good, and the aspiration. And yet, and yet, yet, fifty times over, Pharaoh received no demonstration by his baker's dream of basket three of the doctrine of the Trinity, although, as our preacher thus embellished it, 
Apparently his hearers relished it, with so unfeigned a gusto. Who knows if they did not prefer our friend to Joseph? But so it is everywhere, one way with all of them. These people have really felt, no doubt, a something, the motion they style the call of them. And this is their method of bringing about, by a mechanism of words and tones, so many texts in so many groans, a sort of reviving and reproducing, more or less perfectly, who can tell, the mood itself, which strengthens by using. And how that happens I understand well. A tune was born in my head last week, out of the thump-thump and shriek-shriek of the train, as I came by it up from Manchester. And when next week I take it back again, my head will sing to the engine's clack again, while it only makes my neighbor's haunches stir, finding no dormant musical sprout in him, as in me, to be jolted out. Tis the taught already that profits by teaching. He gets no more from the railway's preaching than from this preacher who does the rail's office, I, whom therefore the flock cast a jealous eye on. Still, why paint over their door Mount Zion, to which all flesh shall come, saith the prophecy. But wherefore be harsh on a single case? After how many modes this Christmas Eve does this self-same weary thing take place? The same endeavor to make you believe, and with as much effort, no more. Each method abundantly convincing, as I say, to those convinced before, but scarce to be swallowed without wincing by the not as yet convinced, for me, I have my own church equally, and in this church my faith sprang first, I said, as I reached the rising ground, and the wind began again, with a burst of rain in my face, and a glad rebound from the heart beneath, as if, God speeding me, I entered his church door, nature leading me. In youth I looked to these very skies, and probing their immensities, I found God there, his visible power, yet felt in my heart, amid all its sense of the power, an equal evidence that his love, there too, was the nobler dower, for the loving worm within its clod were diviner than a loveless god amid his worlds, I will dare to say. You know what I mean, God's all, man's naught, but also God, whose pleasure brought man into being, stands away, as it were, a hand-breadth off, to give room for the newly made to live, and look at him from a place apart, and use his gifts of brain and heart, given, indeed, but to keep forever. Who speaks of man, then, must not sever man's very elements from man, saying, but all is God's, whose plan was to create man, and then leave him able, his own word saith, to grieve him, but able to glorify him, too, as a mere machine could never do, that prayed or praised all unaware of its fitness for aught but praise and prayer, made perfect as a thing, of course. Man, therefore, stands on his own stock of love and power as a pinpoint rock, and looking to God, who ordained divorce of the rock from his boundless continent, sees in his power made evident only excess by a million fold or the power god gave man in the mould for note man's hand first formed to carry a few pounds weight when taught to marry its strength with an engine's lifts a mountain advancing in power by one degree and why count steps through eternity but love is the ever springing fountain Man may enlarge or narrow his bed for the water's play, but the water-head, how can he multiply or reduce it, as easy create it or cause it to cease? He may profit by it or abuse it, but tis not a thing to bear increase as power does. Be love less or more in the heart of man, he keeps it shut or opens it wide as he pleases, but love's sum remains what it was before. So, gazing up in my youth at love as seen through power, ever above all modes which make it manifest, 
my soul brought all to a single test that he the eternal first and last who in his power had so surpassed all man conceives of what is might whose wisdom too showed infinite would prove as infinitely good would never my soul understood with power to work all love desires bestow e'en less than man requires that he who endlessly was teaching above my spirit's utmost reaching what love can do in leaf or stone so that to master this alone this done in the stone or leaf for me i must go on learning endlessly would never need that i in turn should point him out defect unheeded and show that god had yet to learn what the meanest human creature needed not life to wit for a few short years tracking his way through doubts and fears while the stupid earth on which i stay suffers no change but passive adds its myriad years to myriads though i he gave it to decay seeing death come and choose about me and my dearest ones depart without me no love which on earth amid all the shows of it has ever been seen the sole good of life in it that love ever growing there spite of the strife in it shall arise made perfect from death's repose of it and i shall behold thee face to face o god and in thy light retrace how in all i loved here still wast thou whom pressing to then as i fain would now i shall find as able to satiate the love thy gift as my spirit's wonder thou art able to quicken and sublimate with this sky of thine that i now walk under and glory in thee for as i gaze thus thus oh let men keep their ways of seeking thee in a narrow shrine be this my way and this is mine for lo what think you suddenly the rain and the wind ceased and the sky received at once the full fruition of the moon's consummate apparition the black cloud barricade was riven ruined beneath her feet and driven deep in the west while bare and breathless north and south and east lay ready for a glorious thing that dauntless deathless sprang across them and stood steady twas a moon rainbow vast and perfect from heaven to heaven extending perfect as the mother moon's self full in face it rose distinctly at the base with its seven proper colors corded which still in the rising were compressed until at last they coalesced and supreme the spectral creature lorded in a triumph of whitest white above which intervened the night but above the night too like only the next the second of a wondrous sequence reaching in rare and rarer frequence till the heaven of heavens were circumflexed another rainbow rose a mightier fainter flushier and flightier rapture dying along its verge oh whose foot shall i see emerge whose from the straining topmost dark on to the keystone of that ark this sight was shown me there and then me out of a world of men singled forth as the chance might hap to another if in a thunderclap where i heard noise and you saw flame some one man knew god called his name for me i think i said appear good were it to be ever here if thou wilt let me build to thee service tabernacles three where for ever in thy presence, in ecstatic acquiescence, far alike from thriftless learning and ignorance's undiscerning, I may worship and remain. Thus at the show above me, gazing with upturned eyes, I felt my brain glutted with the glory, blazing throughout its whole mass, over and under, until at length it burst asunder, 
and out of it bodily there streamed the too much glory as it seemed, passing from out me to the ground, then palely serpentining round into the dark with mazy error. All at once I looked up in terror. He was there, he himself with his human air, on the narrow pathway just before. I saw the back of him no more. He had left the chapel then as I. I forgot all about the sky. No face, only the sight of a sweepy garment, vast and white, with a hem that I could recognize. I felt terror, no surprise. My mind filled with the cataract at one bound of the mighty fact. I remember. He did say, doubtless, that to the world's end, where two or three should meet and pray, he would be in their midst, their friend. Certainly he was there with them. And my pulses leaped for joy of the golden thought without alloy. Then I saw his very vesture's hem. Then rushed the blood back, cold and clear, with a fresh enhancing shiver of fear. And I hastened, cried out, while I pressed to the salvation of the vest. But not so, Lord, it cannot be that thou indeed art leaving me, me that have despised thy friends. Did my heart make no amends? Thou art the love of God. Above his power didst thou hear me place his love, and that was leaving the world for thee. Therefore thou must not turn from me, as if I had chosen the other part. Folly and pride o'ercame my heart. Our best is bad, nor bears thy test. Still it should be our very best. I thought it best that thou, the spirit, be worshipped in spirit and in truth, and in beauty, as even we require it, not in the forms burlesque, uncouth, I left but now, as scarcely fitted for thee. I knew not what I pitied, but all I felt there, right or wrong, what is it to thee who curest sinning? Am I not weak as thou art strong? I have looked to thee from the beginning, straight up to thee through all the world, which like an idle scroll lay furled to nothingness on either side. And since the time thou wast descried, spite of the weak heart, so have I lived ever, and so fain would die, living and dying thee before. But if thou leavest me, Less or more, I suppose I spoke thus, when, have mercy, Lord, on us, the whole face turned upon me full, and I spread myself beneath it, as when the bleacher spreads to seethe it in the cleansing sun his wool, steeps in the flood of noontide whiteness some denied discolored web, so lay I saturate with brightness. And when the flood appeared to ebb, lo, I was walking, light and swift, with my senses settling fast and steadying, but my body caught up in the whirl and drift of the vesture's amplitude, still eddying on just before me, still to be followed, as it carried me after with its motion. What shall I say? As a path were hollowed, and a man went weltering through the ocean, sucked along in the flying wake of the luminous water-snake. Darkness and cold were cloven, as through I passed, upborne, yet walking too. And I turned to myself at intervals. So he said, so it befalls. God, who registers the cup of mere cold water for his sake to a disciple rendered up, disdains not his own thirst to slake at the poorest love that was ever offered. And because my heart I proffered, with true love trembling at the brim, he suffers me to follow him forever my own way, dispensed from seeking to be influenced by all the less immediate ways that earth in worship's manifold adopts to reach by prayer or praise the garment's hem which, lo, I hold. And so we crossed the world and stopped. For where am I, in city or plain, since I am aware of the world again? And what is this that rises, propped with pillars of prodigious girth? 
Is it really on the earth, this miraculous dome of God? Has the angel's measuring rod, which numbered cubits gem from gem, twixt the gates of the new Jerusalem, meted it out? And what he meted have the sons of men completed? Binding, ever as he bade, columns in the colonnade, with arms wide open to embrace the entry of the human race, to the breast of, what is it, yon building, a blaze in front, all paint and gilding, with marble for brick and stones of price for garniture of the edifice. Now I see, it is no dream, it stands there, and it does not seem, forever in pictures thus it looks, and thus I have read of it in books, often in England, leagues away, and wondered how these fountains play, growing up eternally each to a musical water-tree, whose blossoms drop a glittering boon before my eyes in the light of the moon to the granite layers underneath. Liar and dreamer in your teeth, I, the sinner that speak to you, was in Rome this night, and stood, and knew both this and more. For see, for see, the dark is rent, mine eye is free to pierce the crust of the outer wall, and I view inside, and all there, all as the swarming hollow of a hive, the whole basilica alive. Men in the chancel, body and nave, men on the pillar's architrave, men on the statues, men on the tombs, with popes and kings in their porphyry wombs, all famishing in expectation of the main altar's consummation. For see, the rapturous moment approaches, and earth's best endowment blends with heaven's. The taper fires pant up, the winding brazen spires heave loftier yet the baldachin, the incense gaspings long kept in suspire in clouds. The organ, blatant, holds his breath and grovels latent, as if God's hushing finger grazed him, like Behemoth when he praised him, at the silver bells shrill tinkling, quick cold drops of terror sprinkling on the sudden pavement, strewed with faces of the multitude. Earth breaks up, time drops away, in flows heaven with its new day of endless life, when he who trod very man and very God this earth in weakness, shame, and pain, dying the death whose signs remain up yonder on the accursed tree, shall come again, no more to be of captivity the thrall, but the one God all in all, King of kings, Lord of lords, as his servant John received the words, I died and live for evermore. Yet I was left outside the door. Why sit I here on the threshold stone, left till he return, alone save for the garment's extreme fold, abandoned still to bless my hold? My reason to my doubt replied, as if a book were opened wide, and at a certain page I traced every record undefaced, added by successive years. The harvestings of truth's stray ears singly gleaned, and in one sheaf bound together for belief. Yes, I said, that he will go and sit with these in turn, I know. Their faith's heart beats, though her head swims too giddily to guide her limbs, disabled by their palsy stroke from propping mine. Though Rome's gross yoke drops off, no more to be endured, her teaching is not so obscured by errors and perversities that no truth shines athwart the lies. And he, whose eye detects a spark even where to man's the whole seems dark, may well see flame, where each beholder acknowledges the embers smolder. But I, a mere man, fear to quit the clue God gave me as most fit to guide my footsteps through life's maze, because himself discerns all ways open to reach him. I, a man, able to mark where faith began to swerve aside, till from its summit judgment drops her damning plummet, pronouncing such a fatal space departed from the founder's base, he will not bid me enter too, 
but rather sit, as now I do, awaiting his return outside. "'Twas thus my reason straight replied, and joyously I turned and pressed the garment's skirt upon my breast, until, afresh its light suffusing me, my heart cried, "'What has been abusing me that I should wait here, lonely and coldly, instead of rising, entering boldly?' bearing truth's face and letting drift her veil of lies as they choose to shift do these men praise him i will raise my voice up to their point of praise i see the error but above the scope of error i see the love o oh, love of those first christian days fanned so soon into a blaze from the spark preserved by the trampled sect that the antique sovereign intellect which then sat ruling in the world like a change in dreams was hurled from the throne he reigned upon you looked up and he was gone gone his glory of the pen love with greece and rome in ken bade her scribes abhor the trick of poetry and rhetoric and exult with hearts set free in blessed imbecility scrawled perchance on some torn sheet leaving Sallust incomplete. Gone his pride of sculptor, painter. Love, while able to acquaint her with the thousand statues yet fresh from chisel, pictures wet from brush, she saw on every side, chose rather with an infant's pride to frame those portents which impart such unction to true Christian art. Gone music, too. The air was stirred by happy wings, terpander's bird that when the cold came fled away would not tarry the wintry day as more enduring sculpture must till filthy saints rebuked the gust with which they chanced to get a sight of some dear naked aphrodite they glanced a thought above the toes of by breaking zealously her nose off love surely from that music's lingering might have filched her organ fingering nor chosen rather to set prayings to hog grunts praises to horse neighings love was the startling thing the new love was the all-sufficient too and seeing that you see the rest as a babe can find its mother's breast as well in darkness as in light love shut our eyes and all seemed right true the world's eyes are open now less need for me to disallow some few that keep love's zone unbuckled peevish as ever to be suckled lulled by the same old baby prattle with intermixture of the rattle when she would have them creep stand steady upon their feet or walk already not to speak of trying to climb i will be wise another time and not desire a wall between us when next i see a church roof cover so many species of one genus all with foreheads bearing lover written above the earnest eyes of them all with breasts that beat for beauty whether sublime to the surprise of them in noble daring steadfast duty the heroic in passion or in action or lowered for senses satisfaction to the mere outside of human creatures mere perfect form and faultless features what with all rome here whence to levy such contributions to the appetite with women and men in a gorgeous bevy they take as it were a padlock clasp it tight on their southern eyes restrained from feeding on the glories of their ancient reading on the beauties of their modern singing on the wonders of the builders bringing on the majesties of art around them and all these loves late struggling incessant when faith has at last united and bound them they offer up to God for a present. Why, I will on the whole be rather proud of it, and only taking the act in reference to the other recipients who might have allowed it, I will rejoice that God had the preference. So I summed up my new resolves. Too much love there can never be, and where the intellect devolves its function on love exclusively, I, a man who possesses both, will accept the provision nothing loath will feast my love then depart elsewhere that my intellect may find its share and ponder o soul the while thou departest and see them applaud the great heart of the artist 
who, examining the capabilities of the block of marble he has to fashion into a type of thought or passion, not always using obvious facilities, shapes it, as any artist can, into a perfect symmetrical man, complete from head to foot of the life-size, such as old Adam stood in his wife's eyes, but now and then bravely aspires to consummate a colossus, by no means so easy to come at, and uses the whole of his block for the bust, leaving the mind of the public to finish it, since cut it ruefully short he must. On the face alone he expends his devotion. He would rather mar than resolve to diminish it, saying, Applaud me for this grand notion of what a face may be. As for completing it, in breast and body and limbs, do that you. All hail. I fancy how, happily meeting it, a trunk and legs would perfect the statue, could man carve so as to answer volition, and how much nobler than petty cavils were a hope to find in my spirit travels some artist of another ambition, who, having a block to carve no bigger, has spent his power on the opposite quest, and believed to begin at the feet was best. For so I may see, ere I die, the whole figure. No sooner said than out in the night, my heart lighter and still more light, and still, as before, I was walking swift, with my senses settling fast and steadying, but my body caught up in the whirl and drift of the vesture's amplitude, still eddying on just before me, still to be followed, as it carried me after with its motion. What shall I say? As a path were hollowed, and a man went weltering through the ocean, sucked along in the flying wake of the luminous water-snake. End of Christmas Eve, stanzas 1 through 13, by Robert Browning. Read by Maria Casper. Christmas Eve, stanzas 14 through 22, by Robert Browning. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Alone. I am left alone once more, save for the garment's extreme fold, abandoned still to bless my hold, alone beside the entrance door of a sort of temple, perhaps a college, like nothing I ever saw before at home in England, to my knowledge, the tall, old, quaint, irregular town. It may be, though which I can't affirm, any of the famous middle-aged towns of Germany, and this flight of stairs where I sit down, is it Hall, Weimar, Kassel, Frankfurt, or Göttingen, I have to thank for it, it may be Gottingen, most likely. Through the open door I catch obliquely glimpses of a lecture hall, and not a bad assembly neither, ranged decent and symmetrical on benches, waiting to see what's there, which, holding still by the vesture's hem, I also resolve to see with them. Cautious this time, how I suffer to slip the chance of joining in fellowship with any that call themselves his friends. As these folk do, I have a notion. But hist, a buzzing and emotion, all settle themselves, the while ascends by the creaking rail to the lecture desk, step by step, deliberate because of his cranium's over-freight, three parts sublime to one grotesque, if I have proved an accurate guesser, the hawk-nosed, high-cheek-boned professor. I felt at once as if there ran a shoot of love from my heart to the man, that sallow, virgin-minded, studious martyr to mild enthusiasm, as he uttered a kind of cough preludious that woke my sympathetic spasm, besides some spitting that made me sorry, and stood surveying his auditory with a wan, pure look, well-nigh celestial. Those blue eyes had survived so much, while under the foot they could not smutch lay all the fleshly and the bestial. Over he bowed and arranged his notes, till the auditory's clearing of throats was done with, died into a silence, and when each glance was upward sent, each bearded mouth composed, intent, 
and a pin might be heard drop half a mile hence. He pushed back higher his spectacles, let the eyes stream out like lamps from cells, and giving his head of hair, a hake of undressed toe for color and quantity, one rapid and impatient shake, as our own young England adjusts a jaunty tie when about to impart on mature digestion some thrilling view of the surplus question, the professor's grave voice, sweet though hoarse, broke into his Christmas Eve discourse. And he began it by observing how reason dictated that men should rectify the natural swerving by a reversion now and then to the wellheads of knowledge, few and far away, whence rolling grew the life-stream wide whereat we drink, commingled, as we needs must think, with waters alien to the source, to do which aimed this eve's discourse, since where could be a fitter time for tracing backward to its prime this Christianity, this lake, this reservoir whereat we slake from one or other bank our thirst? So he proposed inquiring first into the various sources whence this myth of Christ is derivable, demanding from the evidence, since plainly no such life was livable, how these phenomena should class, whether twere best opine Christ was or never was at all, or whether he was and was not both together. It matters little for the name, so the idea be left the same. Only for practical purpose sake, twas obviously as well to take the popular story, understanding how the ineptitude of the time, and the penman's prejudice, expanding fact into fable fit for that clime, had by slow and sure degrees translated it into this myth, this individuum, which, when reason had strained and abated it of foreign matter, left for residuum a man, a right true man, however, whose work was worthy a man's endeavor, work that gave warrant almost sufficient to his disciples for rather believing he was just omnipotent and omniscient, as it gives to us for as frankly receiving his word, their tradition, which, though it meant something entirely different from all those who only heard it, in their simplicity thought and averred it, had yet a meaning quite as respectable. For among other doctrines delectable, was he not surely the first to insist on the natural sovereignty of our race? Here the lecturer came to a pausing place, and while his cough, like a drouthy piston, tried to dislodge the husk that grew to him, I seized the occasion of bidding adieu to him, the vesture still within my hand. I could interpret its command. This time he would not bid me enter the exhausted air-bell of the critic. Truth's atmosphere may grow mephitic when papist struggles with dissenter, impregnating its pristine clarity, won by his daily fare's vulgarity, its gust of broken meat and garlic, won by his soul's too much presuming to turn the frankincense's fuming and vapors of the candle star-like into the cloud her wings she buoys on. Each that thus sets the pure air seething may poison it for healthy breathing. But the critic leaves no air to poison, pumps out with ruthless ingenuity atom by atom, and leaves you vacuity. Thus much of Christ does he reject? And what retain? His intellect? What is it I must reverence duly? Poor intellect for worship, truly, which tells me simply what was told, if mere morality, bereft of the God in Christ, be all that's left, elsewhere by voices manifold. With this advantage, that the stator made no wise the important stumble of adding, he, the sage and humble, was also one with the Creator. You urge Christ's followers simplicity, but how does shifting blame evade it? Have wisdom's words no more felicity? The stumbling block, his speech, who laid it? How comes it that for one found able to sift the truth of it from fable, millions believe it to the letter? Christ's goodness, then, does that fare better? Strange goodness, which upon the score of being goodness, the mere due of man to fellow man, much more to God, should take another view of its possessor's privilege and bid him rule his race. You pledge your fealty to such rule? What, all, from heavenly John and Attic Paul, and that brave weather-battered Peter, 
whose stout faith only stood completer for buffets, sinning to be pardoned, as more his hands hauled nets they hardened. All, down to you, the man of men, professing here at Gottingen, compose Christ's flock. They, you and I, are sheep of a good man. And why, the goodness, how did he acquire it? Was it self-gained? Did God inspire it? Choose which. Then tell me, on what ground should its possessor dare propound his claim to rise o'er us an inch? Were goodness all some man's invention, who arbitrarily made mention what we should follow and whence flinch, what qualities might take the style of right and wrong, and had such guessing met with as general acquiescing as graced the alphabet erewhile, when A got leave an ox to be, no camel, quoth the Jews, like G, for thus inventing thing and title, worship were that man's fit requital. But if the common conscience must be ultimately judge, adjust its apt name to each quality already known. I would decree worship for such mere demonstration and simple work of nomenclature, only on the day I praised not nature but Harvey for the circulation. I would praise such a Christ with pride and joy, that he, as none beside, had taught us how to keep the mind God gave him, as God gave his kind, freer than they from fleshly taint. I would call such a Christ our saint, as I declare our poet, him whose insight makes all others dim. A thousand poets pride at life, and only one amid the strife rose to be Shakespeare. Each shall take his crown, I'd say, for the world's sake, though some objected. Had we seen the heart and head of each, what screen was broken there to give them light, while in ourselves it shuts the sight? We should no more admire, perchance, that these found truth out at a glance, than marvel how the bat discerns some pitch-dark caverns fifty turns, led by a finer tact, a gift he boasts, which other birds must shift without, and grope as best they can. No, freely I would praise the man, not one whit more, if he contended that gift of his from God descended. Ah, friend, what gift of man's does not? No nearer something, by a jot, rise an infinity of nothings than one. Take Euclid for your teacher. Distinguish kinds. Do crownings, clothings, make that creator which was creature? Multiply gifts upon man's head, and what, when all's done, shall be said, but the more gifted he, I ween. That one's made Christ, this other, Pilate, and this might be all that has been. So what is there to frown or smile at? What is left for us, save in growth of soul, to rise up, far past both, from the gift looking to the giver, and from the cistern to the river, and from the finite to infinity, and from man's dust to God's divinity. Take all in a word. The truth in God's breast lies trace for trace upon curs impressed. Though he is so bright and we so dim, we are made in his image to witness him. And were no eye in us to tell, instructed by no inner sense, the light of heaven from the dark of hell, that light would want its evidence. Though justice, good, and truth were still divine, if by some demon's will hatred and wrong had been proclaimed law through the worlds, and right misnamed, no mere exposition of morality, made or in part or in totality, should win you to give it worship, therefore. And if no better proof you will care for, whom do you count the worst man upon earth? Be sure he knows in his conscience more of what right is than arrives at birth in the best man's acts that we bow before. This last knows better. True, but my fact is, tis one thing to know and another to practice. And thence I conclude that the real God function is to furnish a motive and injunction for practicing what we know already. And such an injunction and such a motive as the God in Christ, do you wave, and, heady, high-minded, hang your tablet votive outside the fane on a finger-post? Morality to the uttermost, supreme in Christ as we all confess, 
why need we prove would avail no jot to make him god if god he were not what is the point where himself lays stress does the precept run believe in good in justice truth now understood for the first time or believe in me who lived and died yet essentially am lord of life whoever can take the same to his heart and for mere love's sake conceive of the love that man obtains a new truth no conviction gains of an old one only made intense by a fresh appeal to his faded sense can it be that he stays inside is the vesture left me to commune with could my soul find aught to sing in tune with even at this lecture if she tried oh let me at the lowest sympathize with the lurking drop of blood that lies in the desiccated brain's white roots without throb for christ's attributes as the lecturer makes his special boast if love's dead there it has left a ghost admire we how from heart to brain though to say so strike the doctors dumb one instinct rises and falls again restoring the equilibrium and how when the critic had done his best and the pearl of price at reason's test lay dust and ashes levigible on the professor's lecture table when we looked for the inference and monition that our faith reduced to such condition be swept forthwith to its natural dust hole he bids us when we least expect it take back our faith if it be not just whole yet a pearl indeed as his tests affect it which fact pays damage done rewardingly so prize we our dust and ashes accordingly go home and venerate the myth i have thus experimented with this man continue to adore him rather than all who went before him and all who ever followed after surely for this i may praise you my brother will you take the praise in tears or laughter that's one point gained can i compass another unlearned love was safe from spurning can't we respect your loveless learning let us at least give learning honor what laurels had we showered upon her girding her loins up to perturb our theory of the middle verb or turk-like brandishing a scimitar or anapests in comic trimeter or curing the halt and maimed icatides while we lounged on at our indebted ease instead of which a tricksy demon sets her at titus or philemon when ignorance wags his ears of leather and hates god's word tis altogether nor leaves he his congenial thistles to go and browse on paul's epistles and you the audience who might ravage the world wide enviably savage nor heed the cry of the retriever more than herr heine before his fever i do not tell a lie so arrant as to say my passion's wings are furled up and without plainest heavenly warrant i were ready and glad to give the world up but still when you rub your brow meticulous and ponder the profit of turning holy if not for god's for your own sake solely god forbid i should find you ridiculous deduce from this lecture all that eases you nay call yourselves if the calling pleases you christians abhor the deist's pravity go on you shall no more move my gravity than when i see boys ride a cock horse I find it in my heart to embarrass them by hinting that their stick's a mock-horse, and they really carry what they say carries them. So I sat talking with my mind. I did not long to leave the door and find a new church as before, but rather was quiet and inclined to prolong and enjoy the gentle resting and further tracking and trying and testing. This tolerance is a genial mood, said I, and a little pause ensued one trims the bark twixt shoal and shelf and sees each side the good effects of it a value for religion's self a carelessness about the sects of it let me enjoy my own conviction not watch my neighbor's faith with fretfulness still spying there some dereliction of truth perversity forgetfulness better a mild indifferentism teaching that both our faiths, 
though duller his shine through a dull spirit's prism, originally had one color. Better pursue a pilgrimage through ancient and through modern times, to many peoples, various climes, where I may see saint, savage, sage, fuse their respective creeds in one before the general father's throne. "'Twas the horrible storm, begun afresh. The black knight caught me in his mesh, whirled me up, and flung me prone. I was left on the college step, alone. I looked, and far there, ever fleeting, far, far away, the receding gesture and looming of the lessening vesture, swept forward from my stupid hand, while I watched my foolish heart expand in the lazy glow of benevolence or the various modes of man's belief. I sprang up with fear's vehemence. Needs must there be one way, our chief best way of worship. Let me strive to find it, and when found, contrive my fellows also take their share. This constitutes my earthly care. God's is above it and distinct. For I, a man, with men am linked, but not a brute with brutes. No gain that I experience must remain unshared. But should my best endeavor to share it fail, subsisteth ever God's care above. And I exult that God, by God's own ways occult, may, doth, I will believe, bring back all wanderers to a single track. Meantime, I can but testify God's care for me. No more can I. It is but for myself, I know. The world rolls witnessing around me, only to leave me as it found me. Men cry there, but my ear is slow. There races flourish or decay. What boots it, while yon lucid way loaded with stars divides the vault? But soon my soul repairs its fault. When sharpening senses hibitude, she turns on my own life. So viewed, no mere mote's breath, but teems immense with witnessings of providence, and woe to me if when I look upon that record, the sole book unsealed to me, I take no heed of any warning that I read. Have I been sure, this Christmas Eve, God's own hand did the rainbow weave, whereby the truth from heaven slid into my soul? I cannot bid the world admit he stooped to heal my soul, as if in a thunder peal, where one heard noise and one saw flame, I only knew he named my name. But what is the world to me, for sorrow or joy in its censure? When to-morrow it drops the remark, with just turned head, then on again, that man is dead. Yes, but for me, my name called, drawn as a conscript's lot from the lap's black yawn he has dipped into on a battle dawn, bid out of life by a nod, a glance, Stumbling, mute mazed at nature's chance, With a rapid finger circled round, Fixed to the first poor inch of ground To fight from where his foot was found, Whose ear but a minute since Lay free to the wide camp's buzz and gossipry, Summoned a solitary man To end his life where his life began, From the safe glad rear to the dreadful van. Soul of mine, Hadst thou caught and held by the hem of his vesture? And I caught at the flying robe, And, unrepelled, was lapped again in its folds, Full fraught with warmth and wonder and delight, God's mercy being infinite. For scarce had the words escaped my tongue, When, at a passionate bound, I sprung out of the wandering world of rain, into the little chapel again. How else was I found there, bolt upright, on my bench, as if I had never left it, never flung out on the common at night, nor met the storm and wedge-like cleft it, seen the rary show of Peter's successor or the laboratory of the professor? For the vision, that was true, I wist, true as that heaven and earth exist, there sat my friend, the yellow and tall, with his neck and its wen in the self-same place. Yet my nearest neighbor's cheek showed gall. She had slid away a contemptuous space. And the old fat woman, 
late so placable, eyed me with symptoms hardly mistakable, of her milk of kindness turning rancid. In short, a spectator might have fancied that I had nodded, betrayed by slumber, yet kept my scat, a warning ghastly, through the heads of the sermon, nine in number, and woke up now at the tenth and lastly. But again, could such a disgrace have happened? Each friend at my elbow had surely nudged it. And as for the sermon, where did my nap end? Unless I heard it, could I have judged it? Could I report, as I do at the close, first, the preacher speaks through his nose, second, his gesture is too emphatic, thirdly, to waive what's pedagogic, the subject matter itself lacks logic, fourthly, the English is ungrammatic, great news, the preacher is found no Pascal, whom, if I pleased, I might to the task call of making square to a finite eye the circle of infinity, and find so all but just succeeding. Great news! The sermon proves no reading, where bee-like in the flowers I bury me, like Taylor's the immortal Jeremy. And now that I know the very worst of him, what was it I thought to obtain at first of him? Ha! Huh. Is God mocked, as he asks? Shall I take on me to change his tasks? And dare, dispatched to the river-head for a sample draught of the element, neglect the thing for which he sent, and return with another thing instead? Saying, Because the water found welling up from the underground is mingled with the taints of earth, while thou, I know, dost laugh at dearth, and could, at wink or word, convulse the world with the leap of a river-pulse, Therefore I turned from these oozings muddy, and bring thee a chalice I found instead. See the brave veins in the breccia ruddy? One would suppose that the marble bled. What matters the water? A hope I have nursed the waterless cup will quench my thirst. Better to have knelt at the poorest stream that trickles in pain from the straightest rift, for the less or the more is all God's gift. Who blocks up or breaks wide the granite seam, and here is there water or not to drink? I then, in ignorance and weakness, taking God's help, have attained to think my heart does best to receive in meekness that mode of worship as most to his mind, where earthly aids being cast behind, his all in all appears serene, with the thinnest human veil between letting the mystic lamps, the seven, the many motions of his spirit, pass as they list to earth from heaven. For the preacher's merit or demerit, it were to be wished the flaws were fewer in the earthen vessel, holding treasure, which lies as safe in a golden ewer. But the main thing is, does it hold good measure? Heaven soon sets right all other matters. Ask else these ruins of humanity, this flesh worn out to rags and tatters, this soul at struggle with insanity, who thence take comfort, can I doubt which an empire gained were a loss without? May it be mine, and let us hope that no worse blessing befall the Pope, turned sick at last of today's buffoonery of posturings and petticoatings, beside his Bourbon bullies' gloatings in the bloody orgies of drunk poltroonery, nor may the professor forego its peace at Gottingen presently, when in the dusk of his life, if his cough, as I fear, should increase, prophesied of by that horrible husk, when thicker and thicker the darkness fills the world through his misty spectacles, and he gropes for something more substantial than a fable, myth, or personification, may Christ do for him what no mere man shall, and stand confessed as the God of salvation, Meantime, in the still recurring fear, lest myself, at unawares, be found while attacking the choice of my neighbors round, with none of my own made, I choose. Here. The giving out of the hymn reclaims me. I have done. And if any blames me, thinking that merely to touch in brevity the topics I dwell on were unlawful, or worse, that I trench with undue levity on the bounds of the holy and the awful, I praise the heart and pity the head of him, and refer myself to thee instead of him, 
who head and heart alike discernest, looking below the light speech we utter, when frothy spume and frequent sputter prove that the soul's depths boil in earnest. May truth shine out, stand ever before us. I put up pencil, and join chorus to Hepzibah tune, without further apology, the last five verses of the third section of the seventeenth hymn of Whitfield's collection, to conclude with the doxology. End of Christmas Eve, stanzas 14 through 22, by Robert Browning, read by Maria Casper. Christmas Night of 62, by William Gordon McCabe, read in English. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The wintry blast goes wailing by. The snow is falling overhead. I hear the lonely sentries tread, and distant watchfires light the sky. Dim forms go flitting through the gloom. The soldiers cluster round the blaze to talk of other Christmas days and softly speak of home and home. My sabre swinging overhead gleams in the watchfire's fitful glow while fiercely drives the blinding snow and memory leads me to the dead. My thoughts go wandering to and fro, vibrating twixt the now and then. I see the low-browed home again the old hall wreathed with mistletoe. And sweetly from the far-off years comes borne the laughter faint and low, the voices of the long ago. My eyes are wet with tender tears. I feel again the mother kiss. I see again the glad surprise that lightened up the tranquil eyes and brimmed them o'er with tears of bliss. As rushing from the old hall door, she fondly clasped her wayward boy her face all radiant with the joy she felt to see him home once more. My sabre swinging on the bough gleams in the watchfire's fitful glow, while fiercely drives the blinding snow a slant upon my saddened brow. Those cherished faces all are gone, asleep within the quiet graves where lies the snow in drifting waves, and I am sitting here alone, there's not a comrade here to-night but knows that loved ones far away on bended knees this night will pray god bring our darling from the fight but there are none to wish me back for me no yearning prayers arise the lips are mute and close the eyes my home is in the bivouac in the army of northern virginia end of christmas night of sixty two by William Gordon McCabe. Read by Thomas Peter. Christmas Storms and Sunshine by Elizabeth Gaskell. Read in English. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Christmas Storms and Sunshine in the town of um, no matter where there circulated two local newspapers no matter when now the flying post was long established and respectable alias bigoted and tory the examiner was spirited and intelligent alias newfangled and democratic every week these newspapers contained articles abusing each other as cross and peppery as articles could be and evidently the production of irritated minds, although they seemed to have one stereotyped commencement, though the article appearing in last week's post or examiner is below contempt, yet we have been induced, etc., etc. And every Saturday the radical shopkeepers shook hands together and agreed that the post was done for by the slashing clever examiner, while the more dignified Tories began by regretting that Johnson should think that low paper, only read by a few of the vulgar, worth wasting his wit upon. However, the examiner was at its last gasp. It was not, though. It lived and flourished, at least it paid its way, 
as one of the heroes of my story could tell. He was chief compositor, or whatever title may be given to the head man of the mechanical part of a newspaper. He hardly confined himself to that department. Once or twice, unknown to the editor, when the manuscript had fallen short, he had filled up the vacant space by compositions of his own. Announcements of a forthcoming crop of green peas in December, a grey thrush having been seen, or a white hair, or such interesting phenomena. Invented for the occasion, I must confess, but what of that? His wife always knew when to expect a little specimen of her husband's literary talent, by a peculiar cough which served as a prelude, and judging from this encouraging sign, and the high-pitched and emphatic voice in which he read them, she was inclined to think that an ode to an early rosebud in the corner devoted to original poetry, and a letter in the correspondence department, signed Pro Bono Publico, were her husband's writing, and to hold up her head accordingly. I never could find out what it was that occasioned the Hodgsons to lodge in the same house as the Jenkinses. Jenkins held the same office in the Tory paper as Hodgson did in the Examiner, and, as I said before, I leave you to give it a name. But Jenkins had a proper sense of his position, and a proper reverence for all in authority, from the king down to the editor and the sub-editor. He would as soon have thought of borrowing the king's crown for a nightcap, or the king's sceptre for a walking-stick, as he would have thought of filling up any spare corner with any production of his own. And I think it would have even added to his contempt of Hodgson, if that were possible, had he known of these productions of his brain, as the latter fondly alluded to the paragraphs he inserted when speaking to his wife. Jenkins had his wife, too. Wives were wanting to finish the completeness of this quarrel, which existed one memorable Christmas week, some dozen years ago, between the two neighbors, the two compositors. And with wives, it was a very pretty, a very complete quarrel. To make the opposing parties still more equal, still more well-matched, if the Hodgsons had a baby, such a baby, a poor puny little thing, Mrs. Jenkins had a cat, such a cat, a great nasty meowling tom-cat, that was always stealing the milk put by for little angel's supper. And now, having matched Greek with Greek, I must proceed to the tug of war. It was the day before Christmas. Such a cold east wind, such an inky sky, such a blue-black look in people's faces, as they were driven out more than usual to complete their purchases for the next day's festival. Before leaving home that morning, Jenkins had given some money to his wife to buy the next day's dinner. <clears throat> My dear, I wish for turkey and sausages. It may be a weakness, but I own I am partial to sausages. My deceased mother was. Such tastes are hereditary. As to the sweets, whether plum pudding or mince pies, I leave such considerations to you. I only beg you not to mind expense. Christmas comes but once a year." And again he had called out from the bottom of the first flight of stairs, just close to the Hodgson's door. Such ostentatiousness, as Mrs. Hodgson observed. You will not forget the sausages, my dear. I should have liked to have had something above common, Mary, said Hodgson, as they two made their plans for the next day. But I think roast beef must do for us. You see, love, we've a family. Only one, Jem. I don't want more than roast beef, though, I'm sure. Before I went to service, mother and me would have thought roast beef a very fine dinner. Well, let's settle it, then. Roast beef and a plum pudding. And now, good-bye. Mind and take care of little Tom. I thought he was a bit hoarse this morning. And off he went to his work. Now it was a good while since Mrs. Jenkins and Mrs. Hodgson had spoken to each other, although they were quite as much in possession of the knowledge of events and opinions as though they did. Mary knew that Mrs. Jenkins despised her for not having a real lace cap, which Mrs. Jenkins had, and for having been a servant, which Mrs. Jenkins had not, and the little occasional pinchings which the Hodgsons were obliged to resort to to make both ends meet 
would have been very patiently endured by Mary if she had not winced under Mrs. Jenkins's knowledge of such economy. But she had her revenge. She had a child, and Mrs. Jenkins had none. To have had a child, even such a puny baby as little Tom, Mrs. Jenkins would have worn the commonest caps and cleaned grates and drudged her fingers to the bone. The great unspoken disappointment of her life soured her temper and turned her thoughts inward and made her morbid and selfish. Hang that cat! He's been stealing again. He's gnawed the cold mutton in his nasty mouth till it's not fit to set before a Christian, and I've nothing else for Jem's dinner. But I'll give it him, now I've caught him, that I will. So saying, Mary Hodgson caught up her husband's Sunday cane, and, despite Pussy's cries and scratches, she gave him such a beating as she hoped might cure him of his thievish propensities. When, lo and behold, Mrs. Jenkins stood at the door, with a face of bitter wrath. "'Aren't you ashamed of yourself, ma'am, to abuse a poor dumb animal, ma'am, as knows no better than to take food when he sees it, ma'am? He only follows the nature which God has given, ma'am, and it's a pity your nature, ma'am, which I've heard is of the stingy and saving species, does not make you shut your cupboard door a little closer. There is such a thing as law for brute animals. I'll ask Mr. Jenkins, but I don't think them radicals has done away with that law yet, for all their reform bill, ma'am. My poor precious love of a Tommy, is he hurt, and is his leg broke for taking a mouthful of scraps, as most people would give away to a beggar, if he'd take em wound up Mrs. Jenkins, casting a contemptuous look on the remnant of a scrag end of mutton. Mary felt very angry and very guilty, for she did really pity the poor limping animal as he crept up to his mistress and there lay down to bemoan himself. She wished she had not beaten him so hard, for it certainly was her own careless way of never shutting the cupboard door that had tempted him to his fault but the sneer at her little bit of mutton turned her penitence to fresh wrath, and she shut the door in Mrs. Jenkins's face as she stood caressing her cat in the lobby, with such a bang that it wakened little Tom, and he began to cry. Everything was to go wrong with Mary today. Now Baby was awake. Who was to take her husband's dinner to the office? She took the child in her arms and tried to hush him off to sleep again, and as she sung, she cried. She could hardly tell why. A sort of reaction from her violent and angry feelings. She wished she had never beaten that poor cat. She wondered if his leg was really broken. What would her mother say if she knew how cross and cruel her little Mary was getting? If she should live to beat her child in one of her angry fits? It was of no use lullabying while she sobbed so. It must be given up, and she must just carry her baby in her arms and take him with her to the office, for it was long past dinner time. So she pared the mutton carefully, although by so doing she reduced the meat to an infinitesimal quantity, and taking the baked potatoes out of the oven, she popped them piping hot into her basket with the etceteras of plate, butter, salt, and knife and fork. It was indeed a bitter wind. She bent against it as she ran, and the flakes of snow were sharp and cutting as ice. Baby cried all the way, though she cuddled him up in her shawl. Then her husband had made his appetite up for a potato pie, and, literary man as he was, his body had got so much the better of his mind that he looked rather black at the cold mutton. Mary had no appetite for her own dinner when she arrived at home again, so, after she had tried to feed Baby, and he had fretfully refused to take his bread and milk, she laid him down as usual on his quilt, surrounded by playthings, while she sided away and chopped suet for the next day's pudding. Early in the afternoon a parcel came, done up first in brown paper, then in such a white, grass-bleached, sweet-smelling towel, and a note from her dear, dear mother— in which quaint writing she endeavoured to tell her daughter that she was not forgotten at Christmas time, but that learning that Farmer Burton was killing his pig, she had made interest for some of his famous pork, out of which she had manufactured some sausages, and flavoured them just as Mary used to like when she lived at home. 
Dear, dear mother, said Mary to herself, there never was anyone like her for remembering other folk. What rare sausages she used to make. Home things have a smack with them, no bought things can ever have. Set them up with their sausages. I've a notion if Mrs. Jenkins had ever tasted mother's, she'd have no fancy for them town-made things Fanny took in just now. And so she went on thinking about home, till the smiles and the dimples came out again at the remembrance of that pretty cottage, which would look green even now in the depth of winter, with its pyracanthus and its holly bushes, and the great Portugal laurel that was her mother's pride, and the back path through the orchard to Farmer Burton's, how well she remembered it. The bushels of unripe apples she had picked up there and distributed among his pigs, till he had scolded her for giving them so much green trash. She was interrupted. Her baby, I call him a baby because his father and mother did, and because he was so little for his age, but I rather think he was eighteen months old, had fallen asleep some time before among his playthings, an uneasy, restless sleep, but of which Mary had been thankful, as his morning's nap had been too short, and as she was so busy. But now he began to make such a strange crowing noise, just like a chair drawn heavily and gratingly along a kitchen floor. His eyes were open, but expressive of nothing but pain. "'Mother's darling,' said Mary, in terror, lifting him up. "'Baby, try not to make that noise.' "'Hush, hush, darling, what hurts him?' But the noise came worse and worse. "'Fanny, Fanny,' Mary called in mortal fright, for her baby was almost black with his gasping breath, and she had no one to ask for aid or sympathy but her landlady's daughter, a little girl of twelve or thirteen who attended to the house in her mother's absence as a daily cook in gentlemen's families. Fanny was more especially considered the attendant of the upstairs lodgers, who paid for the use of the kitchen, for Jenkins could not abide the smell of meat cooking. But just now she was, fortunately, sitting at her afternoon's work of darning stockings, and hearing Mrs. Hodgson's cry of terror, she ran to her sitting-room and understood the case at a glance. "'He's got the croup. Oh, Mrs. Hodgson, he'll die as sure as fate. Little brother had it, and he died in no time. The doctor said he could do nothing for him. It had gone too far. He said if we'd put him in a warm bath at the first it might have saved him. But, bless you, he was never half so bad as your baby. Unconsciously there mingled in her statement some of a child's love of producing an effect, but the increasing danger was clear enough. Oh, my baby, my baby, oh, love, love, don't look so ill, I cannot bear it, and my fire so low. There I was thinking of home and picking currants and never minding the fire. Oh, Fanny, what is the fire like in the kitchen? Speak. Mother told me to screw it up and throw some slack on as soon as Mrs. Jenkins had done with it, and so I did. It's very low and black. But, oh, Mrs. Hodgson, let me run for the doctor. I cannot abear to hear him. It's so like a little brother. Through her streaming tears, Mary motioned her to go, and, trembling, sinking, sick at heart, she laid her boy in his cradle and ran to fill her kettle. Mrs. Jenkins, having cooked her husband's snug little dinner, to which he came home, having told him her story of Pussy's beating, at which he was justly and dignifiedly indignant, saying it was all of a piece with that abusive examiner, having received the sausages and turkey and mince pies which her husband had ordered, and cleaned up the room and prepared everything for tea, and coaxed and duly bemoaned her cat, who had pretty nearly forgotten his beating but very much enjoyed the petting, Having done all these and many other things, Mrs. Jenkins sat down to get up the real lace cap. Every thread was pulled out separately and carefully stretched. When, what was that? Outside, in the street, a chorus of piping children's voices sang the old carol she had heard a hundred times in the days of her youth. As Joseph was a-walking, he heard an angel sing. This night shall be born our heavenly king. He neither shall be born in house and nor in hall, nor in the place of paradise, 
but in an ox's stall. He neither shall be clothed in purple nor in pall, but all in fair linen, as were babies all. He neither shall be rocked in silver nor in gold, but in a wooden cradle that rocks on the mould, etc. She got up and went to the window. There, below, stood the group of grey-black little figures, relieved against the snow, which now enveloped everything. For old sake's sake, as she phrased it, she counted out a halfpenny apiece for the singers, out of the copper bag, and threw them down below. The room had become chilly while she had been counting out and throwing down her money, so she stirred her already glowing fire, and sat down right before it, but not to stretch her lace. Like Mary Hodgson, she began to think over long past days, on softening remembrances of the dead and gone, on words long forgotten, on holy stories heard at her mother's knee. "'I cannot think what's come over me to-night,' said she, half aloud, recovering herself by the sound of her own voice from her train of thought. "'My head goes wandering on them old times. I'm sure more texts have come into my head, with thinking on my mother within this last half-hour, than I've thought on for years and years. I hope I'm not going to die.' Folks say thinking too much on the dead betokens we're going to join them. I should be loath to go just yet, such a fine turkey as we've got for dinner tomorrow, too. Knock, knock, knock at the door, as fast as knuckles could go. And then, as if the comer could not wait, the door was opened, and Mary Hodgson stood there, as white as death. Mrs. Jenkins! Oh, your kettle is boiling, thank God! Let me have the water for my baby. For the love of God, he's got croup and is dying. Mrs. Jenkins turned on her chair with a wooden, inflexible look on her face, that between ourselves her husband knew and dreaded for all his pompous dignity. I'm sorry I can't oblige you, ma'am. My kettle is wanted for my husband's tea. Don't be afeard, Tommy. Mrs. Hodgson won't venture to intrude herself where she's not desired. "'You'd better send for the doctor, ma'am, instead of wasting your time in wringing your hands, ma'am. My kettle is engaged.' Mary clasped her hands together with passionate force, but spoke no word of entreaty to that wooden face, that sharp, determined voice. But as she turned away she prayed for strength to bear the coming trial, and strength to forgive Mrs. Jenkins.' Mrs. Jenkins watched her go away meekly, as one who has no hope— and then she turned upon herself, as sharply as she ever did on any one else. "'What a brute I am! Lord, forgive me! What's my husband's tea to a baby's life? In croup, too, where time is everything. You crabbed old vixen, you! Any one may know you've never had a child!' She was downstairs, kettle in hand, before she had finished her self-upbraiding, and when in Mrs. Hodgson's room she rejected all thanks— Mary had not the voice for very many words, saying stiffly, "'I do it for the poor babby's sake, ma'am, hoping he may live to have mercy to poor dumb beasts if he does forget to lock his cupboards.' But she did everything, and more than Mary, with her young inexperience, could have thought of. She prepared the warm bath, and tried it with her husband's own thermometer. Mr. Jenkins was as punctual as Clockworth in noting down the temperature of every day. She let his mother place her baby in the tub, still preserving the same rigid, affronted aspect, and then she went upstairs without a word. Mary longed to ask her to stay, but dared not, though when she left the room the tears chased each other down her cheeks faster than ever. Poor young mother, how she counted the minutes till the doctor should come! But before he came, down again stalked Mrs. Jenkins, with something in her hand. I've seen many of these croup fits, which I take it you've not, ma'am. Mustard plasters is very sovereign, put on the throat. I've been up and made one, ma'am, and by your leave I'll put it on the little fellow. Mary could not speak, but she signed her grateful assent. It began to smart while they still kept silence. 
and he looked up to his mother as if seeking courage from her looks to bear the stinging pain. But she was softly crying to see him suffer, and her want of courage reacted upon him, and he began to sob aloud. Instantly Mrs. Jenkins's apron went up, hiding her face. Peek boo baby, said she, as merrily as she could. His little face brightened, and his mother having once got the cue, the two women kept the little fellow amused until his plaster had taken effect. He's better. Oh, Mrs. Jenkins, look at his eyes, how different, and he breathes quite softly. As Mary spoke thus, the doctor entered. He examined his patient. Baby was really better. It has been a sharp attack, but the remedies you have applied have been worth all the pharmacopoeia an hour later. I shall send round a powder, etc., etc. Mrs. Jenkins stayed to hear his opinion, and, her heart wonderfully more easy, was going to leave the room, when Mary seized her hand and kissed it. She could not speak her gratitude. Mrs. Jenkins looked affronted and awkward, and as if she must go upstairs and wash her hand directly. But in spite of these sour looks, she came softly down, an hour or so afterwards, to see how Baby was. The little gentleman slept well after the fright he had given his friends, and on Christmas morning, when Mary awoke and looked at the sweet little pale face lying on her arm, she could hardly realize the danger he had been in. When she came down, later than usual, she found the household in a commotion. What do you think had happened? Why, Pussy had been a traitor to his best friend, and had eaten up some of Mr. Jenkins's own especial sausages, and gnawed and tumbled at the rest so that they were not fit to be eaten. There were no bounds to that cat's appetite. He would have eaten his own father if he had been tender enough. And now Mrs. Jenkins stormed and cried, Hang that cat! Christmas Day, too, and all the shops were shut. What was turkey without sausages? gruffly asked Mr. Jenkins. Oh, Jem, whispered Mary, hearken what a piece of work he's making about sausages. I should like to take Mrs. Jenkins up some of Mother's. They're twice as good as bought sausages. I see no objection, my dear. Sausages do not involve intimacies else his politics are what I can no ways respect. But, oh, Jem, if you had seen her last night about baby, I'm sure she may scold me forever and I'll not answer. I'd even make her cat welcome to the sausages. The tears gathered to Mary's eyes as she kissed her boy. Better take em upstairs, my dear, and give em to the cat's mistress. And Jem chuckled at his saying. Mary put them on a plate, but still she loitered. What must I say, Jem? I never know. Say, I hope you'll accept of these sausages, as my mother... No, that's not grammar. I'll say what comes uppermost, Mary. It'll be sure to be right. So Mary carried them upstairs and knocked at the door, and when told to come in, she looked very red, but went up to Mrs. Jenkins, saying, Please take these. Mother made them, and was away before any answer could be given. Just as Hodgson was ready to go to church, Mrs. Jenkins came downstairs, and called Fanny. In a minute the latter entered the Hodgson's room, and delivered Mr. and Mrs. Jenkins's compliments, and they would be particular glad if Mr. and Mrs. Hodgson would eat their dinner with them. "'And carry baby upstairs in a shawl, be sure,' added Mrs. Jenkins's voice from the passage, close to the door, whither she had followed her messenger. There was no discussing the matter, with this certainty of every word being overheard." Mary looked anxiously at her husband. She remembered his saying he did not approve of Mr. Jenkins's politics. "'Do you think it would do for Baby?' asked he. "'Oh, yes,' answered she, eagerly. "'I would wrap him up so warm. "'And I've got our room up to sixty-five already, for all it's so frosty,' added the voice outside. "'Now how do you think they settled the matter?' "'The very best way in the world.' Mr. and Mrs. Jenkins came down into the Hodgson's room and dined there. Turkey at the top, roast beef at the bottom, sausages at one side, potatoes at the other, second course, plum pudding at the top, and mince pie at the bottom. And after dinner Mrs. Jenkins would have baby on her knee, and he seemed quite to take to her. She declared he was admiring the real lace on her cap. But Mary thought, though she did not say so, that he was pleased by her kind looks and coaxing words. 
Then he was wrapped up and carried carefully upstairs to tea in Mrs. Jenkins's room. And after tea, Mrs. Jenkins and Mary and her husband found out each other's mutual liking for music, and sat singing old glees and catches till I don't know what o'clock, without one word about politics or newspapers. Before they parted, Mary had coaxed Pussy onto her knee, for Mrs. Jenkins would not part with Baby, who was sleeping on her lap. "'When you're busy, bring him to me. Do now. It will be a real favor. I know you must have a deal to do with another one coming. Let him come up to me. I'll take the greatest of cares of him. Pretty darling, how sweet he looks when he's asleep.' When the couples were once more alone, the husbands unburdened their minds to their wives. Mr. Jenkins said to his, "'Do you know Burgess tried to make me believe Hodgson was such a fool as to put paragraphs into the examiner now and then? But I see he knows his place, and has got too much sense to do any such thing.' Hodgson said, "'Mary, love, I almost fancy from Jenkins' way of speaking, so much civiler than I expected, that he guesses I wrote that pro bono in the rosebud. At any rate, I've no objection to your naming it if the subject should come uppermost. I should like him to know I'm a literary man. Well, I've ended my tale. I hope you don't think it too long. But before I go, just let me say one thing. If any of you have any quarrels, or misunderstandings, or coolnesses, or cold shoulders, or shynesses, or tiffs, or miffs, or huffs, with anyone else, just make friends before Christmas. You will be so much merrier if you do. I ask it of you for the sake of that old angelic song heard so many years ago by the shepherds keeping watch by night on Bethlehem Heights. End of Christmas Storms and Sunshine by Elizabeth Gaskell Read by Maria Casper Christmas Waits in Boston, from the Ingham Papers, by Edward Everett Hale, read in English. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Christmas Waits in Boston When my friends of the Boston Daily Advertiser asked me last year to contribute to their Christmas number, I was very glad to recall this scrap of Mr. Ingham's memoirs. For in most modern Christmas stories, I have observed that the rich wake up of a sudden to befriend the poor, and that the moral is educed from such compassion. The incidents in this story show, what all life shows, that the poor befriend the rich as truly as the rich befriend the poor, that in the Christian life each needs all. I have been asked a dozen times how far this story is true. Of course, no such series of incidents has ever taken place in this order in four or five hours. But there is nothing told here which has not parallels perfectly fair in my experience, or in that of any working minister. I always give myself a Christmas present, and on this particular year the present was a carol party, which is about as good fun, all things consenting kindly, as a man can have. Many things must consent, it will appear. First of all, there must be good sleighing, and second, a fine night for Christmas Eve. Ours are not the carolings of your poor shivering little East Angles or South Mercians, where they have to plod round afoot in countries which do not know what a sleigh ride is. I had asked Harry to have sixteen of the best voices in the chapel school to be trained to five or six good carols, without knowing why. We did not care to disappoint them, if a February thaw, setting in on the 25th of December, should break up the spree before it began. Then I had told Howland that he must reserve for me a span of good horses, and a sleigh that I could pack sixteen small children into tight-stowed. Howland is always good about such things. He knew what the sleigh was for, having done the same in other years, and made the span four horses of his own accord, because the children would like it better, and it would be no difference to him. Sunday night, as the weather nymphs ordered, the wind hauled round to the northwest and everything froze hard. Monday night things moderated and the snow began to fall steadily. 
so steadily, and so Tuesday night the Metropolitan people gave up their unequal contest, all good men and angels rejoicing at their discomfiture, and only a few of the people, in the very lowest bulgy, being ill-natured enough to grieve. And thus it was that by Thursday evening was one hard, compact roadway, from Copse Hill to the Bone Burners' Gehenna, fit for good men and angels to ride over, without jar, without noise, and without fatigue, to horse or man. So it was that when I came down with Lycidas to the chapel at seven o'clock, I found Harry had gathered there his eight pretty girls and his eight jolly boys, and had them practicing for the last time. Carol, carol, Christians, carol joyfully, carol for the coming of Christ's nativity. I think the children had got an inkling of what was coming, or perhaps Harry had hinted it to their mothers. Certainly they were warmly dressed, and when fifteen minutes afterwards Howland came round with the sleigh, he had put in as many rugs and bearskins as if he thought the children were to be taken newborn from their respective cradles. Great was the rejoicing as the bells of the horses rang beneath the chapel windows, and Harry did not get his last de capo for his last carol. Not much matter, indeed, for they were perfect enough in it before midnight. Lycidas and I tumbled in on the back seat, each with a child in his lap, to keep us warm. I flanked by Sam Perry and he by John Rich, both of the mercurial age, and therefore good to do errands. Harry was in front somewhere, flanked in likewise, and the other children lay miscellaneously in between, like sardines when you have first opened the box. I had invited Lycidas, because, besides being my best friend, he is the best fellow in the world, and so deserves the best Christmas Eve can give him. Under the full moon, on the still white snow, with sixteen children at the happiest, and with the blessed memories of the best the world has ever had, there can be nothing better than two or three such hours. First driver, out on Commonwealth Avenue, that will tone down the horses. Stop on the left after you've passed Fairfield Street. So we dashed up to the front of Halliburton's palace, where he was keeping his first Christmas tide, and the children, whom Harry had hushed down for a square or two, broke forth with good full voice under his strong lead, in Shepherd of Tender Sheep, singing with all that unconscious pathos with which children do sing, and starting the tears in your eyes in the midst of your gladness. The instant the horses' bells stopped, their voices began. In an instant more we saw Halliburton and Anna run to the window and pull up the shades, and in a minute more faces at all the windows. And so the children sung through Clement's old hymn. Little did Clement think of bells and snow, as he taught it in his Sunday school there in Alexandria. But perhaps today, as they pin up the laurels and the palm in the chapel at Alexandria, they are humming the words, not thinking of Clement more than he thought of us. As the children closed with, Swell the triumphant song to Christ our King, Halliburton came running out and begged me to bring them in. But I told him no, as soon as I could hush their shouts of Merry Christmas, that we had a long journey before us and we must not alight by the way. And the children broke out with, Hail to the night, hail to the day, rather a favorite, quicker and more to the childish taste, perhaps, than the other, and with another Merry Christmas we were off again. Off the length of Commonwealth Avenue, to where it crosses the Brookline branch of the Mill Dam, dashing along with the gayest of the sleighing parties as we came back into town, up Chestnut Street, through Lewisburg Square, ran the sleigh into a bank on the slope of Pinckney Street in front of Walter's house, and before they suspected there was anyone had come, the children were singing, Carol, carol, Christians, carol joyfully. Kisses flung from the window, kisses flung back from the street, Merry Christmas again with a good will. And then one of the girls began, when Anna took the baby and pressed his lips to hers, and all of them fell in so cheerily. Oh, dear me, it is a scrap of old Ephraim the Syrian, if they did but know it. And when after this Harry would fain have driven on, 
because two carols at one house was the rule, how the little witches begged that they might sing just one more song there, because Mrs. Alexander had been so kind to them when she showed them about the German stitches. And then up the hill and over to the north end, and as far as we could get the horses up into Moon Court, that they might sing to the Italian image man who gave Lucy the boy and dog and plaster when she was sick in the spring. For the children had, you know, the choice of where they would go, and they selected their best friends, and will be more apt to remember the Italian image man than Chrysostom himself, though Chrysostom should have made a few remarks to them seventeen times in the chapel. Then the Italian image man heard for the first time in his life, Now is the time of Christmas come, and Jesus in his babes abiding. And then we came up Hanover Street and stopped under Mr. Jerry's chapel, where they were dressing the walls with their evergreens, and gave them, Hail to the night, hail to the day. And so down State Street and stopped at the advertiser office, because when the boys gave their literary entertainment, Mr. Hale had put in their advertisement for nothing. And up in the old attic there, the compositors were relieved to hear, nor war nor battle sound, the waiting world was still, so that even the leading editor relaxed from his gravity, and the in-general man from his more serious views, and the daily the next morning wished everybody a Merry Christmas, with even more unction, and resolved that in coming years it would have a supplement large enough to contain all the good wishes. So away again to the houses of confectioners who had given the children candy, to Miss Simmons's house, because she had been so good to them in school, to the palaces of millionaires who had prayed for these children with tears if the children only knew it, to Dr. Frothingham's in Summer Street, I remember, where we stopped, because the Boston Association of Ministers met here, and out on Dover Street Bridge, that the poor chairmender might hear our carols, sung once more before he heard them better sung in another world where nothing needs mending. King of glory, king of peace, hear the song and see the star. Welcome be thou, heavenly king, was not Christ our Saviour? And all the others, rung out, with order or without order, breaking the hush directly as the horses' bells were stilled, thrown into the air with all the gladness of childhood, selected sometimes as Harry happened to think best for the hearers, but more often as the jubilant and uncontrolled enthusiasm of the children bade them break out in the most joyous, least studied, and purely lyrical of all. Oh, we went to twenty places that night, I suppose. We went to the grandest places in Boston, and we went to the meanest. Everywhere they wished us a Merry Christmas, and we them. Everywhere a little crowd gathered round us, and then we dashed away, far enough to gather quite another crowd, and then back, perhaps, not sorry to double on our steps if need were, and leaving every crowd with the happy thought of the star, the manger, and the child. At nine we brought up at my house, D Street, three doors from the corner, and the children picked their very best for Polly and my six little girls to hear, and then for the first time we let them jump out and run in. Polly had some hot oysters for them, so that the frolic was crowned with a treat. There was a Christmas cake cut into sixteen pieces, which they took home to dream upon, and then hoods and muffs on again, and by ten o'clock, or a little after, we had all the girls and all the little ones at their homes. Four of the big boys, our two flankers and Harry's right and left-hand men, begged that they might stay till the last moment they could walk back from the stable, and rather walk than not, indeed, to which we assented, having gained parental permission, as we left younger sisters in their respective homes. Lycidas and I both thought, as we went into these modest houses, to leave the children, to say they had been good, and to wish a merry Christmas ourselves, to fathers, mothers, and to guardian aunts, that the welcome in these homes was perhaps the best part of it all, here was the great stout sailor-boy, whom we had not seen since he came back from sea. He was a mere child when he left our school, years on years ago, for the East, on board Perry's vessel, and had been round the world. 
Here was brave Mrs. Mazury. I had not seen her since her mother died. Indeed, Mr. Ingham, I got so used to watching then that I cannot sleep well yet a nights. I wish you knew some poor creature that wanted me to-night, if it were only in memory of Bethlehem. "'You take a deal of trouble for the children,' said Campbell, as he crushed my hand in his. "'But you know they love you, and you know I would do as much for you and yours.' Which I knew was true. "'What can I send to your children?' said Dalton, who was finishing sword-blades. Ill wind was Fort Sumter, but it blew good to poor Dalton, whom it set up in the world with his sword-factory. "'Here's an old-fashioned tape-measure for the girl, and a Sheffield wimble for the boy. "'What, there is no boy? Well, let one of the girls have it, then. It will count as one more present for her.' And so he pressed his brown-paper parcel into my hand. From every house, though it were the humblest, a word of love, as sweet in truth as if we could have heard the voice of angels singing in the sky. I bade Harry good night, took Lycidas to his lodgings, and gave his wife my Christmas wishes and good night, and, coming down to the sleigh again, gave way to the feeling which I think you will all understand, that this was not the time to stop, but just the time to begin, for the streets were stiller now, and the moon brighter than ever, if possible, and the blessings of these simple people, and of the grand people, and of the very angels in heaven, who are not bound to the misery of using words when they have anything worth saying, all these wishes and blessings were around me, all the purity of the still winter night, and I didn't want to lose it all by going to bed to sleep. So I put the boys all together, where they could chatter, and took one more brisk turn on the two avenues, and then, passing through Charles Street, I believe I was even thinking of Cambridge, I noticed the lights in Woodhull's house, and seeing that they were up, I thought I would make Fanny a midnight call. She came to the door herself. I asked if she were waiting up for Santa Claus, but saw in a moment that I must not joke with her. She said she had hoped I was her husband. In a minute was one of those contrasts which make life life. God puts us into the world that we may try them and be tried by them. Poor Fanny's mother had been blocked up on the Springfield train as she was coming on to Christmas. The old lady had been chilled through and was here in bed now with pneumonia. Both of Fanny's children had been ailing when she came, and this morning the doctor had pronounced it scarlet fever. Fanny had not undressed herself since Monday, nor slept, I thought, in the same time. So, while we had been singing carols and wishing Merry Christmas, this poor child had been waiting and hoping that her husband or Edward, both of whom were on the tramp, would find for her and bring to her the model nurse who had not yet appeared. But at midnight this unknown sister had not arrived, nor had either of the men returned. When I rang, Fanny had hoped I was one of them. Professional paragons, dear reader, are shy of scarlet fever. I told the poor child that it was better as it was. I wrote a line for Sam Perry to take to his aunt, Mrs. Mazury, in which I simply said, Dear Mamma, I have found the poor creature who wants you tonight. Come back in this carriage. I bade him to take a hack at Gates, where they were all up waiting for the assembly to be done at Papanti's. I sent him over to Albany Street. And really, as I sat there trying to soothe Fanny, it seemed to me less time than it has taken to dictate this little story about her, before Mrs. Mazury rang gently, and I left them, having made Fanny promise that she would consecrate the day which at that moment was born, by trusting God, by going to bed and going to sleep, knowing that her children were in much better hands than hers. As I passed out of the hall, the gaslight fell on a print of Correggio's Adoration, where Woodhull had himself written years before, Ut apariat is qui in tenebris et umbra mortis positi sunt. Darkness and the shadow of death, indeed. And what light like the light and comfort such a woman as my Mary Mazury brings. And so, but for one of those accidents, as we call them, I should have dropped the boys at the corner of Dover Street and gone home with my Christmas lesson. But it happened, as we irreverently say, it happened, as we crossed Park Square, 
so called from its being an irregular pentagon of which one of the sides has been taken away that i recognized a tall man plodding across the snow head down round-shouldered stooped forward in walking with his right shoulder higher than his left and by these tokens i knew tom corum prince among boston princes not thomas corum that built the foundling hospital though he was of boston too but he was longer ago you must look for him in addison's contribution to a supplement to the spectator the old spectator i mean not the thursday spectator which is more recent not thomas corum i say but tom corum who would build a hospital to-morrow if you showed him the need without waiting to die first and always helps forward as a prince should whatever is princely be it a statue at home a school in richmond a newspaper in florida a church in exeter a steam line to liverpool or a widow who wants a hundred dollars i wished him a merry christmas and mr howland by a fine instinct drew up the horses as i spoke corum shook hands and as it seldom happens that i have an empty carriage while he is on foot i asked him if i might not see him home he was glad to get in we wrapped him up with the spoils of the bear the fox and the bison turned the horses heads again five hours now since they had started on this tangled errand of theirs and gave him his ride i was thinking of you at the moment said corum thinking of old college times of the mystery of language as unfolded by the abbe faria to edmond dantes in the depths of the chateau d'if i was wondering if you could teach me japanese if i asked you to a christmas dinner i laughed japan was really a novelty then and i asked him since when he had been in correspondence with that sealed country it seemed that their house at shanghai had just sent across there their agents for establishing the first house in edomo in japan under the new treaty everything looked promising and the beginnings were made for the branch which has since become dot and trevelyan there of this he had the first tidings in his letters by the mail of that afternoon john corum his brother had written to him and had said that he enclosed for his amusement the japanese bill of particulars as it had been drawn out on which they had founded their orders for the first assorted cargo ever to be sent from america to edomo bill of particulars there was stretching down the long tissue paper in exquisite chirography but by some freak of the total depravity of things the translated order for the assorted cargo was not there john corum in his care to fold up the japanese writing nicely had left on his own desk at shanghai the more intelligible english and so i must wait said tom philosophically till my next east india mail for my orders certain that seven english houses have had less enthusiastic and philological correspondence than my brother i said i did not see that that i could not teach him to speak the taghelian dialects so well that he could read them with facility before saturday but i could do a good deal better did he remember writing a note to old jack percival for me five years ago no he remembered no such thing he knew jack percival but he never wrote a note to him in his life did he remember giving me fifty dollars because i had taken a delicate boy whom i was going to send to sea and i was not quite satisfied with the government outfit no he did not remember that which was not strange for that was a thing he was doing every day well i don't care how much you remember but the boy about whom you wrote to jack percival for whose mother's ease of mind you provided that half hundred is back again strong straight and well and what is more to the point he had the whole charge of perry's commissariat on shore at yokohama he was honorably discharged out there he reads japanese better than you read english and if it will help you at all he shall be here at your house at breakfast for as i spoke we stopped at corum's door ingham said corum if you were not a parson i should say you were romancing my child said i i sometimes write a parable for the atlantic but the words of my lips are verity as all those of the sandemanians go to bed do not even dream of the tagalian dialects be sure that the japanese interpreter will breakfast with you and the next time you are in a scrape send for the nearest minister 
George, tell your brother Ezra that Mr. Coram wishes him to breakfast here tomorrow morning at eight o'clock. Don't forget the number, Pemberton Square, you know. Yes, sir, said George. And Thomas Coram laughed, said Merry Christmas, and we parted. It was time we were all in bed, especially these boys. But glad enough am I, as I write these words, that the meeting of Coram set us back that dropped stitch in our night's journey. There was one more delay. We were sweeping by the old state house. The boys were singing again, Carol, Carol, Christians, as we dashed along the still streets. When I caught sight of Adam's Todd, and he recognized me, he had heard us singing when we were at the advertiser office. Todd is an old fellow apprentice of mine, and he is now, or rather was that night, chief pressman in the Argus office. I like the Argus people. It was there that I was South American editor, now many years ago, and they befriend me to this hour. Todd hailed me, and once more I stopped. What sent you out from your warm steam boiler? Steam boiler indeed, said Todd. Two rivets loose, steam room full of steam, police frightened, neighborhood in a row, and we had to put out the fire. She would have run a week without hurting a fly, only a little puff in the street sometimes. But there we are, Ingham. We shall lose the early mail as it stands. Seventy-eight tokens to be worked now. They always talked largely of their edition at the Argus, saw it with many eyes, perhaps. But this time, I am sure, Todd spoke true. I caught his idea at once. In younger and more muscular times, Todd and I had worked the Adams Press by that flywheel for full five minutes at a time as a test of our strength, and in my mind's eye I saw that he was printing his paper at this moment with relays of grinding stevedores. He said it was so. But think of it tonight, said he. It is Christmas Eve, and not an Irishman to be hired, though one paid him in ingots. Not a man can stand the grind ten minutes. I knew that very well from old experience, and I thanked him inwardly for not saying the damnation grind with Mantini. We cannot run the press half the time, said he, and the men we have are giving out now. We shall lose all our carrier delivery. Todd, said I, is this a night to be talking of ingots, or hiring, or losing, or gaining? When will you learn that love rules the court, the camp, and the Argus office? and I wrote on the back of a letter to Campbell, Come to the Argus office, number two, Dasset's Alley, with seven men not afraid to work, bade Howland take the boys to Campbell's house, walked down with Todd to his office, challenged him to take five minutes at the wheel in memory of old times, made the tired relays laugh when they saw us take hold, and then, when I had cooled off and put on my cardigan, met Campbell, with his seven sons of Anak, tumbling down the stairs, wondering what round of mercy the parson had found for them this time. I started home, knowing I should now have my Argus with my coffee. And so I walked home. Better so, perhaps, after all, than in the lively sleigh with the tinkling bells. It was a calm and silent night. Seven hundred years and fifty-three had Rome been growing up to might, and now was queen of land and sea. No sound was heard of clashing wars. Peace brooded o'er the hushed domain. Apollo, Pallas, Jove, and Mars held undisturbed their ancient reign in the solemn midnight centuries ago. What an eternity it seemed since I started with those children singing carols. Bethlehem, Nazareth, Calvary, Rome, Roman Senators, Tiberius, Paul, Nero, Clement, Ephraim, Ambrose, and all the singers, Vincent de Paul and all the loving wonder workers, Milton and Herbert and all the carol writers, Luther and Knox and all the prophets. What a world of people had been keeping Christmas with Sam Perry and Lycidas and Harry and me, and here were Yokohama and the Japanese, the Daily Argus and its ten million tokens and their readers, poor Fanny Woodhull and her sick mother there, keeping Christmas too. 
for a finite world these are a good many weights to be singing in one poor fellow's ears on one christmas tide twas in the calm and silent night the senator of haughty rome impatient urged his chariot's flight from lordly revel roiling home triumphal arches gleaming swell his breast with thoughts of boundless sway what wrecked the roman what befell a paltry province far away in the solemn midnight centuries ago within that province far away went plodding home a weary boor a streak of light before him lay fallen through a half-shut stable door across his path he passed for naught told him what was going on within how keen the stars his only thought the air how calm and cold and thin in the solemn midnight centuries ago streak of light is there a light in lycidas's room they not in bed that is making a night of it well there are few hours of the day or night when i have not been in lycidas's room so i let myself in by the night key he gave me ran up the stairs it is a horrid seven-story first-class lodging-house for my part i had as lief live in a steeple two flights i ran up two steps at a time i was younger then than i am now pushed open the door which was ajar and saw such a scene of confusion as i never saw in mary's overnice parlor before queer i remember the first thing that i saw was wrong was a great ball of white german worsted on the floor her basket was upset a great christmas tree lay across the rug quite too high for the room a large sharp-pointed spanish clasp knife was by it with which they had been lopping it there were two immense baskets of white papered presents both upset but what frightened me most was the center table three or four handkerchiefs on it towels napkins i know not what all brown and red and almost black with blood i turned heart-sick to look into the bedroom and i really had a sense of relief when i saw somebody bad enough it was however lycidas but just now so strong and well lay pale and exhausted on the bloody bed with the clothing removed from his right leg and thigh while over him bent mary and morton i learned afterwards that poor lycidas while trimming the christmas tree and talking merrily with mary and morton who by good luck had brought round his presents late and was staying to tie on glass balls and apples had given himself a deep and dangerous wound with the point of the unlucky knife and had lost a great deal of blood before the hemorrhage could be controlled just before i had entered the stick tourniquet which morton had improvised had slipped in poor mary's unpractised hand at the moment he was about to secure the bleeding artery and the blood followed in such a gush as compelled him to give his whole attention to stopping its flow he only knew my entrance by the ah mr ingham of the frightened irish girl who stood uselessly by the head of the bed oh fred said morton without looking up i am glad you are here and what can i do for you some whiskey first of all there are two bottles said mary who was holding the candle in the cupboard behind the dressing glass i took bridget with me struck a light in the dressing room how she blundered about the match and found the cupboard door locked the key doubtless in mary's pocket probably in the pocket of another dress i did not ask took my own bunch willed tremendously that my account-book drawer key should govern this lock and it did if it had not i should have put my fist through the panels bottle of bed-bug poison bottle marked bay rum another bottle with no mark two bottles of saratoga water set them all on the floor bridget a tall bottle of cologne bottle marked in manuscript what in the world is it bring that candle bridget eau distillée marron montreal what in the world did lycidas bring distilled water from montreal for and then morton's clear voice in the other room as quick as you can fred yes in one moment put all these on the floor bridget here they are at last bourbon whiskey corkscrew bridget indeed sir and where is it where i don't know 
run down as quick as you can and bring it his wife cannot leave him so bridget ran and the first i heard was the rattle as she pitched down the last six stairs of the first flight headlong let us hope she has not broken her leg i meanwhile am driving a silver pronged fork into the bourbon cork and the blade of my own penknife on the other side now fred from george within we all call morton george yes in one moment i replied penknife breaks off fork pulls right out two crumbs of cork come with it will that girl never come i turned round i found a goblet on the washstand i took lycidas's heavy clothes brush and knocked off the neck of the bottle did you ever do it reader with one of those pressed glass bottles they make now it smashed like a prince rupert's drop in my hand crumbled into seventy pieces a nasty smell of whiskey on the floor and i holding just the hard bottom of the thing with two large spikes running worthless up into the air but i seized the goblet poured into it what was left in the bottom and carried it into morton as quickly as i could he bade me give lycidas as much as he could swallow then showed me how to substitute my thumb for his and compress that great artery when he was satisfied that he could trust me he began his work again silently just speaking what must be said to that brave mary who seemed to have three hands because he needed them when all was secure he glanced at the ghastly white face with beads of perspiration on the forehead and upper lip laid his finger on the pulse and said we will have a little more whiskey no mary you are overdone already let fred bring it the truth was that poor mary was almost as white as lycidas she would not faint that was the only reason she did not and at the moment i wondered that she did not fall i believe george and i were both expecting it now the excitement was over he called her mary and me fred because we were all together every day of our lives so i retired for my whiskey again to attack that other bottle george whispered quickly as i went bring enough bring the bottle did he want the bottle corked would that celt ever come upstairs bridget you see was still nowhere i passed the bell rope as i went into the dressing room and rang as hard as i could ring i took the other bottle and bit steadily with my teeth at the cork only of course to wrench the end of it off george called me and i stepped back no said he bring your whiskey mary had just rolled gently back onto the floor i went again in despair but i heard bridget's step this time first flight first passage second flight second passage she ran in in triumph at length with a screwdriver no i whispered no the crooked thing you draw corks with and i showed her the bottle again find one somewhere and don't come back without it so she vanished for the second time frederick said morton i think he's never called me so before should i risk the clothes brush again i opened lycidas's own drawers papers boxes everything in order but not a sign of a tool frederick yes i said but why did i say yes father of mercy tell me what to do and my mazed eyes dim with tears did you ever shed tears from excitement fell on an old razor strop of those days of shaving made by c whittaker sheffield the sheffield stood in black letters out from the rest like a vision they make corkscrews in sheffield too if this whittaker had only made a corkscrew and what is a sheffield wimble hand in my pocket brown paper parcel where are you frederick yes i said for the last time twine off brown paper off and then i learned that the sheffield wimble was one of those things whose name you never heard before which people sell you in thames tunnel where a hoof cleaner a gimlet a screwdriver and a corkscrew fold up into one handle yes i said again pop said the cork bubble 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 said the whiskey bottle in one hand full tumbler in the other i walked in george poured half a tumbler full down lycidas's throat that time nor do i dare say how much he poured down afterwards i found that there was need of it from what he said of the pulse when it was all over 
I guess Mary had some, too. This was the turning point. He was exceedingly weak, and we sat by him in turn through the night, giving, at short intervals, stimulants and such food as he could swallow easily, for I remember Morton was very particular not to raise his head more than we could help. But there was no real danger after this. As we turned away from the house on Christmas morning, I to preach and he to visit his patients, he said to me, "'Did you make that whiskey?' "'No,' said I, "'but poor Dodd Dalton had to furnish the corkscrew.' And I went down to the chapel to preach. The sermon had been lying ready at home on my desk, and Polly had brought it round to me, for there had been no time for me to go from Lysidus's home to D Street and to return. There was the text, all as it was the day before. They helped every one his neighbor, and every one said to his brother, Be of good courage. So the carpenter encouraged the goldsmith, and he that smootheth with the hammer, him that smote with the anvil. And there were all the pat illustrations, as I had finished writing them yesterday, of the comfort Mary Magdalene gave Joanna the court lady, and the comfort the court lady gave Mary Magdalene, after the mediator of a new covenant had mediated between them. How Simon the Cyrenian, and Joseph of Arimathea, and the beggar Bartimaeus comforted each other, gave each other strength, common force, comfort, when the one life flowed in all their veins. How on board the ship the tent-maker proved to be captain, and the centurion learned his duty from his prisoner, and how they all came safe to shore, because the new life was there. But as I preached, I caught Fry's eye. Fry is always critical, and I said to myself, Fry would not take his illustrations from eighteen hundred years ago. And I saw dear old Dodd Dalton trying to keep awake, and Campbell hard asleep after trying, and Jane Masury looking round to see if her mother did not come in, and Ezra Shepherd looking not so much at me as at the window beside me, as if his thoughts were on the other side of the world. And I said to them all, Oh, if I could tell you, my friends, what every twelve hours of my life tells me, of the way in which woman helps woman and man helps man, when only the ice is broken, how we are all rich so soon as we find out that we are all brothers, and how we are all in want unless we can call at any moment for a brother's hand. Then I could make you understand something, in the lives you lead every day, of what the new covenant, the new commonwealth, the new kingdom is to be. But I did not dare tell Dodd Dalton what Campbell had been doing for Todd, nor did I dare tell Campbell by what unconscious arts old Dodd had been helping Lycidas. Perhaps the sermon would have been better if I had done so. But when we had our tree in the evening at home, I did tell all this story to Polly and the Bairns, and I gave Alice her measuring tape, precious with a spot of Lycidas's blood, and Bertha her Sheffield wimble. Papa, said old Clara, who is the next child, all the people gave presents, didn't they, as they did in the picture in your study? Yes, said I, though they did not all know they were giving them. Why do they not give such presents every day, said Clara? Oh, child, I said, it is only for thirty-six hours of the three hundred and sixty-five days that all people remember that they are all brothers and sisters, and those are the hours that we call, therefore, Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. And when they always remember it, said Bertha, it will be Christmas all the time. What fun! What fun, to be sure! But, Clara, what is in the picture? Why, an old woman has brought eggs to the baby in the manger, and an old man has brought a sheep. I suppose they all brought what they had. And I suppose those who came from Sharon brought roses, said Bertha. And Alice, who is eleven, and goes to the Lincoln School, and therefore knows everything, said, Yes, and the Damascus people brought Damascus wimbles. This is certain, said Polly, that nobody tried to give a straw. But the straw, if he gave it, carried a blessing. End of Christmas Waits in Boston by Edward Everett Hale Read by Maria Casper
The Errors of Santa Claus by Stephen Leacock, read in English. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Errors of Santa Claus it was christmas eve the browns who lived in the adjoining house had been dining with the joneses brown and jones were sitting over wine and walnuts at the table the others had gone upstairs what are you giving to your boy for christmas asked brown a train said jones new kind of thing automatic let's have a look at it said brown jones fetched a parcel from the sideboard and began unwrapping it ingenious thing isn't it he said goes on its own rails queer how kids love to play with trains isn't it yes assented brown how are the rails fixed wait i'll show you said jones just help me to shove these dinner things aside and roll back the cloth there see you lay the rails like that and fasten them at the end so oh yes i catch on makes a grade doesn't it just the thing to amuse a child isn't it i got willie a toy airplane i know they're great i got edwin one on his birthday but i thought i'd get him a train this time i told him santa claus was going to bring him something altogether new this time edwin of course believes in santa claus absolutely say look at this locomotive would you it has a spring coiled up inside the firebox wind her up said brown with great interest let's see her go all right said jones just pile up two or three plates or something to lean the end of the rails on there notice the way it buzzes before it starts isn't that a great thing for a kid eh? yes said brown and say see this little string to pull the whistle by gad it toots just like real now then brown jones went on you hitch on those cars and i'll start her i'll be engineer eh? half an hour later brown and jones were still playing trains on the dining-room table but their wives upstairs in the drawing-room hardly noticed their absence they were too much interested oh i think it's perfectly sweet said mrs brown just the loveliest doll i've seen in years I must get one like it for Olvina. Won't Clarice be perfectly enchanted? Yes, answered Mrs. Jones, and then she'll have all the fun of arranging the dresses. Children love that so much. Look, there are three little dresses with the doll. Aren't they cute? All cut out and ready to stitch together. Oh, how perfectly lovely, exclaimed Mrs. Brown. I think the mauve one would suit the doll best, don't you, with such golden hair? Only don't you think it would make it much nicer to turn back the collar so and to put a little band uh, so? What a good idea, said Mrs. Jones. Do let's try it. Just wait. I'll get a needle in a minute. I'll tell Clarice that Santa Claus sewed it himself. The child believes in Santa Claus absolutely and half an hour later mrs jones and mrs brown were so busy stitching doll's clothes that they could not hear the roaring of the little train up and down the dining table and had no idea what the four children were doing nor did the children miss their mothers dandy aren't they edwin jones was saying to little willie brown as they sat in edwin's bedroom a hundred in a box with cork tips and see an amber mouthpiece that fits into a little case at the side good present for dad huh fine said willie appreciatively i'm giving father cigars i know i thought of cigars too men always like cigars and cigarettes you can't go wrong on them say would you like to try one or two of these cigarettes we can take them from the bottom you'll like them they're russian way ahead of egyptian thanks answered willie i'd like one immensely i only started smoking last spring on my twelfth birthday i think a feller's a fool to begin smoking cigarettes too soon don't you it stunts him i waited till i was twelve me too said edwin as they lighted their cigarettes in fact i wouldn't buy them now if it weren't for dad i simply had to give him something from santa claus he believes in santa claus absolutely you know and while this was going on clarice was showing little olvina the absolutely lovely little bridge set that she got for her mother 
aren't these markers perfectly charming said olvina and don't you love this little dutch design or is it flemish darling dutch said clarice isn't it quaint and aren't these the dearest little things for putting the money in when you play i needn't have got them with it they'd have sold the rest separately but i think it's too utterly slow playing without money don't you oh abominable shuddered olvina but your mamma never plays for money does she mamma oh gracious no mamma's far too slow for that but i shall tell her that santa claus insisted on putting in the little money boxes i suppose she believes in santa claus just as my mamma does oh absolutely said clarice and added what if we play a little game with a double dummy the french way or norwegian scat if you like that only needs two all right agreed olvina and in a few minutes they were deep in a game of cards with a little pile of pocket money beside them about half an hour later all the members of the two families were again in the drawing-room but of course nobody said anything about the presents in any case they were all too busy looking at the beautiful big bible with maps in it that the joneses had brought to give to grandfather they all agreed that with the help of it grandfather could hunt up any place in palestine in a moment day or night but upstairs away upstairs in a sitting-room of his own grandfather jones was looking with an affectionate eye at the presence that stood beside him there was a beautiful whisky decanter with silver filigree outside and whisky inside for jones and for the little boy a big nickel-plated jew's harp later on far in the night the person or the influence or whatever it is called santa claus took all the presents and placed them in the people's stockings and being blind as he always has been he gave the wrong things to the wrong people in fact he gave them just as indicated above but the next day in the course of christmas morning the situation straightened itself out just as it always does indeed by ten o'clock brown and jones were playing with the train and mrs brown and mrs jones were making dolls clothes and the boys were smoking cigarettes and clarice and olvina were playing cards for their pocket money and upstairs away up grandfather was drinking whiskey and playing the jews harp and so christmas just as it always does turned out all right after all End of The Errors of Santa Claus by Stephen Leacock Read by David Wales Folklore of Christmas Tide Collected by A. F. Chamberlain Read in English This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org scottish folklore has it that christ was born at the hour of midnight on christmas eve and that the miracle of turning water into wine was performed by him at the same hour there is a belief current in some parts of germany that between eleven and twelve of the night before christmas water turns to wine in other districts as at bielefeld it is on christmas night that this change is thought to take place this hour is also auspicious for many actions and in some sections of germany it was thought that if one would go to the crossroads between eleven and twelve on christmas day and listen he would hear what most concerns him in the coming year another belief is that if one walks into the winter corn on holy christmas eve he will hear all that will happen in the village that year christmas eve or christmas is the time when the oracles of the folk are in the best working order especially the many processes by which maidens are wont to discover the colour of their lover's hair the beauty of his face and form his trade and occupation whether they shall marry or not and the like the same season is most auspicious for certain ceremonies and practices transferred to it from the heathen antiquity of the peasantry of europe in relation to agriculture and allied industries among those noted by grimm are the following 
on christmas eve thrash the garden with a flail with only your shirt on and the grass will grow well next year tie wet straw bands around the orchard trees on christmas eve and it will make them fruitful on christmas eve put a stone on every tree and they will bear the more beat the trees on christmas night and they will bear more fruit in herefordshire devonshire and cornwall in england the farmers and peasantry salute the apple trees on christmas eve and in sussex they used to wurzel that is wassail the apple trees and chant verses to them in somewhat of the primitive fashion some other curious items of christmas folklore are the following current chiefly in germany if after a christmas dinner you shake out the tablecloth over the bare ground under the open sky crumb wort will grow on the spot if on christmas day or christmas eve you hang a washclout on a hedge and then groom the horses with it they will grow fat as often as the cock crows on christmas eve the quarter of corn will be as dear if a dog howls the night before christmas it will go mad within the year if the light is let go out on christmas eve someone in the house will die when lights are brought in on christmas eve if anyone's shadow has no head he will die within a year if half a head in the second half year if a hoop comes off a cask on christmas eve someone in the house will die that year if on christmas eve you make a little heap of salt on the table and it melts overnight you will die the next year if in the morning it remain undiminished you will live if you wear something sewed with thread spun on christmas eve no vermin will stick to you if a shirt be spun woven and sewed by a pure chaste maiden on christmas day it will be proof against lead or steel if you are born at sermon time on christmas morning you can see spirits if you burn elder on christmas eve you will have revealed to you all the witches and sorcerers of the neighbourhood if you steal hay the night before christmas and give the cattle some they thrive and you are not caught in any future thefts if you steal anything at christmas without being caught you can steal safely for a year if you eat no beans on christmas eve you will become an ass if you eat a raw egg fasting on christmas morning you can carry heavy weights the crumbs saved up on three christmas eves are good to give us physic to one who is disappointed it is unlucky to carry anything forth from the house on christmas morning until something has been brought in it is unlucky to give a neighbour a live coal to kindle a fire with on christmas morning if the fire burns brightly on christmas morning it betokens prosperity during the year if it smoulders adversity these and many other practices ceremonies beliefs and superstitions which may be read in grimm gregor henderson de gubernatis ortwein tilter and others who have written of christmas show the importance attached in the folk mind to the time of the birth of christ and how around it as a centre have fixed themselves hundreds of the rites and solemnities of passing heathendom with its recognition of the kinship of all nature out of which grew astrology magic and other pseudo sciences end of folklore of christmas tide collected by a f chamberlain Il Natale by Alessandro Manzoni, read in Italian by Fabiola. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Il Natale Qual masso, 
che dal vertice di lunga erta montana, abbandonata all'impeto di rumorosa frana, per lo scheggiato calle, precipitando a valle, batte sul fondo e sta. Là dove cadde, immobile, giace in sua lenta mole, né per mutar di secoli, fia che riveda il sole della sua cima antica, se una virtù da amica in alto non trarrà. Tal si giaceva al misero, figliol del fallo primo, dal dì che un'ineffabile ira promessa al limo d'ogni malor gravollo, donde il superbo collo più non potea levar. Qual mai, trainati all'odio, qual era mai persona che al santo inaccessibile potesse dir perdona, far nuovo patto eterno, al vincitore inferno la preda sua strappar? Ecco c'è nato un pargolo, ci fu largito un figlio, le avverse forze tremano al muover del suo ciglio, all'uomo la mano e i porge, che si ravviva e sorge oltre l'antico onor. Dalle magioni etere sgorga una fonte e scende e nel borron de triboli vivida si stende, stillano mele i tronchi, dove copriano i bronchi, ivi germogli al fior. O oh figlio, o oh tu qui genera l'eterno, eterno seco, qual ti può dir de secoli, tu cominciasti meco, tu sei, del vasto empiro non ti comprende il giro, la tua parola il fe. E tu degnasti assumere questa creata argilla, qual merto suo, qual grazia a tanto nor sortilla? Se in suo consiglio ascoso vince il perdono, pietoso immensamente egli è. Oggi alienato, a defrata, vaticinato ostello, asceso un'alma vergine, la gloria di Israello, grave di tal portato, da cui promise nato d'onde era atteso uscì. La mira madre in poveri panni il figliol compose, e nell'umil presepio suavemente il pose, e l'adorò, beata, innanzi al Dio prostrata, che il puro sen l'aprì. L'angel del cielo, agli uomini nunzio di tanta sorte, non dei potenti volgisi alle vegliate porte, ma tra i pastor devoti, al duro mondo ignoti, subito in luce appar. E intorno a lui, per l'ampia notte, calati a stuolo, mille celesti strinsero il fiammeggiante volo, e accesi in dolce zelo, come si canta in cielo, a Dio gloria cantar. L'allegro inno seguirono, tornando al firmamento, tra le varcate nuvole, allontanossi, e lento, il suon sacrato ascese, finché più nulla intese, la compagnia fedel. Senza indugiar, cercarono l'albergo poveretto, quei fortunati, e videro, siccome a lor fu detto, videro in pagna avvolto, in un presepe accolto, vagire il re del ciel. Dormi, o oh fanciul, non piangere, dormi, o oh fanciul celeste, sovra il tuo capo stridere, non osi in le tempeste. Use sull'empia terra, come cavalli in guerra, correr davanti a te. Dormi, o oh celeste, i popoli, chi nato sia non sanno, ma il dì verrà che nobile, retaggio tuo saranno. Che in quell'umile riposo, che nella polve ascoso, conosceranno il re. End of Il Natale by Alessandro Manzoni Is There a Santa Claus? by F. P. Church Read in English This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Is There a Santa Claus? The following reprinted from the editorial page of the New York Sun was written by the late Mr. Frank P. Church. We take pleasure in answering at once 
and thus prominently the communication below expressing at the same time our great gratification that its faithful author is numbered among the friends of the sun dear editor i am eight years old some of my little friends say there is no santa claus papa says if you see it in the sun it's so please tell me the truth is there a santa claus virginia o'hanlon virginia your little friends are wrong they have been affected by the skepticism of a skeptical age they do not believe except they see they think that nothing can be which is not comprehensible by their little minds all minds virginia whether they be men's or children's are little in this great universe of ours man is a mere insect an ant in his intellect as compared with the boundless world about him as measured by the intelligence capable of grasping the whole of truth and knowledge yes virginia there is a santa claus he exists as certainly as love and generosity and devotion exist and you know that they abound and give to you your life its highest beauty and joy alas how dreary would be the world if there were no santa claus it would be as dreary as if there were no virginias there would be no childlike faith then no poetry no romance to make tolerable this existence we should have no enjoyment except in sense and sight the eternal light with which childhood fills the world would be extinguished not to believe in santa claus you might as well not believe in fairies you might get your papa to hire men to watch in all the chimneys on christmas eve to catch santa claus but even if they did not see santa claus coming down what would that prove nobody sees santa claus but that is no sign that there is no santa claus the most real things in the world are those that neither children nor men can see did you ever see fairies dancing on the lawn of course not but that's no proof that they are not there nobody can conceive or imagine all the wonders that are unseen and unseeable in the world you may tear apart the baby's rattle and see what makes the noise inside but there is a veil covering the unseen world which not the strongest man nor even the united strength of all the strongest men that ever lived could tear apart only faith fancy poetry love romance can push aside that curtain and view and picture the supernatural beauty and glory beyond is it all real ah oh, virginia in all this world there is nothing else real and abiding no santa claus thank god he lives and he lives forever a thousand years from now virginia nay ten times ten thousand years from now he will continue to make glad the heart of childhood end of is there a santa claus by f p church read by april six zero nine zero california united states of america king arthur's was hail by robert stephen hawker read in english this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Was hail for night and dame, O merry be their dole! Drink hail, in Jesus' name we fill the tawny bowl, But cover down the curving crest, Mould of the Orient Lady's breast. Was hail, yet lift no lid, Drain ye the reeds for wine, Drink hail, the milk was hid that soothed that babe divine. Hushed, as his hollow channel flows, he drew the balsam from the rose. Was hail, thus glowed the breast where a god yearned to cling. Drink hail, so Jesu pressed life from its mystic spring. Then hush and bend in reverent sign, and breathe the thrilling reeds for wine was hail in shadowy scene lo christmas children we drink hail behold we lean at a far mother's knee to dream that thus her bosom smiled and learn the lip of bethlehem's child end of king arthur's was hail by robert stephen hawker read by thomas peter The Legend of King Wenceslas by John Mason Neal, read in English. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Good King Wenceslas looked out on the feast of St. Stephen, when the snow lay round about, deep and crisp and even. King Wenceslas sat in his palace. 
He had been watching from the narrow window of the turret chamber where he was, the sunset, as its glory hung for a moment in the western clouds, and then died away over the blue hills. Calm and cold was the brightness. A freezing haze came over the face of the land. The moon brightened toward the southwest, and the leafless trees in the castle gardens and the quaint turret and spires of the castle itself threw clear dark shadows on the unspotted snow. Still the king looked out upon the scene before him. The ground sloped down from the castle towards the forest. Here and there on the side of the hill a few bushes grey with moss broke the unburied sheet of white. And as the king turned his eye in that direction, a poor man came up to these bushes and pulled something from them. "'Come hither, page,' called the king. One of the servants of the palace entered in answer to the king's call. "'Come, my good Otto, come stand by me. Do you see yonder poor man on the hillside? Step down to him and learn who he is and where he dwells and what he is doing. Bring me word at once.' Otto went forth on his errand while the good king watched him go down the hill. Meanwhile the frost grew more and more intense, and an east wind blew from the black mountains. The snow became more crisp, and the air more clear. In a few moments the messenger was back. "'Well, who is he?' "'Sire,' said Otto, "'it is Rudolf the swineherd, he that lives down by the Brunweiss. Fire he has none, nor food, and he was gathering a few sticks where he might find them, lest, as he says, all his family perish with the cold. It is a most bitter night, sire.' "'This should have been better looked to,' said the king. "'A grievous fault it is that it has not been done. "'But it shall be amended now. "'Go to the Ewery, Otto, and fetch some provisions of the best. "'Bring me flesh and bring me wine. "'Bring me pine logs hither. "'Thou and I will see him dine when we bear them thither.' "'Is your majesty going forth?' asked Otto in surprise. "'Yes, to the Brunweiss, and you shall go with me. "'When you have everything ready, meet me at the woodstacks by the little chapel. "'Come, be speedy.' "'I pray you, sire, do not venture out yourself. "'Let some of the men-at-arms go forth. "'It is a freezing wind, and the place is a good league hence.' "'Nevertheless I go,' said the king. "'Come with me if you will, Otto. "'If not, stay. "'I can carry the food myself.' "'God forbid, sire, that I should let you go alone, "'but I pray you be persuaded.' "'Not in this,' said King Wenceslas. "'Meet me, then, where I said, "'and not a word to any one besides.' "'The noblemen of the court were in the palace hall, "'where a mighty fire went roaring up the chimney, "'and the shadows played and danced "'on the steep sides of the dark roof. "'Gaily they laughed and lightly they talked, "'and as they threw fresh logs into the great chimney place, one said to another that so bitter a wind had never before been known in the land. But in the midst of that freezing night the king went forth. Page and monarch, forth they went, forth they went together, through the rude wind's wild lament and the bitter weather. The king had put on no extra clothing to shelter himself from the nipping air, for he would feel with the poor that he might feel for them. On his shoulders he bore a heap of logs for the swineherd's fire. He stepped briskly on while Otto followed with the provisions. He had imitated his master and had gone out in his common garments. On the two trudged together, over the crisp snow, across fields, by lanes where the hedge-trees were heavy with their white burden, past the pool, over the stile where the rime clustered thick by the wood, and on out upon the moor where the snow lay yet more unbroken, and where the wind seemed to nip one's very heart. Still King Wenceslas went on, and still Otto followed. The king thought it but little to go forth into the frost and snow, remembering him who came into the cold night of this world of ours. He disdained not, a king, to go to the beggar. For had not the king of kings visited slaves? He grudged not, a king, to carry logs on his shoulders, for had not the king of kings borne heavier burdens for his sake? But at each step Otto's courage and zeal failed. He tried to hold out with a good heart, for very shame he did not wish to do less than his master. How could he turn back while the king held on his way? 
but when they came forth on the white, bleak moor he cried out with a faint heart, "'My liege, I cannot go on. The wind freezes my very blood. Pray you, let us return.' "'Seems it so much?' asked the king. "'Follow me on still. Only tread in my footsteps, and you will proceed more easily.' The servant knew that his master spoke not at random. He carefully looked for the footsteps of the king. He set his own feet in the print of his master's. In the master's steps he trod, where the snow lay dinted. Heat was in the very sod, which the saint had printed. And so great was the fire of love that kindled in the heart of the king, that as the servant trod in his steps, he gained life and heat. Otto felt not the wind, he heeded not the frost, for the master's footprints glowed as with holy fire, and zealously he followed the king on his errand of mercy. End of The Legend of King Wenceslas by John Mason Neal Read by Sarah Jennings The Legend of the Christmas Tree, Chapter Number 8 of Christmas Stories and Legends. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April 6090, California, United States of America. Christmas Stories and Legends, compiled by Phoebe A. Curtis. Chapter Number 8, The Legend of the Christmas Tree, by Lucy Wheelock. Two little children were sitting by the fire, one cold winter's night. All at once they heard a timid knock at the door, and one ran to open it. There, outside in the cold and the darkness, stood a child with no shoes upon his feet, and clad in thin, ragged garments. He was shivering with cold, and he asked to come in and warm himself. "'Yes, come,' cried both the children. "'You shall have our place by the fire. Come in.' They drew the little stranger to their warm seat, and shared their supper with him, and gave him their bed while they slept on a hard bench. In the night they were awakened by strains of sweet music, and looking out, they saw a band of children in shining garments approaching the house. They were playing on golden harps, and the air was full of melody. Suddenly the stranger child stood before them, no longer cold and ragged, but clad in silvery light. His soft voice said, I was cold and you took me in. I was hungry and you fed me. I was tired and you gave me your bed. I am the Christ child, wandering through the world to bring peace and happiness to all good children. As you have given to me, so may this tree every year give rich fruit to you. So saying, he broke a branch from the fir tree that grew near the door, and he planted it in the ground and disappeared. But the branch grew into a great tree, and every year it bore wonderful golden fruit for the kind children. From For the Children's Hour by Bailey and Lewis Used by permission of the authors and the publishers, Milton Bradley Company End of Chapter 8 The Legend of the Christmas Tree November 21st, 2016. Conte de Noël par Josette by Josephine Marchand d'Endurant. Read in French. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Le jour de l'an Pour les sept petites filles de M. L. O. David, député Assurement, tous les petits-enfants connaissent cette fête. Elle est belle, elle est radieuse pour le plus grand nombre. Elle ramène l'excellent vieux Santa Claus avec des trésors fabuleux entassés dans ses poches immenses et inépuisables. Quelques-uns, hélas, ne connaissent de ce jour que les privations plus cruelles par leur contraste avec la joie de tout le monde. Ces malheureux petits pauvres que Santa Claus ne connaît pas, qui ne trouvent jamais, jamais rien dans leurs souliers, c'est aux enfants heureux de les consoler, de se constituer leur providence visible. Le petit Jésus, lui qui n'oublie personne, voit leurs larmes, il les recueille toutes, il les change en des perles magnifiques, dont ils forment des couronnes plus belles que celles des anges, car les anges qui ne pleurent jamais n'ont pas de perles à leur couronne. Puis quand ses amis dorment, il les vient chercher et les amène avec lui au ciel 
pour leur montrer ces précieux joyeux et les ailes faites de la gaze des plus blancs nuages qu'ils gardent pour eux. Parmi les petites filles qui attendaient avec anxiété la joyeuse fête de l'enfance, il en était sept qui, fort probablement, auraient été forcées de renoncer aux étincelantes couronnes du petit Jésus, lesquelles ne se gagnent absolument qu'au prix des soupirs et des peines, ne c'étaient les pleurs qui leur faisaient verser parfois la compassion. Et cela valent presque, aux yeux de Dieu, les pleurs de la misère. Heureusement, les nobles émotions de leurs âmes sensibles au malheur achetaient pour elles ces célestes récompenses. Car des larmes d'honneur, c'était un article rare sous leur toit. Or, le cas de pitié, elles n'en faisaient usage que juste ce qu'il faut pour baigner le sourire en vue d'obtenir les objets de leurs vœux. On sait que c'est un principe de diplomatie qui accouche cette petite engeance qu'un attrait irrésistible a ajouté à sa requête et c'est lui d'un regard suppliant à travers des pleurs. Et c'est d'excellente politique. Le moyen de résister, je vous le demande, à tant de beaux yeux émus qui prient avec une si gentille ferveur. Le bon Dieu ne l'a pas encore trouvé, lui qui est bien plus fort que les hommes. Mais en ce grand jour du jour de l'an, il n'était pas besoin de ruse ni de stratagème pour être heureux. Mon Dieu, que des trésors enfuis dans ces petits bas longs comme rien, mais si précieux pourtant, avec leur riche et abondante cargaison. Quel bon génie avait donc pu deviner les désirs secrets de chacune pour déposer mystérieusement à son chevet pendant la nuit l'objet si ardemment souhaité Il n'y avait qu'un bon Jésus pour réaliser des rêves si follement ambitieux, pour verser si généreusement autant des merveilles entre leurs petites mains. Les jolies fillettes adoraient, je vous le jure, ce cher bienfaiteur, ce prodigue ami des enfants sages et bons comme elles, elles aimaient aussi de tout leur cœur leurs parents. Une pensée leur vint donc tout à coup, qui faillit compromettre l'extrême félicité dont elles jouissaient. Pourquoi le cher papa, pourquoi la belle maman, ne recevaient-ils pas eux aussi des cadeaux du ciel Leurs bons petits cœurs se gonflèrent à cette réflexion et l'attrait de toutes les choses prodigieuses est allé devant elle disparut soudain. La plus jeune des bébés, dont le bonheur s'était incarné sous la forme de mille animaux mignons réunis en une arche de Noé lilliputienne, laisse là son vaste troupeau, gisant par terre, dans une attitude de désorganisation et d'inquiétude, comme s'il n'avait jamais été sauvé du déluge et que tout était à recommencer. Par le plus bienvenu des hasards, entrèrent à ce moment dans la chambre qui renfermait tant de désespoir les heureux parents de cette intéressante famille. La tristesse se fondit comme par enchantement sous une pluie des baisers. « Nous en avons eu à profusion des présents du ciel », leur dit en pleurant de bonheur leur mère. « Les joyeux inestimables, les trésors que le bon Dieu nous a donnés, mes anges ». C'est vous. End of Conte de Noël par Josette by Joséphine Marchand d'Endurant. Little Piccola by Nora A. Smith. Read in English. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Piccola lived in Italy, where the oranges grow and where all the year the sun shines warm and bright. I suppose you think Piccola a very strange name for a little girl, but in her country it was not strange at all, and her mother thought it the sweetest name a little girl ever had. Piccola had no kind father, no big brother or sister, and no sweet baby to play with and love. She and her mother lived all alone in an old stone house that looked on a dark, narrow street. They were very poor, and the mother was away from home almost every day, washing clothes and scrubbing floors, 
and working hard to earn money for her little girl and herself. So you see, Picola was alone a great deal of the time, and if she had not been a very happy, contented little child, I hardly know what she would have done. She had no playthings except a heap of stones in the back yard that she used for building houses, and a very old, very ragged doll that her mother had found in the street one day. But there was a small round hole in the stone wall at the back of her yard, and her greatest pleasure was to look through that into her neighbor's garden. When she stood on a stone and put her eyes close to the hole, she could see the green grass in the garden and smell the sweet flowers and even hear the water splashing into the fountain. She had never seen anyone walking in the garden, for it belonged to an old gentleman who did not care about grass and flowers. One day, in the autumn, her mother told her that the old gentleman had gone away, and had rented his house to a family of little American children, who had come with their sick mother to spend the winter in Italy. After this, Piccola was never lonely, for all day long the children ran and played and danced and sang in the garden. It was several weeks before they saw her at all, and I am not sure they ever would have done so, but one day the kitten ran away, and in chasing her they came close to the wall and saw Piccola's black eyes looking through the hole in the stones. They were a little frightened at first, and did not speak to her, but the next day she was there again, and Rose, the oldest girl, went up to the wall and talked to her a little while. When the children found that she had no one to play with and was very lonely, they talked to her every day, and often brought her fruits and candies, and passed them through the hole in the wall. One day they even pushed the kitten through, but the hole was hardly large enough for her, and she mewed and scratched and was very much frightened. After that the little boy said he would ask his father if the hole might not be made larger, and then... Piccola could come in and play with them. The father had found out that Piccola's mother was a good woman, and that the little girl herself was sweet and kind, so that he was very glad to have some of the stones broken away and an opening made for Piccola to come in. How excited she was, and how glad the children were when she first stepped into the garden. She wore her best dress, a long, bright-colored woolen skirt and a white waist. Round her neck was a string of beads, and on her feet were little wooden sandals. It would seem very strange to us, would it not, to wear wooden shoes? But Piccola and her mother had never worn anything else, and never had any money to buy stockings. Piccola almost always ran about barefooted, like the kittens and the chickens and the little ducks. What a good time they had that day, and how glad Piccola's mother was that her little girl could have such a pleasant, safe place to play in while she was away at work. By and by December came, and the little Americans began to talk about Christmas. One day, when Piccola's curly head and bright eyes came peeping through the hole in the wall, and they ran to her and helped her in, and as they did so, they all asked her at once what she thought she would have for a Christmas present. A Christmas present? said Piccola. Why, what is that? All the children looked surprised at this, and Rose said rather gravely, Dear Piccola, don't you know what Christmas is? Oh, yes. Piccola knew it was the happy day when the baby Christ was born, and she had been to church on that day and heard the beautiful singing, and had seen the picture of the babe lying in the manger, with cattle and sheep sleeping round about. Oh, yes, she knew all that very well. But what was a Christmas present? Then the children began to laugh and to answer her all together. There was such a clatter of tongues that she could hear only a few words now and then, such as chimney, Santa Claus, stockings, reindeer, Christmas Eve, 
candies and toys. Piccola put her hands over her ears and said, Oh, I can't understand one word. You tell me, Rose. Then Rose told her all about jolly Santa Claus, with his red cheeks and white beard and fur coat, and about his reindeer and sleigh full of toys. Every Christmas Eve, said Rose, he comes down the chimney and fills the stockings of all the good children. So, Piccola, you hang up your stocking, and who knows what a beautiful Christmas present you will find when morning comes. Of course, Piccola thought this was a delightful plan and was very pleased to hear about it. Then all the children told her of every Christmas Eve they could remember and of the presents they had had, so that she went home thinking of nothing but dolls and hoops and balls and ribbons and marbles and wagons and kites. She told her mother about Santa Claus, and her mother seemed to think that perhaps he did not know that there was any little girl in that house, and very likely he would not come at all. But Piccola felt very sure Santa Claus would remember her, for her little friends had promised to send a letter up the chimney to remind him. Christmas Eve came at last. Piccola's mother hurried home from her work. They had their little supper of soup and bread, and soon it was bedtime. Time to get ready for Santa Claus. But, oh, Piccola remembered then for the first time that the children had told her she must hang up her stocking, and she hadn't any, and neither had her mother. How sad, how sad it was! Now Santa Claus would come, and perhaps be angry because he couldn't find any place to put the present. The poor little girl stood by the fireplace, and the big tears began to run down her cheeks. Just then her mother called to her, Hurry, Piccola, come to bed. What should she do? But she stopped crying and tried to think, and in a moment she remembered her wooden shoes and ran off to get one of them. She put it close to the chimney and said to herself, Surely Santa Claus will know what it's there for. He will know I haven't any stockings, so I gave him the shoe instead. Then she went off happily to her bed, and was asleep almost as soon as she had nestled close to her mother's side. The sun had only just begun to shine, next morning when Piccola awoke. With one jump she was out on the floor and running toward the chimney. The wooden shoe was lying where she had left it, but you could never, never guess what was in it. Piccola had not meant to wake her mother, but this surprise was more than any little girl could bear and yet be quiet. So she danced to the bed with the shoe in her hand, calling, Mother! Mother! Look! Look! See the present Santa Claus brought me! Her mother raised her head and looked into the shoe. Why, Piccola, she said, a little chimney swallow nestling in your shoe. What a good Santa Claus to bring you a bird! Good Santa Claus, dear Santa Claus, cried Piccola, and she kissed her mother and kissed the bird and kissed the shoe and even threw kisses up the chimney. She was so happy. When the birdling was taken out of the shoe, they found that he did not try to fly, only to hop around the room, and as they looked closer, they could see that one of his wings was hurt a little. But the mother bound it up carefully so that it did not seem to pain him, and he was so gentle that he took a drink of water from a cup and even ate crumbs and seeds out of Piccola's hands. She was a proud little girl when she took her Christmas present to show the children in the garden. They had had a great many gifts, dolls that could say Mama, bright picture books, trains of cars, toy pianos, but not one of them play things was alive, like Piccola's birdling. They were as pleased as she, and Rose hunted about the house until she found a large wicker cage that belonged to a blackbird she once had. She gave the cage to Piccola, and the swallow seemed to make himself quite at home in it at once, 
and sat on the perch winking his bright eyes at the children. Rose had saved a bag of candies for Piccola, and when she went home at last with the cage and her dear swallow safely inside it, I am sure there was not a happier little girl in the whole country of Italy. End of Little Piccola by Nora A. Smith Read by Leanne Vangelo di Luca, capitolo secondo, versetti dall'1 al 20, letto in italiano da Fabiola. Questa è una registrazione LibriVox. Tutte le registrazioni LibriVox sono di dominio pubblico. Per ulteriori informazioni, o per diventare volontario, visitate il sito LibriVox.org. Natività di Gesù Cristo Or, in quei dì, avvenne che un decreto uscì da parte di Cesare Augusto, che tutto il mondo fosse rassegnato. Questa rassegna fu la prima che fu fatta sotto Quirinio, governatore della Siria, e tutti andavano per essere rassegnati, ciascuno nella sua città. Ora anche Giuseppe salì di Galilea, della città di Nazareth, nella Giudea, nella città di Davide, che si chiama Betlem, perciò che egli era della casa, e nazione di Davide. Per essere rassegnato con Maria, che era la moglie che gli era stata sposata, la quale era gravida. Ora avvenne che, mentre eran quivi, il termine nel quale la doveva partorire si compie, ed ella partorì il suo figliuolo primogenito, e lo fasciò, e lo pose a giacere nella mangiatoia, perciò che non vi era luogo per loro nell'albergo. I pastori di Betlem Or nella medesima contrada vi erano dei pastori, i quali dimoravano fuori ai campi, facendo le guardie della notte intorno alla loro greggia. Ed ecco un angelo del Signore si presentò a loro, e la gloria del Signore risplendè intorno a loro, ed essi temettero di gran timore. Ma l'angelo disse loro, non temiate, perciò che io vi annunzio una grande allegrezza che tutto il popolo avrà, cioè che oggi nella città di Davide vi è nato il Salvatore, che è Cristo, il Signore. E questo ve ne sarà il segno. Voi troverete il fanciullino fasciato, coricato nella mangiatoia, e in quello stante vi fu con l'angelo una moltitudine dell'esercito celeste, lodando il Dio e dicendo, Gloria a Dio, nei luoghi altissimi, pace in terra, benivoglienza in verso gli uomini. E avvenne che quando gli angeli se ne furono andati da loro al cielo, quei pastori dissero fra loro, Or passiamo fino in Betlem e veggiamo questa cosa che è avvenuta, la quale il Signore ci ha fatta sapere. E vennero in fretta e trovarono Maria e Giuseppe e il fanciullino che giaceva nella mangiatoia, e vedutolo divulgarono ciò che era loro stato detto di quel piccolo fanciullo, e tutti coloro che li udirono si meravigliarono delle cose che erano loro dette da pastori. E Maria conservava in sé tutte queste parole, conferendoli insieme nel cuor suo, e i pastori se ne ritornarono, glorificando e lodando il Dio di tutte le cose che avevano udite e vedute, secondo che era loro stato parlato. Fine del Vangelo di Luca, capitolo secondo, versetti dall'1 al 20. Chapter 1 of Cote Rongopaya Matteo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Travis Hammond in beautiful Reno, Nevada. Cote Rongopaya Matteo. Upoko Tahi. Nga Tupuna ite Tahi Kia Hopa. Takao ma wariu, haputanga o meri, rua takao, tate anahera. Kote puka puka o te whakatupuranga o ihu karaiti, tama a rawiri, tama a apurahama. Fano ake te aparahama ko ihaka, fano ake ta ihaka ko hakopa. Fano ake te hakopa ko hurarutao ko ona tuakana. Ko ona teina, fano ake te hura rawa, ko tamara, 
ko parete rawa ko hara fanoa ke te parete ko heteromo fanoa ke ta heteromo ko arame fanoa ke te arame ko aminarapa fanoa ke te aminarapa ko nohona fanoa ke te nohona ko haramono fanoa ke te haramono rawa ko rahapa ko puaha fanoa ke te puaha rawa ko rutu ko apure fanoa ke te apure ko hehe fanoa ke te hehe ko rawirikingi fanoa ke ta rawirikingi rawa ko te wahine a uria ko hormona fanoa ke te hormona ko ropuama fanoa ke te ropuana ko apia fanoa ke te apia ko aha fanoa ke te aha ko ihopata fanoa ke te ihopata ko iorama fanoa ke te iorama ko ohiaha fanoa ke te ohiaha ko iotama fanoa ke te iotama ko ahaha fanoa ke te ahaha ko etakiaha fanoa ke te etakiaha ko manahe fanoa ke te manahe ko amono fanoa ke te amono ko hohaya fanoa ke te hohaya ko heko niaha le tau ko ano teina i te whakakenga ki papurona ai muri i te whakakenga atu ki a papurona ka whanau ka te heko niaha ko haratira fanoa ke te haratira ko toropera fanoa ke te toropapere ko apiuru fanoa ke te apiuru ko eriakimi fanoa ke te eriakimi ko atoro fanoa ke te atoro ko haroko fanoa ke te haroko ko akimi fanoa ke te akimi ko ai eriuru fanoa ke te eriuru ko eratara fanoa ke te eratara ko matana fanoa ke te matana ko hakopa fanoa ke te hakopa ko hohepa ko te tahu o meri fanoa ke te meri ko ihu ko tona ngoa ne ko te karaiti he o e nga whakatupuranga katoa o aparahama taia noa ki a rawiri te kao mā whā ngā whakatupuranga o rawiri taia noa ki te whakakenga ki papurona te kao mā whā ngā whakatupuranga ano te whakakenga ki papurona taia noa ki a te karaiti te kao mā whā ngā whakatupuranga Nā ko te whanautanga te nei o ihu karaiti, he mea taumoa, a e a meri tōna whaia mā hohepa ai te mea ki ana rawa i te i tata noa ki a rutau, ki a rawa kā ki te e kua hapu ia i te wairua tapu. O tira he tangata tika a hohepa tōna tahu o a ka haure ona ngā kao ki a whakakitea nui tia i a ka mea, ki a whakarerea puku tia. O tia i a i a, a hurihuri ana i a nei mea, nā ka puta moe moe a, mā e te tahi ana hera a te ariki ki a i a ka mea e hohepa e te tama a rewiri kaua e hopohopo ki i te tango. I a meri i taua wahine, nā te wairua tapu hoki tōna hapu, ae whanau ia, he tama me hua hoki e koe tana e ngoa ko ihu, nō te mea mana e whakaura tōna iwi i o rtau hara. Nā ka oti i tanei katoa, ka tahe ka rite tā te ariki i koreretia e te porpiti. I me ai ia. Nā ka hapu te wahina, ka whana hoki he tama, a ka huaina e ratau tōna ngoa ko Emanuera. Ko tōna whakamauritanga tane, kei a tātau te tua.
a te aranga ake o hohepa i te moe. Ka mea tia e ia tā te anahera a te riki i whakahau ai ki a ia, a tango ana ia i tāna wahine. A ke hai i mohio ki a ia whanono a tāna tama, ma tau mua a huaina ana e ia tono ngō ko iho. End of chapter 1 Chapter 2 of Ko Te Rongopai Amatiu, King James Version Translated by Elizabeth Fairborn Collinson Upokorua, Ngamaki, Takao Ma Ono, Patunga o Nga Tamariki, Takao Ma Iwa, Hokinga o Hohepa Ma Ki Nahaereta Nai te mea kua whanau, nei a ihu ki Peterehema o Huria. E ngara o kingi Herora, naka hare mai e tahi, maki i te rafiti ki Hiruharama. Ka mea kei he ata nei kua whanau, nei he kingi mo ngā hurai? I kite hoki matau i tono fetu i te rafiti, a ka tai mai nei ki te kore piko ki a ia. A te rongonga o kingi Herora ka o herere, rutao ko hiru harama katoa. Nā whakamenea katoa tia, ana e ia ngā ta hunganui, me ngā karaipi o te iwi, a ke ui atu ki a rutao ki te wahi e whanau ai a te karaiti. Ka mea rutao ki a ia, ki petara hema o huria, Ko tāte porupiti hoki tanei i tuituhi, ai, a ko koe e petere hema whenua o hurua, e hara rawa, e te iti rawa i roto i ngā kawana o hura, e puta mai hoki e koe he kowana, he hapara mō tōku iwi mō i haraira. Nā ka oti ngā maki te karanga puku, e herora ka nia meria tia rutao ki te wā i puta mai ai te whetu. A onga ana rutao e ia ki Peterahema, i mea ia haere rapua meritia te tamaiti, a ka kitea, ka whakahoki i te korero ki a ao, ki a haere ai hoki a hao ki te koropiko ki a ia. Nā ka rongo mo rutao i tā te kingi ka haere, nā ko te whetu, i kite ai rutao i te rewhiti, e haere ana i mua i a rutao a tā noa, tua noa ki rungo ake i te takotoronga o te tamaiti, a te rutao ki tenga i te whetu, nā ko te tino, haringa i hari ai, a ka tae ki roto ki te whare, ka kite i te tamaiti rawa o te tino. Ko tōna whaia, ko meri, nā tā papa ana rutao koropiko ana ki a ia, ano ka mewhera o rutao taonga ka huatu e tahi mea ki a ia. He kaura, he parakihe, he maira. Ai whakatūpa tōria, rutao e te atua, he mea moe moea ki a kaua e hoki ki a herora nā. Hāre āna ki tō rutao ka inga he ārake, a ka riro rutao, nā ka puta mue moea te tahi ana hera a te ariki ki a hohepa. Ka mea e āra, tangohia te tamaiti, rāua ko tōna whaia, e rere, ki i hipa a hei reira koe ki a korero rā ano a hao ki a koe, mi a ke hoki rāpu a herora i tōna. Te tamaiti ki a whakangaro mia, nā ka āra ia ka mau ki te tamaiti rawa, ko tōna whaia i te pō. A haere ana ki ihipa, a noho ana i reira, mā te noa a herora, nā ka rite te tā te ariki i koreritia e te porupiti. I mea ai ia, he mea karanga nā ku tāku tamaiti i ihipa, a te kitenga o hukai. Herura ka oti ia te tinihanga e ngā maki, rahi rawa tonu riri ka tonu tangata, a patua iho ngā tamariki katoa, ngā mea e rua nei, 
ora to tau me o muri iho i petara hema menga wahi kato oreira he mea fakarite ki te taima i uia maria tia e ia ki nga maki katahe ka rite ta hera mai a parapiti i korero ai i mea ai i rangona he reo ki rama he uhunga he tangi he aue nui ko rahera e tangi ana ki ana tamariki a ka hae i pae kia whaka maria tia no te mea kua ka hauri ri tau ano ka mate a herora na ka puta moe moea te ana hera a te ariki ki a hohepa ki ihipa ka mea Ara ake tangohia te tamaiti rawa ko tona faya a haere ki te fenua o iharaira kua mate hoki te hunga i fai kia patua te tamaiti a tono aranga ake ka mau ki te tamaiti rawa ko tona faya ka haere ki te fenua o iharaira o tira ka rongo ia ko ara ke rauha te kingi o huria i muri i tōna matua ia. A herora ka wehi ki te haere ki reira. O tia i whakamahara tia. Ia e te atua he mea moe moea e haere ana ki ngā wahi o kariri. A ka tae ka noho ki te tahipa ko nga haareta te ingoa i rite ae te ngā porapiti i mea ae. Me hua ia hek tangata no nahareta. End of chapter 2 Recording by Travis Hammond Vangelo di Matteo, capitolo primo, versetti dal 18 al 25, capitolo secondo, versetti dall'1 al 12, letto in italiano da Fabiola. Questa è una registrazione LibriVox. Tutte le registrazioni LibriVox sono di dominio pubblico, per ulteriori informazioni e per diventare volontario, visita il sito LibriVox.org. Natività di Gesù Cristo Or, la Natività di Gesù Cristo avvenne in questo modo. Maria, sua madre, essendo stata sposata a Giuseppe, avanti che fossero venuti a stare insieme, si trovò gravida, il che era dello Spirito Santo, e Giuseppe, suo marito, Essendo uomo giusto e non volendola pubblicamente infamare, voleva occultamente lasciarla. Ma, avendo queste cose nell'animo, ecco un angelo del Signore gli apparve in sogno, dicendo, Giuseppe, figliuol di Davide, non temere di ricevere Maria, tua moglie. Perciò che, ciò che in essa è generato, è dello Spirito Santo, ed ella partorirà un figliuolo e tu gli porrai nome Gesù, perciò che egli salverà il suo popolo da loro peccati. Or tutto ciò avvenne, a ciò che si adempiesse quello che era stato detto dal Signore, per lo profeta, dicendo, Ecco, la Vergine sarà gravida, e partorirà un figliuolo, il qual sarà chiamato Emanuele, il che, interpretato, vuol dire, Dio con noi. E Giuseppe, destatosi dal sonno, Fece secondo che l'angelo del Signore gli aveva comandato, e ricevette la sua moglie. Ma egli non la conobbe, finché ebbe partorito il suo figliuol primogenito, ed ella gli pose nome Gesù. I Magi d'Oriente Ora, essendo Gesù nato in Betlem di Giudea, a Di del re Erode, ecco dei Magi d'Oriente arrivarono in Gerusalemme, dicendo, Dov'è il re dei Giudei? Che è nato? Con ciò sa che noi abbiamo veduta la sua stella in Oriente, e siamo venuti per adorarlo. E il re Erode, udito questo, fu turbato, e tutta Gerusalemme con lui. Ed egli, raunati tutti i principali sacerdoti e gli scribi del popolo, si informò da loro dove il Cristo doveva nascere. Ed essi gli dissero, in Betlem di Giudea, perciò che così è scritto per lo profeta. E tu, Betlem, terra di Giuda, non sei punto la minima fra i capi di Giuda, perciò che da te uscirà un capo, il qual pascerà il mio popolo Israele. Allora Erode, chiamati di nascosti magi, domandò loro del tempo appunto che la stella era apparita, e mandandoli in Betlem disse loro, andate, e domandate diligentemente del fanciullino, 
e quando l'avrete trovato, rapportatemelo, a ciò che ancora io venga e l'adori. Ed essi, udito il re, andarono, ed ecco, la stella che avevano veduto in oriente andava dinanzi a loro, finché giunta di sopra al luogo dove era il fanciullino, vi si fermò, ed essi, veduta la stella, si rallegrarono di grandissima allegrezza, ed entrati nella casa, trovarono il fanciullino con Maria, sua madre, e gettatisi in terra, adorarono quello, e aperti i loro tesori, gli offerirono doni, oro, incenso e mirra, e avendo avuto una rivelazione divina in sogno di non tornare ad Erode, per un'altra strada si ridussero nel loro paese. Fine del Vangelo di Matteo, capitolo primo, versetti dal 18 al 25, capitolo secondo, versetti dall'1 al 12. Merry Christmas by Stephen Leacock, read in English. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Merry Christmas. My dear young friend, said Father Time, as he laid his hand gently upon my shoulder, you are entirely wrong. Then I looked up over my shoulder from the table at which I was sitting, and I saw him but I had known, or felt, for at least the last half-hour, that he was standing somewhere near me. You have had, I do not doubt, good reader, more than once that strange, uncanny feeling that there is some one unseen standing beside you, in a darkened room, let us say, with a dying fire, when the night has grown late and the October wind sounds low outside, and when, through the thin curtain that we call reality, the unseen world starts for a moment clear upon our dreaming sense. You have had it. Yes, I know you have. Never mind telling me about it. Stop. I don't want to hear about that strange presentiment you had the night your Aunt Eliza broke her leg. Don't let's bother with your experience. I want to tell mine." "'You are quite mistaken, my dear young friend,' repeated Father Time. "'Quite wrong.' "'Young friend,' I said, my mind, as one's mind is apt to, in such a case, running to an unimportant detail. "'Why do you call me young?' "'Oh, your pardon,' he answered gently. He had a gentle way with him, had Father Time. "'The fault is in my failing eyes.' I took you at first sight for something under a hundred. Under a hundred? I expostulated. Well, I should think so. Your pardon again, said Time. The fault is in my failing memory. I forgot. You seldom pass that nowadays, do you? Your life is very short of late. I heard him breathe a wistful, hollow sigh. Very ancient and dim he seemed as he stood beside me, but I did not turn to look upon him. I had no need to. I knew his form, in the inner and clearer sight of things, as well as every human being knows by innate instinct the unseen face and form of Father Time. I could hear him murmuring beside me, Short, short, your life is short, till the sound of it seemed to mingle with the measured ticking of a clock somewhere in the silent house. Then I remembered what he had said. "'How do you know that I am wrong?' I asked. "'And how can you tell what I was thinking?' "'You said it out loud,' answered Father Time, "'but it wouldn't have mattered anyway. "'You said that Christmas was all played out and done with.' "'Yes, I admitted, that's what I said. "'And what makes you think that?' "'He questioned, stooping, so it seemed to me, "'still further over my shoulder. "'Why,' I answered, "'the trouble is this. I've been sitting here for hours, sitting till goodness only knows how far into the night, trying to think out something to write for a Christmas story, and it won't go. It can't be done. Not in these awful days. A Christmas story?' "'Yes, you see, Father Time,' I explained, glad with a foolish little vanity of my trade, to be able to tell him something that I thought enlightening. All the Christmas stuff, stories and jokes and pictures, is all done, you know, in October. I thought it would have surprised him, but I was mistaken. Dear me, he said, not till October. What a rush! How well I remember in ancient Egypt. 
as i think you call it seeing them getting out their christmas things all cut in hieroglyphics always two or three years ahead two or three years i exclaimed pooh said time that was nothing why in babylon they used to get their christmas jokes ready all baked in clay a whole solar eclipse ahead of christmas they said i think that the public preferred them so egypt i said babylon but surely father time there was no christmas in those days i thought my dear boy he interrupted gravely don't you know that there has always been christmas i was silent father time had moved across the room and stood beside the fireplace leaning on the mantelpiece the little wreaths of smoke from the fading fire seemed to mingle with his shadowy outline well he said presently what is it that is wrong with christmas why i answered all the romance the joy the beauty of it has gone crushed and killed by the greed of commerce and the horrors of war i am not as you thought i was a hundred years old but i can conjure up as any one can a picture of christmas in the good old days of a hundred years ago the quaint old-fashioned houses standing deep among the evergreens with the light twinkling from the windows on the snow the warmth and comfort within the great fire roaring on a hearth the merry guests grouped about its blaze and the little children with their eyes dancing in the christmas firelight waiting for father christmas in his fine mummery of red and white and cotton wool to hand the presents from the yuletide tree i can see it i added as if it were yesterday it was but yesterday said father time and his voice seemed to soften with the memory of bygone years i remember it well ah i continued that was christmas indeed give me back such days as those with the old good cheer the old stage-coaches and the gabled inns and the warm red wine the snapdragon and the christmas tree and i'll believe again in christmas yes in father christmas himself believe in him said time quietly you may well do that he happens to be standing outside in the street at this moment outside i exclaimed why don't he come in he's afraid to said father time he's frightened and he daren't come in unless you ask him may i call him in i signified assent and father time went to the window for a moment and beckoned into the darkened street then i heard footsteps clumsy and hesitant they seemed upon the stairs and in a moment a figure stood framed in the doorway the figure of father christmas he stood shuffling his feet a timid apologetic look upon his face how changed he was i had known in my mind's eye from childhood up the face and form of father christmas as well as that of old time himself everybody knows or once knew him a jolly little rounded man with a great muffler round about him a packet of toys upon his back and with such merry twinkling eyes and rosy cheeks as are only given by the touch of the driving snow and the rude fun of the north wind why there was once a time not yet so long ago when the very sound of his sleigh bells sent the blood running warm to the heart but now how changed all draggled with the mud and rain he stood as if no house had sheltered him these three years past his old red jersey was tattered in a dozen places, his muffler frayed and raveled. The bundle of toys that he dragged with him in a net seemed wet and worn till the cardboard boxes gaped asunder. There were boxes among them, I vow, that he must have been carrying these three past years. But most of all I noted the change that had come over the face of Father Christmas. The old brave look of cheery confidence was gone the smile that had beamed responsive to the laughing eyes of countless children around unnumbered christmas trees was there no more and in the place of it there showed a look of a timid apology of apprehensiveness as of one who has asked in vain the warmth and shelter of a human home such a look as the harsh cruelty of this world has stamped upon the faces of its outcasts 
so stood father christmas shuffling upon the threshold fumbling his poor tattered hat in his hand shall i come in he said his eyes appealingly on father time come said time he turned to speak to me your room is dark turn up the lights he's used to light bright light and plenty of it the dark has frightened him these three years past i turned up the lights and the bright glare revealed all the more cruelly the tattered figure before us father christmas advanced a timid step across the floor then he paused as if in sudden fear is this floor mine he said no no said time soothingly and to me he added in a murmured whisper he's afraid he was blown up in a mine in no man's land between the trenches at christmas time in nineteen fourteen it broke his nerve may i put my toys on that machine gun asked father christmas timidly it will help to keep them dry it is not a machine gun said time gently see it is only a pile of books upon the sofa and to me he whispered they turned a machine gun on him in the streets of warsaw he thinks he sees them everywhere since then it's all right father christmas i said speaking as cheerily as i could while i rose and stirred the fire into a blaze there are no machine guns here and there are no mines this is but the house of a poor writer ah said father christmas lowering his tattered hat still further and attempting something of a humble bow a writer are you hans anderson perhaps not quite i answered but a great writer i do not doubt said the old man with a humble courtesy that he had learned it well may be centuries ago in the yuletide season of his northern home the world owes much to its great books i carry some of the greatest with me always i have them here he began fumbling among the limp and tattered packages that he carried look the house that jack built a marvellous deep thing sir and this the babes in the wood will you take it sir a poor present but a present still not so long ago i gave them in thousands every christmas time none seem to want them now he looked appealingly towards father time as the weak may look toward the strong for help and guidance none want them now he repeated and i could see the tears start in his eyes why is it so has the world forgotten its sympathy with the lost children wandering in the wood all the world i heard time murmur with a sigh is wandering in the wood but out loud he spoke to father christmas in cheery admonition tut tut good christmas he said you must cheer up here sit in this chair and the biggest one so beside the fire let us stir it to a blaze more wood oh that's better and listen good old friend to the wind outside almost a christmas wind is it not merry and boisterous enough for all the evil times it stirs among old christmas seated himself beside the fire his hands outstretched toward the flames something of his old-time cheeriness seemed to flicker across his features as he warmed himself at the blaze oh, that's better he murmured i was cold sir cold chilled to the bone of old i never felt it so no matter what the wind the world seemed warm about me why is it not so now you see said time speaking low in a whisper for my ear alone how sunk and broken he is will you not help gladly i answered if i can all can said father time every one of us meantime christmas had turned towards me a questioning eye in which however there seemed to revive some little gleam of merriment have you perhaps he asked half timidly schnapps schnapps i repeated ay schnapps a glass of it to drink your health might warm my heart again i think ah i said something to drink his one failing whispered time if it is one forgive it him he was used to it for centuries give it him if you have it i keep a little in the house i said reluctantly perhaps in case of illness tut tut said father time as something as near as could be to a smile passed over his shadowy face 
in case of illness they used to say that in ancient babylon here let me pour it out for him drink father christmas drink marvellous it was to see the old man smack his lips as he drank his glass of liqueur neat after the fashion of old norway marvellous too to see the way in which with the warmth of the fire and the generous glow of the spirits his face changed and brightened till the old-time cheerfulness beamed again upon it he looked about him as it were with a new and growing interest a pleasant room he said and what better sir than the wind without and a brave fire within then his eye fell upon the mantelpiece where lay among the litter of books and pipes a little toy horse ah said father christmas almost gaily children in the house one i answered the sweetest boy in all the world i'll be bound he is said father christmas and he broke now into a merry laugh that did one's heart good to hear they all are lord bless me the number that i have seen and each and every one and quite right too the sweetest child in all the world and how old do you say two and a half all but two months except a week the very sweetest age of all i'll bet you say eh, what they all do and the old man broke again into such a jolly chuckling of laughter that his snow-white locks shook upon his head but stop a bit he added this horse is broken tut tut a hind leg nearly off this won't do he had the toy in his lap in a moment mending it it was wonderful to see for all his age how deft his fingers were time he said and it was amusing to note that his voice had assumed almost an authoritative tone reach me that piece of string that's right here hold your finger across the knot there now then a bit of beeswax what no beeswax tut tut how ill supplied your houses are to-day how can you mend toys sir without beeswax still it will stand up now i tried to murmur my best thanks but father christmas waved my gratitude aside nonsense he said that's nothing that's my life perhaps the little boy would like a book too i have them here in the packet here sir jack and the beanstalk most profound thing i read it to myself often still how damp it is pray sir will you let me dry my books before your fire only too willingly i said how wet and torn they are father christmas had risen from his chair and was fumbling among his tattered packages taking from them his children's books all limp and draggled from the rain and wind all wet and torn he murmured and his voice sank again into sadness i have carried them these three years past look these were for little children in belgium and in serbia can i get them to them think you time gently shook his head but presently perhaps said father christmas if i dry and mend them look some of them were inscribed already this one see you was written with father's love why has it never come to him is it rain or tears upon the page he stood bowed over his little books his hands trembling as he turned the pages then he looked up the old fear upon his face again that sound he said listen is it guns i hear them oh no no i said it is nothing only a car passing in the street below listen he said hear that again voices crying no no i answered not voices only the night wind among the trees my children's voices he exclaimed i hear them everywhere they come to me in every wind i see them as i wander in the night and storm my children torn and dying in the trenches beaten into the ground i hear them crying from the hospitals each one to me still as i knew him once a little child time time he cried reaching out his arms in appeal give me back my children they do not die in vain time murmured gently but christmas only moaned in answer give me back my children then he sank down upon his pile of books and toys his head buried in his arms you see said time his heart is breaking 
and will you not help him if you can only too gladly i replied but what is there to do this said father time listen he stood before me grave and solemn a shadowy figure but half seen though he was close beside me the firelight had died down and through the curtained windows there came already the first dim brightening of dawn the world that once you knew said father time seems broken and destroyed about you you must not let them know the children the cruelty and the horror and the hate that racks the world to-day keep it from them some day he will know here time pointed to the prostrate form of father christmas that his children that once were have not died in vain that from their sacrifice shall come a nobler better world for all to live in a world where countless happy children shall hold bright their memory for ever but for the children of to-day save and spare them all you can from the evil hate and horror of the war later they will know and understand not yet give them back their merry christmas and its kind thoughts and its christmas charity till later on there shall be with it again peace upon earth good will towards men his voice ceased it seemed to vanish as it were in the sighing of the wind i looked up father time and christmas had vanished from the room the fire was low and the day was breaking visibly outside let us begin i murmured i will mend this broken horse end of merry christmas by stephen leacock read by david wales the nativity by christopher harvey read in english this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Unfold thy face, unmask thy ray, shine forth, bright sun, double the day. Let no malignant misty fume, nor foggy vapor, once presume to interpose thy perfect sight this day, which makes us love thy light for ever better that we could that blessed object once behold which is both the circumference and centre of all excellence or rather neither but a treasure unconfined without measure whose centre and circumference including all preeminence excluding nothing but defect and infinite in each respect is equally both here and there and now and then and everywhere and always one himself the same a being far above a name draw near then and freely pour forth all thy light into that hour which was crowned with his birth and made heaven envy earth let not his birthday clouded be by whom thou shinest and we see end of the nativity by christopher harvey read by thomas peter The Night After Christmas by Anne P. L. Field. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Twas the night after Christmas in Santa Claus land, and to rest from his labors, St. Nicholas planned. The reindeer were turned out to pasture, and all the ten thousand assistants discharged till the fall. The furry great coat was laid safely away, with the boots and the cap, with its tassel so gay, and toasting his toes by a merry wood fire, what more could a weary old Santa desire? So he puffed at his pipe and remarked to his wife, This amply makes up for my strenuous life. From climbing down chimneys, my legs fairly ache, but it's well worth the while for the dear children's sake. I'd bruise every bone in my body to see the darling's delight in a gift-laden tree. Just then came a sound like a telephone bell. Though why they should have such a thing, I can't tell. St. Nick gave a snort and exclaimed in a rage, Bad luck to inventions of this modern age. He grabbed the receiver, his face wore a frown, 
as he roared in the mouthpiece i will not come down to exchange any toys like an up-to-date store ring off i'll not listen to anything more then he settled himself by the comforting blaze and waxed reminiscent of Sundays. when children were happy with simplest of toys a doll for the girls and a drum for the boys but again came that noisy disturber of peace the telephone bell would that sound never cease run and answer it wife all my patience has fled if they keep this thing up i shall wish i were dead i have worked night and day the best part of a year to supply all the children and what do i hear a boy who declares he received roller skates when he wanted a gun and a cross girl who states that she asked for a new victor talking machine i brought her a sled and she thinks i'm mean poor saint nicholas looked just the picture of woe he needed some auto suggestion you know to make him think things were all coming out all right for he didn't get one wink of slumber that night the telephone wire was kept sizzling hot by children disgusted with presents they'd got and when the bright sun showed its face in the sky the santa claus family were ready to cry just then something happened a way of escape though it came in the funniest possible shape an aeronaut sorely in need of a meal descended for breakfast it seemed quite ideal for the end of it was he invited his host out to try the balloon of whose speed he could boast saint nick who was nothing if not a good sport was delighted to go and as quick as a thought climbed into the car for a flight in the air no telephone bells can disturb me up there and wife if it suits me i'll count it no crime to stay up till ready for next christmas time thus saying he sailed in the giant balloon and i fear he will not return very soon now when you ask central for santa claus land she'll say discontinued and you'll understand end of the night after christmas by ann p l field read by april six zero nine zero california united states of america november twenty eighth two thousand sixteen A Letter from Santa Claus for Christmas 1849 Read in English. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. My dear children, as I have always been in the habit of meeting with you on this anniversary, and as I cannot expect to see you all together this year, for the sake of old times, I am going to write you a letter. Perhaps you are not aware that I have been a silent spectator of your daily occupations, but so it is. I generally take a nap from one year to another, so after our glorious celebration at the Beehive, I packed myself away in the stovepipe for that purpose, but the hum of merry voices kept me awake, and thus I lay and listened to what was going on the fairies in whom you perhaps all believe have also been quite numerous in your vicinity and from my relationship to them i have often heard of your excursions over hill and dale and the many gay times you have enjoyed together i travel over many regions at this season of the year and in order to accomplish all i wish in my endeavors to please the young folks i shall begin my preparations a little earlier than usual so you need not wonder if i visit some of you a little before christmas and new year with one of my gifts this will consist of a few of the simplest little sketches letters and reminiscences of the various occurrences in which you have participated and i hope the contents of this christmas bow will give you as much satisfaction as those of bygone seasons when the festive pine tree erected to my honor has been loaded with gay and glittering gifts. I trust you will all enjoy the holiday and with glad and grateful hearts fully appreciate the many privileges you enjoy as the children of kind parents and the objects of interest to affectionate friends. Of course, you will be most forcibly reminded of the giver of all these blessings and you will love to listen about the gentle child Jesus in honor of whose birth the day is celebrated. By looking back upon the past year, you can see what steps you have taken in self-improvement, what you have learned, what left unlearned, and the retrospect will help you to form new plans for the future. 
which now rises bright and beautifully before you one little girl will have the satisfaction of having almost conquered a peevish temper which made her very disagreeable another will have acquired habits of neatness and order so necessary to comfort and enjoyment this scholar will have an increase of memory and thus avoid the repetition of that troublesome phrase oh i forgot and that one will become more thoughtful and will not consider the excuse i didn't think sufficient to cover her frequent blunders a nice hearty little fellow that i know will have learned to read fluently and to love his books for the sake of all the good and pleasant things he can find in them while another rogue will be kind and gentle to his sisters and give up the naughty habit of teasing his companions the proud child will learn her true value and not think herself better than her mates on account of her pretty face fine clothes or handsome residence while best of all these changes the cowardly and deceitful will be ever brave and truthful finding that honesty is the greatest safeguard and truthfulness a shield from many temptations all foolish quarrels will be forgotten and the spirit of love and goodwill pervade all their actions as the children resolve to aid their kind parents in family cares the brother and sister mutually assisting each other and with cheerful bright faces make a perpetual sunshine at home in this delightful progress the claims of those who have always served you as devoted domestics will not be forgotten and by your thoughtfulness you can thus atone for many an unkind word or heedless exaction on your part as children of benevolent parents you will help to bestow gifts upon the poor and needy and nothing i know from watching you all will be more pleasant than this part of the christmas rejoicings i shall want to hear from you in answer to this lengthy epistle for i know you are all used to writing and be assured i shall ever feel a sincere and hearty interest in your welfare and whatever may be your position in life memory will carry me back to the happy days spent in the pretty village of d and now as i draw on my seven league boots for other scenes i will wish you all a merry christmas and a happy new year santa claus end of a letter from santa claus for christmas 1849 by unknown author the heavenly christmas tree by fyodor dostoevsky read in english this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org i am a novelist and i suppose i have made up this story i write i suppose though i know for a fact that i have made it up but yet i keep fancying that it must have happened somewhere at some time that it must have happened on christmas eve in some great town in a time of terrible frost i have a vision of a boy a little boy six years old or even younger this boy woke up that morning in a cold damp cellar he was dressed in a sort of little dressing gown and was shivering with cold there was a cloud of white steam from his breath and sitting on a box in the corner he blew the steam out of his mouth and amused himself in his dullness watching it float away but he was terribly hungry several times that morning he went up to the plank bed where his sick mother was lying on a mattress as thin as a pancake with some sort of bundle under her head for a pillow how had she come here she must have come with her boy from some other town and suddenly fallen ill the landlady who let the corners had been taken two days before to the police station the lodgers were out and about as the holiday was so near and the only one left had been lying for the last twenty-four hours dead drunk not having waited for christmas in another corner of the room a wretched old woman of eighty who had once been a children's nurse but was now left to die friendless was moaning and groaning with rheumatism scolding and grumbling at the boy so that he was afraid to go near her corner he had got a drink of water in the outer room but could not find a crust anywhere and had been on the point of waking his mother a dozen times he felt frightened at last in the darkness it had long been dusk but no light was kindled touching his mother's face 
He was surprised that she did not move at all, and that she was as cold as the wall. It is very cold here, he thought. He stood a little, unconsciously letting his hands rest on the dead woman's shoulders. Then he breathed on his fingers to warm them, and then quietly fumbling for his cap on the bed, he went out of the cellar. He would have gone earlier, but was afraid of the big dog which had been howling all day at the neighbor's door at the top of the stairs. But the dog was not there now, and he went out into the street. Mercy on us, what a town! He had never seen anything like it before. In the town from which he had come, it was always such black darkness at night. There was one lamp for the whole street. The little low-pitched wooden houses were closed up with shutters. There was no one to be seen in the street after dusk. All the people shut themselves up in their houses, and there was nothing but the howling of a pack of dogs, hundreds and thousands of them barking and howling all night. But there it was, so warm, and he was given food, while here, oh dear, if he only had something to eat. And what a noise and rattle here, what light and what people, horses and carriages, and what a frost. The frozen steam hung in clouds over the horses, over their warmly breathing mouths, their hooves clanged against the stones through the powdery snow, and everyone pushed so, and, oh dear, how he longed for some morsel to eat, and how wretched he suddenly felt. A policeman walked by and turned away to avoid seeing the boy. Here was another street. Oh, what a wide one. Here he would be run over for certain. How everyone was shouting, racing, and driving along, and the light, the light. And what was this? A huge glass window, and through the window a tree reaching up to the ceiling. It was a fir tree, and on it were ever so many lights, gold papers, and apples, and little dolls, and horses. And there were children, clean and dressed, in their best running about the room, laughing and playing and eating and drinking and something. And then a little girl began dancing with one of the boys. What a pretty little girl! And he could hear the music through the window. The boy looked and wondered and laughed. Through his toes were aching with the cold, and his fingers were red and stiff so that it hurt him to move them. And all at once the boy remembered how his toes and fingers hurt him, and began crying, and ran on. And again through another window pane he saw another Christmas tree, and on a table cakes of all sorts, almond cakes, red cakes, and yellow cakes. And three grand young ladies were sitting there, and they gave the cakes to anyone who went up to them, and the door kept opening. Lots of gentlemen and ladies went in from the street. The boy crept up, suddenly opened the door, and went in. Oh, how they shouted at him and waved him back. One lady went up to him hurriedly and slipped a kopeck in his hand, and with her own hands opened the door into the street for him. How frightened he was! And the kopeck rolled away and clinked upon the steps. He could not bend his red fingers to hold it tight. The boy ran away and went on, where he did not know. He was ready to cry again, but he was afraid, and ran on and on and blew his fingers. And he was miserable, because he felt suddenly so lonely and terrified, and all at once, mercy on us! What was this again? People were standing in a crowd, admiring. Behind a glass window there were three little dolls, dressed in red and green dresses, and exactly, exactly as though they were alive. One was a little old man, sitting and playing a big violin. The two others were standing close by and playing little violins, and nodding in time, and looking at one another, and their lips moved. They were speaking, actually speaking, only one couldn't hear through the glass. And at first the boy thought they were alive, and when he grasped that they were dolls, he laughed. He had never seen such dolls before, and had no idea there were such dolls. And he wanted to cry, but he felt amused, amused by the dolls. All at once he fancied that someone caught at his smock behind. A wicked big boy was standing beside him, and suddenly hit him on the head, snatched off his cap, and tripped him up. The boy fell down on the ground, and at once there was a shout. He was numb with fright. He jumped up and ran away. He ran, and not knowing where he was going, ran in at the gate of someone's courtyard and sat down behind a stack of wood. They won't find me here. Besides, it's dark. He sat hurriedly up and was breathless from fright, and all at once, quite suddenly, he felt so happy. His hands and feet suddenly left off aching and grew so warm, as warm as though he were on a stove. Then he shivered all over. Then he gave a start. Why, he must have been asleep. How nice to have a sleep here. I'll sit here a little and go and look at the dolls again, said the boy, and smiled, thinking of them, just as though they were alive. And suddenly he heard his mother singing over him, Mammy, I am asleep, 
How nice it is to sleep here. Come to my Christmas tree, little one, a soft voice suddenly whispered over his head. He thought that this was still his mother, but no, it was not she. Who it was calling him he could not see, but someone bent over and embraced him in the darkness, and he stretched out his hands to him, and all at once, oh, what a bright light, oh, what a Christmas tree, and yet it was not a fir tree, he had never seen a tree like that. Where was he now? Everything was bright and shining, and all round him were dolls, but no, they were not dolls, they were little boys and girls, only so bright and shining. They all came flying around him, they all kissed him, took him and carried him along with them, and he was flying himself, and he saw that his mother was looking at him and laughing joyfully, Mammy, Mammy, oh, how nice it is here, Mammy. And again he kissed the children, and wanted to tell them at once of those dolls in the shop window. Who are you, boys? Who are you, girls? he asked, laughing and admiring them. This is Christ's Christmas tree, they answered. Christ always has a Christmas tree on this day for the little children who have no tree of their own. And he found out that all these little boys and girls were children just like himself, that some had been frozen in the baskets in which they had as babies been laid on the doorsteps of well-to-do Petersburg people. Others had been boarded out with Finnish women by the foundling and had been suffocated. Others had died at their starved mother's breasts in the Samara famine. Others had died in the third-class railway carriages from the foul air. And yet they were all here. They were all like angels about Christ. And he was in the middle of them and held out his hands to them and blessed them and their sinful mothers. And the mothers of these children stood on one side weeping. Each one knew her boy or girl. And the children flew up to them and kissed them and wiped away the tears with their little hands and begged them not to weep because they were so happy. And down below in the morning the porter found the little dead body of the frozen child on the woodstack. They sought out his mother too. She had died before him. They met before the Lord God in heaven. Why have I made up such a story, so out of keeping with an ordinary diary and a writer's above all? and I promise two stories dealing with real events. But that is just it. I keep fancying that all this may have happened really, that is, what took place in the cellar and on the woodstack. But as for Christ's Christmas tree, I cannot tell you whether that could have happened or not. End of the Heavenly Christmas Tree by Fyodor Dostoevsky Read by Brian Taylor Three Christmas Trees by Juliana Horatio Gaddy. Read in English. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Three Christmas Trees. This is a story of three Christmas trees. The first was a real one, but the child we are to speak of did not see it. He saw the other two but they were not real, they only existed in his fancy. The plot of the story is very simple, and, as it has been described so early, it is easy for those who think it stupid to lay down the book in good time. Probably every child who reads this has seen one Christmas tree or more, but in the small town of a distant colony with which we have to do, this could not at one time have been said, Christmas trees were then by no means so universal, even in England, as they are now, and in this little colonial town they were unknown. Unknown, that is, till the governor's wife gave her great children's party, at which point we will begin the story. The governor had given a great many parties in his time. He had entertained big wigs and little wigs, the passing military, and the local grandees everybody who had the remotest claim to attention had been attended to the ladies had had their full share of balls and pleasure parties only one class of the population had any complaint to prefer against his hospitality but the class was a large one it was the children however he was a bachelor and knew little or nothing about little boys and girls let us pity rather than blame him at last he took to himself a wife and among the many advantages of this important step was a due recognition of the claims of these young citizens. It was towards happy Christmas tide that the governor's amiable and admired lady, as she was styled in the local newspaper, 
sent out notes for her first children's party at the top of the note paper was a very red robin who carried a blue christmas greeting in his mouth and at the bottom written with a d c s best flourish were the magic words a christmas tree in spite of the flourishes partly because of them the a d c s handwriting though handsome was rather illegible but for all this most of the children invited contrived to read these words and those who could not do so were not slow to learn the news by hearsay there was to be a christmas tree it would be like a birthday party with this above ordinary birthdays that there were to be presents for every one one of the children invited lived in a little white house with a spruce fir tree before the door the spruce fir did this good service to the little house that it helped people to find their way to it and it was by no means easy for a stranger to find his way to any given house in this little town especially if the house were small and white and stood in one of the back streets for most of the houses were small and most of them were painted white and back streets ran parallel with each other and had no names and were all so much alike that it was very confusing for instance if you had asked the way to mr so-and-so's it is very probable that some friend would have directed you as follows go straight forward and take the first turning to your left and you will find that there are four streets which run at right angles to the one you are in and parallel with each other each of them has got a big pine in it one of the old forest trees take the last street but one and the fifth white house you come to is mr so-and-so's he has green blinds and a colored servant you would not always have got such clear directions as these but with them you would probably have found the house at last partly by accident partly by the blinds and colored servant some of the neighbors affirm that the little white house had a name that all the houses and streets had names only they were traditional and not recorded anywhere that very few people knew them and nobody made any use of them the name of the little white house was said to be trafalgar villa which seems so inappropriate to the modest peaceful little home that the man who lived in it tried to find out why it had been so called he thought that his predecessor must have been in the navy until he found that he had been the owner of what is called a dry goods store which seems to mean a shop where things are sold which are not good to eat or drink such as drapery at last somebody said that as there was a public house called the duke of wellington at the corner of the street there probably had been a nearer one called the nelson which had been burnt down and that the man who built the nelson had built the house with the spruce fir before it and that so the name had arisen an explanation which was just so far probable that public houses and fires were a frequent occurrence in those parts but this has nothing to do with the story only we must say as we said before and as we should have said had we been living there then the child we speak of lived in the little white house with one spruce fir just in front of it of all the children who looked forward to the christmas tree he looked forward to it the most intensely he was an imaginative child of a simple happy nature easy to please his father was an englishman and in the long winter evenings he would tell the child tales of the old country to which his mother would listen also perhaps the parents enjoyed these stories the most to the boy they were new and consequently delightful but to the parents they were old and as regards some stories that is better still what kind of a bird is this on my letter asked the boy on the day which brought the governor's lady's note of invitation and oh what is a christmas tree the bird is an english robin said his father it is quite another bird to that which is called a robin here it is smaller and rounder and has a redder breast and bright dark eyes and lives and sings at home through the winter a christmas tree is a fir tree just such a one as that outside the door brought into the house and covered with lights and presents picture to yourself our fir tree lighted up with tapers on all the branches with dolls and trumpets and bonbons and drums and toys of all kinds hanging from it like fir cones and on the tip-top shoot a figure of a christmas angel in white with a star upon its head 
Fancy, said the boy, and fancy he did. Every day he looked at the spruce fir and tried to imagine it laden with presents and brilliant with tapers and thought how wonderful must be that old country, home as it was called, even by those who had never seen it, where the robins were so very red and where at Christmas the fir trees were hung with toys instead of cones. It was certainly a pity that two days before the party an original idea on the subject of snowmen struck one of the children who used to play together with their sleds and snowshoes in the back streets the idea was this that instead of having a commonplace snowman whose legs were obliged to be mere stumps for fear he should be top-heavy and who could not walk even with them who in fact could do nothing but stand at the corner of the street holding his impotent stick and staring with his pebble eyes till he was broken to pieces or ignominiously carried away by a thaw that instead of this they should have a real live snowman who should walk on competent legs to the astonishment and happy thought perhaps to the alarm of the passers-by this delightful novelty was to be accomplished by covering one of the boys of the party with snow till he looked as like a real snowman as circumstances would admit at first everybody wanted to be the snowman but when it came to the point it was found to be so much duller to stand still and be covered up than to run about and work that no one was willing to act the part at last it was undertaken by the little boy from the fur house he was somewhat small but then he was so good-natured he would always do as he was asked so he stood manfully still with his arms folded over a walking stick upon his breast whilst the others heaped the snow upon him the plan was not so successful as they had hoped the snow would not stick anywhere except on his shoulders and when it got into his neck he cried with the cold but they were so anxious to carry out their project that they begged him to bear it just a little longer and the urchin who had devised the original idea wiped the child's eyes with his handkerchief and with that hopefulness which is so easy over other people's matters dared say that when all the snow was on he wouldn't feel it however he did feel it and that so severely that the children were obliged to give up the game and taking the stick out of his stiff little arms to lead him home it appears that it is with snowmen as with some other men in conspicuous positions it is easier to find fault with them than to fill their place the end of this was a feverish cold and when the day of the party came the ex-snowman was still in bed it is due to the other children to say that they felt the disappointment as keenly as he did and that it greatly damped the pleasure of the party for them to think that they had prevented his sharing in the treat the most penitent of all was the deviser of the original idea he had generously offered to stay at home with the little patient which was as generously refused but the next evening he was allowed to come and sit on his bed and describe it all for the amusement of his friend he was a quaint boy this urchin with a face as broad as an american indian's eyes as bright as a squirrel's and all the mischief in life lurking around him till you could see roguishness in the very folds of his hooded indian winter coat of blue and scarlet in his hand he brought the sick child's present a dray with two white horses and little barrels that took off and on and a driver with wooden joints a cloth coat and everything in fact that was suitable to the driver of a brewer's dray except that he had blue boots and earrings and that his hair was painted in braids like ladies which is clearly the fault of the doll manufacturers who will persist in making them all of the weaker sex and what was the christmas tree like asked the invalid exactly like the fir outside your door was the reply just about that size and planted in a pot covered with red cloth it was kept in another room till after tea and then when the door was opened it was like a street fire in the town at night such a blaze of light candles everywhere and on all the branches the most beautiful presents i got a drum and pen wiper was there an angel the child asked oh yes the boy answered it was on the tip-top branch and it was given to me and i brought it for you if you would like it 
for you know i am so very very sorry i thought of a snowman and made you ill and i do love you and beg you to forgive me and the roguish face stooped over the pillow to be kissed and out of a pocket in the hooded coat came forth the christmas angel in the face it bore a strong family likeness to the drayman but its feet were hidden in folds of snowy muslin and on its head glittered a tinsel star how lovely said the child father told me about this i like it best of all and it is very kind of you for it is not your fault that i caught cold i should have liked it if we could have done it but i think to enjoy being a snowman one should be snow all through they had tea together and then the invalid was tucked up for the night the dray was put away in the cupboard but he took the angel to bed with him and so ended the first of the three christmas trees except for a warm glow from the wood fire in the stove the room was dark but about midnight it seemed to the child that a sudden blaze of light filled the chamber at the same moment the window curtains were drawn aside and he saw that the spruce fir had come close up to the panes and was peeping in ah how beautiful it looked it had become a christmas tree lighted tapers shone from every familiar branch toys of the most fascinating appearance hung like fruit and on the tip-top shoot there stood the christmas angel he tried to count the candles but somehow it was impossible when he looked at them they seemed to change places to move to become like the angel and then to become candles again whilst the flames nodded to each other and repeated the blue greeting of the robin a merry christmas and a happy new year then he tried to distinguish the presents but beautiful as the toys looked he could not exactly discover what any of them were or choose which he would like best only the angel he could see clearly so clearly it was more beautiful than the doll under his pillow it had a lovely face like his own mother's he thought and on its head gleamed a star far brighter than tinsel its white robes waved with the flames of the tapers and it stretched its arms towards him with a smile i am to go and choose my present thought the child and he called mother mother dear please open the window but his mother did not answer so he thought he must get up himself and with an effort he struggled out of bed but when he was on his feet everything seemed changed only the firelight shone upon the walls and the curtains were once more firmly closed before the window it had been a dream but so vivid that in his feverish state he still thought it must be true and dragged the curtains back to let in the glorious sight again the firelight shone upon a thick coating of frost upon the panes but no further could he see so with all his strength he pushed the window open and leaned out into the night the spruce fir stood in its old place but it looked very beautiful in its christmas dress beneath it lay a carpet of pure white the snow was clustered in exquisite shapes upon its plumy branches wrapping the tree-top with its little cross shoots as a white rope might wrap a figure with outstretched arms there were no tapers to be seen but northern light shot up into the dark blue sky and just over the fir tree shone a bright bright star jupiter looks well to-night said the old professor in the town observatory as he fixed his telescope but to the child it seemed as the star of the christmas angel his mother had really heard him call and now came and put him back to bed again and so ended the second of the three christmas trees it was enough to have killed him all his friends said but it did not he lived to be a man and what is rare to keep the faith the simplicity the tender-heartedness the vivid fancy of his childhood he lived to see many christmas trees at home in that old country where the robins are red breasts and sing in winter there a heart as good and gentle as his own became one with his and once he brought his young wife across the sea to visit the place where he was born they stood near the little white house and he told her the story of the christmas tree this was when i was a child he added but that you are still said she and she plucked a bit of the fir tree and kissed it and carried it away he lived to tell the story to his children and even to his grandchildren but he never was able to decide which of the two was the more beautiful the christmas tree of his dream 
or the spruce fir as it stood in the loveliness of that winter night this is told not that it has anything to do with any of the three christmas trees but to show that the story is a happy one as is right and proper that the hero lived and married and had children and was as prosperous as good people in books should always be of course he died at last the best and happiest of men must die and it is only because some stories stop short in their history that every hero is not duly buried before we lay down the book when death came for our hero he was an old man the beloved wife some of his children and many of his friends had died before him and of those whom he had loved there were fewer to leave than to rejoin he had had a short illness with little pain and was now lying on his deathbed in one of the big towns in the north of england his youngest son a clergyman was with him and one or two others of his children and by the fire sat the doctor the doctor had been sitting by the patient but now that he could do no more for him he had moved to the fire and they had taken the ghastly half-emptied medicine bottles from the table by the bedside and had spread it with a fair linen cloth and had set out the silver vessels of the supper of the lord the old man had been wandering somewhat during the day he had talked much of going home to the old country and with the wider range of dying thoughts he had seemed to mingle memories of childhood with his hopes of paradise at intervals he was clear and collected one of those moments had been chosen for his last sacrament and he had fallen asleep with the blessing in his ears he slept so long and so peacefully that the son almost began to hope that there might be a change and looked towards the doctor who still sat by the fire with his right leg crossed over his left the doctor's eyes were also on the bed but at that moment he drew out his watch and looked at it with an air of professional conviction which said it's only a question of time then he crossed his left leg over his right and turned to the fire again before the right leg should be tired all would be over the son saw it as clearly as if it had been spoken and he too turned away and sighed as they sat the bells of a church in the town began to chime for midnight service for it was christmas eve but they did not wake the dying man he slept on and on the doctor dozed the son read in the prayer book on the table and one of his sisters read with him another from grief and weariness slept with her head upon his shoulder except for a warm glow from the fire the room was dark suddenly the old man sat up in bed and in a strong voice cried with inexpressible enthusiasm how beautiful the son held back his sisters and asked quietly what my dear father the christmas tree he said in a low eager voice draw back the curtains they were drawn back but nothing could be seen and still the old man gazed as if in ecstasy light he murmured the angel the star again there was silence and then he stretched forth his hands and cried passionately the angel is beckoning to me mother mother dear please open the window the sash was thrown open and all eyes turned involuntarily where those of the dying man were gazing there was no christmas tree no tree at all but over the housetops the morning star looked pure and pale in the dawn of christmas day for the night was past and above the distant hum of the streets the clear voices of some waits made the words of an old carol heard words dearer for their association than their poetry while shepherds watch their flocks by night all seated on the ground the angel of the lord came down and glory shone around when the window was opened the soul passed and when they looked back to the bed the old man had lain down again and like a child was smiling in his sleep his last sleep and this was the third christmas tree end of three christmas trees by juliana horatio gaddy Under the Holly Bough by Charles Mackay, read in English. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. Ye who have scorned each other, or injured friend or brother in this fast-fading year, ye who by word or deed have made a kind heart bleed, come gather here. Let sinned against and sinning forget their strife's beginning, and join in friendship now. Be links no longer broken, be sweet forgiveness spoken under the holly bough. Ye who have loved each other, sister and friend and brother in this fast-fading year, Mother and sire and child, young man and maiden mild, Come gather here and let your hearts grow fonder, As memory shall ponder each past unbroken vow. Old loves and younger wooing are sweet in the renewing Under the holly bough. Ye who have nourished sadness, estranged from hope and gladness in this fast-fading year. Ye with o'erburdened mind made aliens from your kind, come gather here. Let not the useless sorrow pursue you night and morrow. If e'er you hoped, hope now. Take heart, uncloud your faces, and join in our embraces under the holly bough. End of Under the Holly Bough by Charles Mackay Read by Ruth Golding, Christmas 2016Read in French. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. En réveillon chez Cambacérès. Dans le petit salon de l'hôtel de la rue de l'université, qu'habitait Cambacérès depuis qu'il avait quitté le palais de l'archi-chancellerie, se trouvaient groupés le 24 décembre 1814 quelques-uns des rares amis de l'ancien consul. De ceux qui, Cambacérès appelait ses fidèles. Presque chaque soir, le même cercle se formait là. Épave de la politique, ancien ministre gardant la mer regret de leur puissance passée, conseiller d'État sans emploi, Sénateurs en disponibilité, tous ressassant l'éternel « Ah, si on avait su !» Tous mettant en commun l'aigreur de leurs rancunes et de leurs ambitions déçues. Ce soir-là, autour de l'ex-archi-chancelier, se trouvaient réunis Rodrère, le comte du bois du Bay, Fabre de l'Aude, Réal, le marquis de la motte Langon, Fouché, l'ex-duc d'Otrante, d'autres encore vieillis, cassés, pourtant au coin des lèvres, ce pli qui laisse la désillusion. Surpris depuis que le silence s'était fait autour d'eux, du peu de place qu'ils tenaient dans le monde, comprenant l'inanité de leur lutte et le vide de leur existence. Dans le salon peu éclairé, Rangés autour de la vaste cheminée aux brûlets d'énormes bûches que tisonnaient les yeux vagues le duc d'Otrante, ils se taisaient tout à leurs pensées et à leurs souvenirs. Au dehors dans la rue silencieuse, on n'entendait de temps à autre que le bruit sourd d'une voiture roulant sur la neige. Loin au-delà des maisons, s'élevait dans la nuit la symphonie de toutes les cloches de la ville, parmi lesquels se distinguait nettement le timbre grave du bourdon de Notre-Dame. Aucun de ceux qui étaient là ne s'y trompe pas. Il l'avait si souvent entendu, en tant de circonstances. Tédéum de victoire, sacre du maître, baptême de l'enfant impérial, alors que fêtés et arrogants, ils paradaient couverts de manteaux de cour, 
et des grands cordons. Le rythme solennel de la merveilleuse cloche éveillait en eux mille souvenirs. Le duc d'Otrante en semblait exaspéré. Il mordait ses lèvres minces et passait sa rage sur les bûches du foyer qu'il repoussait à grands coups de tisonnier. Tout à coup, il releva la tête. « Qu'a-t-il donc » interrogea-t-il. « C'est Noël, » répondit une voix. « Ah !» dit froidement Fouché. Et le silence se fit de nouveau. Maintenant, ils songeaient à leur enfance lointaine, au jour clair d'avant la Révolution, à leur croyance depuis si longtemps oubliée, à la naïveté de leur foi jadis, lorsqu'ils croyaient encore au petit Jésus qui tend sa crèche pour faire largesse des jouets. Sottise. Superstition. Puis, ils se revoyaient abolissant le culte, fêtant la déesse raison, escortant Robespierre à l'hôtel de l'être suprême, s'agenouillant devant le pape pour plaire à l'empereur, sceptique, philosophe, athée au fond, mais agacé par la voix solennelle de ses cloches, qu'au jour de la terreur ils avaient condamné à la fonte et qui leur survivait pourtant. « Bah !» grommela la réelle comme se répondant à lui-même. « C'est là un moyen de gouverner les hommes, stupide à coup sûr, mais plus efficace que tous les autres. »« Ça passera vite !» ajouta Fabre. « Dans vingt ans d'ici, toutes ces superstitions seront allées rejoindre les autres. » Nous avons appris au monde comment on fabrique Dieu et comment on le renverse. Qui est-ce qui croit aujourd'hui aux sorciers Moi, fit Cambacérès. Vous croyez aux sorciers, vous J'en ai connu un. Ma foi, prince, s'exclama Rodrer, vous allez nous dire cette histoire. Il y a longtemps que je n'ai entendu un conte de fées. Cambacérès se leva et vint s'adosser à la cheminée, ainsi qu'il en avait l'habitude, lorsqu'au milieu de ce cercle d'intimes, il se laissait aller à ses souvenirs. D'ailleurs, il parlait volontiers, narrant bien et se sachant écouter. « Eh, messieurs, ce n'est pas un conte, » fit-il. « Tous, sans doute, vous avez entendu parler de ce personnage singulier, » que vers 1760 s'en vint d'Allemagne à la cour de Louis XV où il fut présenté par le maréchal de Richelieu qu'il avait rencontré dans un de ses voyages cet être étrange qui semblait avoir au plus 40 ans se vantait d'être contemporain de ses ostrices il disait avoir vécu successivement dans l'intimité de Clovis de Barberousse de Mahomet et de François Ier, et donnait sur eux des détails si précis qu'ils mettaient en défaut les plus savants historiens. Bref, au lieu de se rajeunir, comme nous en avons tous la faiblesse, il se donnait près de deux mille ans, assurant qu'il connaissait le secret de ne pas vieillir. C'était le comte de Saint-Germain, un charlatan, interrompit Fabre. Toujours est-il poursuivit Cambacérès, qu'il possédait, et ceci est certain, le secret de fabriquer le diamant. Louis XV le pria d'en faire devant lui l'expérience qui réussit à souhait. Saint-Germain était donc riche à millions et son luxe, ses manières fantastiques, le mystère dont s'entourait son existence, firent la fable de la société parisienne tant que dura le règne de Madame de Pompadour. « C'était un vulgaire farceur, » fit Rodrère. « Cet homme, soi-disant immortel, était un simple espion au gage du roi de Prusse. Il est mort, très prosaïquement, dans le duché de S en 1780. C'est prouvé. »« Eh bien, moi, je l'ai vu, dès mes yeux, vu, » continua l'ex-archi-chancelier, sans répondre à l'interrupteur. « En quelle année ?» En 1796, sans emploi à cette époque, ruiné par la Révolution, 
je ne me décidai pas à quitter Paris. Je me fis donc inscrire au barreau et j'ouvris un cabinet de consultation. Peu à peu, les clients abondèrent et je me fis une réputation comme avocat. Un jour, j'entends sonner. Ma femme de ménage va ouvrir la porte. Un personnage se présente. Un personnage, entendez-vous, je ne peux me résoudre à dire un homme, tant sa physionomie était imposante. Ses vêtements étaient de bon goût, il portait de merveilleux diamants à ses doigts, à son col de chemise, au bouton des manches. Ce personnage s'annonça comme suédois. On avait voulu, disait-il, abuser à Paris de son peu d'expérience des affaires. Il voulait me consulter au sujet d'un procès qu'il entendait à un fournisseur. Nous causons, il était beau parleur, une sorte d'intimité s'établit entre nous. Si l'on peut donner ce nom à des visites qu'il multiplie sous prétexte de ses affaires et qu'il ne me permet jamais de lui rendre, car elle ne me désigne pas le lieu où il loge. Certains soirs, c'était précisément la veille de Noël, et c'est cette coïncidence qui éveille en mon esprit ce souvenir. La conversation de mon étrange ami avait pris un tour assez mystique. Il me parlait de Paracels et d'Averroès, un homme versé dans la magie et le cabalisme. Comme je le plaisantais à ce sujet, « Ne riez pas, maître Cambacérès, me dit-il. Encore un peu de temps et vous parviendrez, par votre seul mérite, à une élévation à laquelle en France aucun particulier avant vous ne sera monté. Les anciens chanceliers du royaume, en certaines circonstances, présidaient en conseil au siège les princes du sang. Vous, sans être monarque, présiderez en conseil de roi. Et cela, non pas une fois en passant, mais pendant plusieurs années. Vous ne mourrez pas dans cette place brillante. Ce qu'il ajouta importe peu reprit Cambacérès après un moment de silence et en passant la main sur son front. Lorsque je fus nommé second consul et plus tard archi-chancelier, les paroles de l'étranger prirent pour moi leur sens véritable. J'ai fait tous mes efforts pour le retrouver, j'ai mis en mouvement la police de toute l'Europe sans résultat. Je l'aurais certainement oublié si vers 1807, Entrant dans le salon de la vieille Madame de Coigny, mes regards n'avaient été attirés par un portrait d'homme dont la vue me causa une impression indicible. C'était lui. C'était son regard clair, son sourire narquois, son front inspiré, son teint pâle. Madame de Coigny, que j'interrogeais, m'apprit qu'elle possédait ce tableau depuis plus de quarante ans. « Et il représente » demandai-je. « Un fou, » répondit-elle, « un fou qui a fait l'amusement de notre jeunesse et qui s'appelait le comte de Saint-Germain. »« Bravo !» s'écria la motte Langon lorsque Cambacérès eut terminé son récit. « C'est un conte de Noël auquel rien ne manque, pas même le petit frisson de terreur indispensable. »« Prince, je suis certain que si pour retrouver votre homme, » Vous étiez adressé à Monsieur le Duc d'Otrante, vos recherches auraient eu meilleur succès. À moi, qui vous fait parler ainsi dit Fouché en relevant la tête, qu'il tenait depuis quelques instants appuyé sur sa main. Dame, n'êtes-vous pas, Monsieur le Duc, le grand éclaireur d'intrigue, le plus clairvoyant, le moins dupable des hommes Mais qu'avez-vous L'histoire du comte de Saint-Germain vous a-t-elle impressionné au point où tous les yeux se tournèrent vers Fouché Il était en effet d'une pâleur de marbre. Ses regards errèrent un moment sur les assistants, puis il haussa les épaules et reprit sa pose méditative. « Laissez-moi, » fit-il. « Réal parlera s'il le juge convenable. » Réal, un autre policier de génie, ne semblait pas plus à son aise. Il fit signe qu'il ne voulait rien dire. « Monsieur le comte, reprit Cambacérès, jamais je n'ai tant regretté de n'être plus le second de l'Empire. 
Jadis, j'eusse pu vous intimer l'ordre de nous instruire de ce que vous semblez savoir. Aujourd'hui, je ne puis que vous en prier, et je vous en prie avec insistance. Puisque votre Altesse l'exige, fit Réal, je ne puis m'obstiner dans mon refus. Mais tout d'abord, détrompez-vous. Messieurs le duc d'Otrante et moi avons passé dix ans et mis sur les dents vingt policiers à chercher vainement l'homme dont vous nous avez parlé. Et nous n'avons pu le retrouver. Il vous était donc apparu une fois, non pas à moi, mais à une autre personne. Et cette personne, c'était l'empereur. L'empereur avait vu le comte de Saint-Germain aux Tuileries Non pas. En Égypte, alors qu'il n'était encore que le général Bonaparte. Vous savez qu'en arrivant devant les pyramides, il ordonna qu'on décela la pierre qui fermait ce gigantesque tombeau des pharaons et il voulut pénétrer seul dans l'intérieur du monument. Au fond d'une salle sombre, derrière un sarcophage de granit, un homme se dressa devant lui. « Je l'attendais, » interrompit Redrère. « C'était Saint-Germain. »« Oh, ne plaisantez pas, » poursuivit gravement Réal. « C'était Saint-Germain, en effet. »« Et ce qu'il prédit à Bonaparte faisait encore trembler dix ans plus tard cet homme qui ne tremblait pas facilement. »« Que se passa-t-il entre ces deux êtres extraordinaires ?»« J'ignore les détails de leur entrevue. »« Je sais seulement, parce que l'empereur me l'a répété maintes fois, » que Saint-Germain lui prophétisa une destinée surhumaine, la conquête de l'Europe. Le trône d'Occident, toutes choses qui se sont depuis réalisées. Mais, ajouta le tomatouge, garde-vous de Moscou. De Moscou Irai-je donc Oui. En maître Saint-Germain hésita et répondit. En maître. « Alors, reprit le conquérant, le monde sera donc à moi ?»« Oui, mais toi, tu seras à Dieu. »« L'incroyable fortune qui t'attend serait un intolérable supplice si le dénouement de ton épopée t'était révélé. »« Va, accomplis ton œuvre. »« Mais garde-toi de Moscou. » Ces paroles fatidiques s'étaient si nettement gravées dans la mémoire de Napoléon que bien souvent, il me les répéta dans les termes mêmes que je viens de vous redire. Dès qu'il fut au pouvoir, il ne négligea rien pour savoir quel pouvait être l'homme qui lui avait dévoilé l'avenir. Tout fut inutile. Nous n'apprîmes rien. Mais qui dira l'influence qu'une telle entrevue a pu avoir sur le sort de la France Qui sait si cette prédiction n'a point donné à Bonaparte l'audace et la confiance en soi Nul n'était plus superstitieux que lui. Sa croyance en son étoile, son fatalisme, son mépris de la mort, tout cela ne semble-t-il pas indiquer qu'il marchait à coup sûr dans une voie toute droite vers un avenir dévoilé, jusqu'à ce fatal Moscou qui le fascinait, qui l'attirait, qu'il voulait conquérir et dompter, comme désireux d'échapper à l'oracle « Que croire ?» murmura Cambasserès dans ton rêveur. « Oui, que croire ?» répéta Réal. Le silence se fit dans le salon. Chacun rêvait au grand problème, et dans le lointain à toute volée, les cloches de Noël répondaient joyeuses, incomprises pourtant de ces hommes dont l'égoïste ambition avait desséché le cœur et dévoyé l'intelligence. End of En réveillon chez Cambasserès by G. Le Nôtre. The Wakefield Second Shepherd's Play by the Wakefield Master. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Wakefield Second Nativity Play
first shepherd. Lord, what, these weathers are cold, and I am ill-happed. I am near hand dulled, so long have I napped. My legs bend and fold, my fingers are chapped. It is not as I would, for I am all lapped in sorrow. In storms and tempests, now in the east, now in the west, woe is him has never rest, midday nor morrow. But we silly shepherds that walk upon the moor, in faith we are near hands out of the door. No wonder as it stands if we be poor. For the tilth of our lands lies fallow as the floor. We are so lamed, so taxed and shamed. We are made ham-tamed with these gentlery men. Thus they reave us of rest, our lady then wary. These men that are lord fest, they cause the plough terror. That men say is for the best. We find it contrary. Thus a husband's oppressed in point to miscarry in life. Thus hold they us under, thus they bring us in blunder, it were great wonder, and ever should we thrive. For may he get a paint sleeve, or a brooch now on days, woe is he that shall grieve, or once again says, dare no man him reprieve, what mastery he has, and yet may none believe one word that he says, no letter. He can make purveyance with boast and bragans, and all through maintenance of men that are greater. There shall come a swain as proud as a poe. He must borrow my wain, my plough also. Then I am full fain to grant or he go. Thus live we in pain, anger and woe by night and day. He must have if he longered, if I should forgang it, I were better be hanged than once say him nay. It does me good, as I walk thus by mine own, of this world for to talk in manner of moan. To my sheep will I stalk, and hearken anon, there abide on a bulk, or sit on a stone full soon. For I trow, party, true men if they be, we get more company, or it be noon. Second Shepherd Beniste and Dominus, what may this be mean? Why fares this world thus oft have we not seen? Lord, these weathers are spite us, and the weather full keen, and the frost so hideous, they water mine e'en, no lie. Now in dry, now in wet, now in snow, now in sleet, when my shoon freeze to my feet it is not all easy but as far as i can or yet as i go we silly wet men dream mickle woe we have sorrow then and then it falls often so silly cackle a hem both to and fro she cackles but begins she to croak to groan or to cluck woe is him say of our cock for he is in the shackles. These men that are wed have not all their will. When they are full hard stead, they sigh full still. God wait, they are led full hard and full ill. In bower nor in bed they say not there till this tide. My part of I found my lesson is learned. Woe is him that is bound, for he must abide. But now late in our lives a marvel to me that I think my heart rives such wonders to see. What that destiny drives it should so be. Some men will have two wives, and some men three in store. Some are woe that have any, but so far can I. Woe is he who has many, for he feels it sore. But young men of wooing for God that you bought, be well ware of wedding and think in your thought. Had I wished, is a thing it serves ye of naught. Mickle still morning has wedding home brought, and griefs with many a sharp shower, for thou may catch in an hour that shall serve thee full sour as long as thou lives. For as read I epistle, I have one to my fear as sharp as a thistle, as rough as a brier. She is browed like a bristle, 
with a sour Lenten cheer. Had she once wet her whistle, she could sing full clear her paternaster. She is as great as a whale, she has a gallon of gall, by him that died for us all, how would I had run till I lost her? First shepherd, God, look over the row, full deftly ye stand. Second shepherd, yea, the devil in thy moor, so tarry and so thou art now of door. First shepherd, yea, on a lay land, heard I him blow, he comes here at hand, not fast and still. Second shepherd, why? First shepherd, for he comes here, hope I. Second shepherd, he will make us both alive, but if we beware. Third shepherd, Christ cross me speed, and Saint Nicholas. Thereof had I need, it is worse than it was. Whoso could take heed, and let the world pass, it is ever in dread, and brittle as glass, and slithers. This world fared never so, with marbles more and more, now in weal, now in woe, and all things withers. Was never since Noah's flood such floods seen, winds and rain so rude, and storms so keen. Some stammered, some stood in doubt as I ween. Now God turn all to good, I say as I mean, for ponder. These floods, so they drown, both in fields and in town, they bear all down, and that is a wonder. We that walk in the nights our cattle to keep, we see sudden sights when other men sleep. Yet methinks my heart lights, I see shrews peep. Ye are too all whites, I will give my sheep a turn. But full ill have I meant, as I walk on this bent, I may lightly repent my toes if I spurn, Ah, sir, God you save, and master mine, a drink fain would I have, and somewhat to dine. First shepherd, Christ's curse, my knave, thou art a lazy hind. Second shepherd, what, the boilest rave, abide until sign we have made it, I'll thrift on thy pate, though the shrew came late, yet is he in state to dine if he had it. Third shepherd, such servants as I that sweats and swinks, eats our bread full dry, and that me for thinks. We are oft wet and weary when master men winks, yet comes full lately both dinners and drinks, but neatly. Both our dame and our sire, when we have run in the mire, they can nip at our hire and pay us full lately. But hear my truth, master. For the fare that ye make, I shall do there after work as I take. I shall do a little, sir, and strive and still lack, for yet lay my supper never on my stomach in fields. Where to should I sleep? With my staff can I leap? And men say, light, cheap, leatherly for yields. First shepherd, thou wert an ill lad to ride on wooing with a man that had but little of spending. Second shepherd, peace, boy, I bear no more jangling, or I shall make thee afraid by the heaven's king with thy gourds. Where are our sheep, boy, we scorn? Third shepherd, sir, this same day at morn, I them left in the corn, when they rang lords. They have passed you good, they cannot go wrong. First shepherd, that is right by the rood. These nights are long, yet I would, or we yod, one gave us a song. Second shepherd, so I thought as I stood to mirth us among. Third shepherd, a grant. First shepherd, let me sing the tenery. Second shepherd, and I the treble so high. Third shepherd, then the mean falls to me. Let's see how ye chant. Mac enters with a cloak thrown over his smock. Mac. Now, Lord, for thy name seven that made both moon and stars, well more than I can even thy will, Lord, of my thorns, I am all uneven that moves off my horns. Now would God I were in heaven, for there weep no bounds so still. First shepherd, who is that pipe so poor? Mac, 
Would God ye knew how I fare, Lo, a man that walks on the moor, And has not all his will. Second shepherd, Mac, where hast thou gone? Tell us tidings. Third shepherd, is he come? Then each one take heed to his things. Takes his cloak from him. Mac, what? I am a yeoman, I tell you, of the king, the self and the same, sent from a great lording, and such. Fie on you, get thee hence out of my presence, I must have reverence. Why, who be it? First shepherd, why make you it so quaint? Mac, ye do wrong. Second shepherd, but Mac, list ye sank? I trow that ye sang. Third shepherd, I trow the shrew can paint the devil, might him hang. Mac, I shall make complaint, and make you all to thwang at a word, and tell even how ye doth. First shepherd, but Mac, is that sooth? Now take out that southern tooth, and set in a turd. Second shepherd, Mac, the devil in ye e, a stroke would I lend you. Third shepherd, Mac, know ye not me? By God, I could tell you. Mac, God, look ye all three. My thought I had seen ye, ye are a fair company. First shepherd, can ye now moan you? Second shepherd, shrewd jape, thus late as thou goes, what will men suppose? And thou hast an ill noise of stealing of sheep. Mac, and I am true as steel, all men wait, but a sickness I feel that holds me full hate. My belly fares not well, it is out of its state. Third shepherd, seldom lies the devil dead by the gate. Mac, therefore full sore am I in ill, if I stand stock still, I eat not a needle this month and more. First shepherd, how fares thy wife? By my hood, how fair she? Mac lies weltering by the rood, by the fire, low, and a house full of brood. She drinks well, too. Ill speed other good that she will do, but so eats as fast as she can, and each year that comes to man she brings forth a lacken, and some years, too. But were I not more gracious and richer by far, I were eaten out of house and of harbour. Yet is she a foul dowse if ye come near. There is none that trows nor knows a war than can I. Now will ye see what I proffer to give all in my coffer to morrow next to offer her head mass penny. Second shepherd, I wot so for wakered is none in this shire. I would sleep if I take her less to my hire. Third shepherd, I am cold and naked, and would have a fire. First shepherd, I am weary for aked, and run in the mire. Wait thou. Second shepherd, nay, I will lie down by, for I must sleep truly. Third shepherd, as good a man's son was I as any of you. But, Mac, come hither between us, shalt thou like. Mac, then might I stay you be dean, of that ye would say no dread, from my head to my toe, mantis to was commendo, poncio pilato, Christ's cross me speed. He rises, the shepherd sleeping, and says, Now were time for a man that lacks what he would, to stalk privately then into a fold, and namely to work then, and be not too bold. He might abide the bargain if it were told at the ending. Now were time put a rebel, but he needs good counsel. That fain would fare well, and he but little spending. Mac works a spell on them. But about you a circle as round as a moon, Till I have done that I will, till that it be noon, That ye lie stone still till that I have done, And I shall say there till of good words a foin, on height. Over your heads my hand I lift, out go your eyes for to do your sight, but yet I must make better shift, and it be right. What, Lord, 
they sleep hard that may eat all here was i never a shepherd but now will i leer if the flock be scared yet shall i nap near who draws hitherward now mends our cheer from sorrow a fat sheep i dare say a good fleece dare i lay eft white when i may but this will i borrow he steals a sheep and goes home mac at his own door how jew art thou in get us some light his wife who makes such din this time of night i am set but a spin i hope not i might rise a penny to win i shrew them on height so fares a housewife that has been to be raised thus between there may no note be seen for such small chairs mac good wife open the heck seest thou not what i bring wife i may let thee draw the sneck ah oh, come in my sweeting mac yea thou dost not wreck of my long standing wife by thy naked neck thou art like for to hang mac go away i am worthy of my meat for in a strait can i get more than they that swink and sweat all the day long thus it fell to my lot jill i had such grace wife it were a foul blot to be hanged for the case mac i have skate jellot oft as hard as glass wife but so long goes the pot to the water men says at last comes it home broken mac well know i the token but let it never be spoken but come and help fast i would he were flain i list we'll eat of this twelve month was i not so fain of one sheep meat wife come they if he be slain and hear the sheep bleat mac then might i be tain that were a cold sweat go by the gate door wife yes mac for an they come at thy back mac then might i pay for all the pack of the devil of them walk wife a good bird have i spied since thou can none here shall we him hide till they be gone in my cradle abide let me alone and i shall lie beside in childbed and groan mac thou red and i shall say thou wast light of a knave child this night wife now well is my day bright that ever i was bred this is a good guise and a far cast yet a woman's advice helps at the last i care never who spies again go thou fast mac but i come or they rise else blows a cold blast i will go sleep mac goes back to the field yet sleep all this many and i shall go stalk privily as it had never been i that carried their sheep first shepherd resurrects or mortrius have hold my hand judas Carnas dominus i may not well stand my foot sleeps by jesus and i water fast and i thought that we laid us full near england second shepherd ah ye lord how i have slept wheel as fresh as an eel as light i me feel as leaf on a tree third shepherd ben stay be here in so my head quakes my heart is out of skin what so it makes who makes all this din so my brow aches to the door will i win heart fellows wakes we were four see ye anything of mac now first shepherd we were up ere thou second shepherd man i give god a vow yet heed he nowhere third shepherd methought he was wrapped in a wolf's skin first shepherd so are many hapt now namely within second shepherd when we had long napped methought with a gin a fat sheep he trapped but he made no dim third shepherd be still thy dream makes thee woo 
it is but phantom by the rood first shepherd now god turn all to good if it be his will second shepherd rise mac for shame thou liest right long mac now christ his holy name be us among what is this for saint james i may not well gang i trust i be the same ah oh, my neck has lain rang enough mickle thank since yester even now by saint stephen i was flayed with a swaven my heart out of slough i thought jill began to croak and travel full sad well nigh at the first cock of a young lad for to mend our flock then be i never glad to have two on my rock more than ever i had oh my head a house full of young thumbs the devil knock out their hands woe is he has many bounds and they're too little bread i must go home by your leave to jill as i thought i pray you look my sleeve that i steal not i am loath you to grieve or from you take aught third shepherd go forth ill might thou chief now would i we sought this morn that we had all our store first shepherd but i will go before let us meet second shepherd what third shepherd at the crooked thorn Mac at his own door again unto this door who is here how long shall i stand wife who makes such a stir now walk in the wenyan mac ah jill what cheer it is i mac your husband his wife then may we be here the devil in a band sir gile lo he cometh with a lot as he were holden in the throat i may not sit work or not a hand long while mac will ye hear what fare she makes to get her a glows and do naught but lakes and close her toes wife why who wanders who wakes who comes who goes who brews who bakes who makes for me this hose and then it is root to behold now in hot now in cold full woeful is the household that wants a woman but what end hast thou made with the herds mac mac the last word that they said when i turned my back they would look that they had their sheep all the pack i hope they will not be well paid when they their sheep lack but deep but how so the game goes to me they will suppose and make a foul noise and cry out upon me but thou must do as thou hight wife i accord me there till i shall swaddle him right in my cradle if it were a greater sight yet could i help till i will lie down straight come at me mac i will wife behind come colonies marrow they will nip us full narrow mac but i may cry out harrow the sheep if they find wife hearken i when they call they will come anon come and make ready all and sing by thine own sing lul a thou shalt for i must groan and cry out by the wall on mary and john for sore sing lul a full fast when thou hears at the last and but i play a false cast trust me no more re-enter the three shepherds third shepherd ah uh, call good morn why sleepest thou not first shepherd alas that ever was i born we have a foul blot a fat weather have we lawn third shepherd marry goddess for bot second shepherd who should do us that scorn that were a foul spot first shepherd some shrew i have sought with my dogs all horbury shrugs and of fifteen hogs found i but one you third shepherd now trust me if you will by saint thomas of kent either mac or jill was at that ascent first shepherd peace man be still i saw when he went thou slanderest him ill thou ought to repent good speed second shepherd now has ever might i thee if i should even hear thee 
I would say it were he that did that same deed. Third shepherd, on we thither I read, and run on our feet. May I never eat bread the truth till I wit. First shepherd, nor drink in my heed with him till I meet. Second shepherd, I will rest in no stead till that I him greet my brother. One I will hight till I see him in sight. Shall I never sleep one night there I do another. Third shepherd, will ye hear how they hack? Our sire, list how they croon. First shepherd, hard I never none crack so clear out of tune. Second shepherd, Mac, undo your door soon. Mac, who is it that spoke as it were noon? On loft, who is that, I say? Third shepherd, good fellows were it day mac as far as ye may good speak ye soft or a sick woman's head that is ill mate ease i had liefer be dead or she had any disease wife go to another stead i may not well queeze each foot that ye tread goes near make me sneeze so first shepherd Tell us, Mac, if ye may, how fare ye, I say, Mac, but are ye in this town to-day? Now how fare ye? Ye have run in the mire, and are wet yet. I shall make you a fire if ye will sit. A horse would I hire, think ye on it. Well quit is my hire, my dream, this is it. A season I have bands if ye knew, well more than ye knew, but we must drink as we brew, and that is but reason. I would ye dined ere ye yod, methink that ye sweat. Second shepherd, nay, neither men's our mood, drink nor meat. Mac, why, sir, ails ye aught but good? Third shepherd, yes, our sheep that we get are stolen as they yod. Our loss is great. Mac, sirs, drink is, had I been there, some should have brought it full dear. First shepherd, marry, some men trows that ye were, and that us forthink is. Second shepherd, Mac, some men trows that it should be ye. Third shepherd, either ye or your spouse, so say we. Mac. Now, if ye have supposed to Jill or to me, come and rip our house, and then may ye see who had her. If I any sheep got, either cow or stot, and Jill, my wife, rose not here since she laid her, as I am both true and leal to God, here I pray that this be the first meal I shall eat this day. First shepherd, Mac. As I have wheel, arise thee, I say. He learned timely to steal, that could not say nay. Wife, I swelt. How, thieves from my aunts, ye come to rob us for the nonce. Mac, hear ye not how she groans, your heart should melt. Wife, out, thieves from my barn, nigh him not thaw. Mac, knew ye how she had fun your hearts would be sore ye do wrong are you warm that thus comes before to a woman that has fun but i say no more wife ah my middle i pray to god so mild if ever are ye beguiled that i eat this child that lies in this cradle mac peace woman for god's pain and cry not so Thou spillest thy brain, and makes me full woe. Second shepherd, I know our sheep be slain. What find ye too? Third shepherd, all work we in vain, as well may we go. But, hatters, I can find no flesh, hard nor nesh, salt nor fresh, but two-toned platters. No cattle but this, tame nor wild, 
none as have i bliss as loud as he smiled why no so god me bliss and give me joy of my child first shepherd we have marked amiss i hold us beguiled second shepherd sir done sir our lady him save is your child a knave mac any lord might him have this child to his son when he wakens he skips that joy is to see third shepherd in good time be his steps and happy they be but who was his gossips tell now to me mac so fair fall their lips first shepherd aside hark now a lee mac so god them thank parkin and gibbon waller i say and gentle john horn in good fay he made all the garay with the great shank second shepherd mac friends will we be for we are all one mac why now i hold for me for help get i none farewell all three all glad were ye gone third shepherd fair words may there be but love there is none first shepherd gave ye the child anything second shepherd i trust not one farthing third shepherd fast again will i fling abide ye me there he returns to max cot mac take it to no grief if i come to thy barn mac nay thou dost me great reprieve and foul hast thou fun third shepherd the child will it not grieve that little day stan mac with your leave let me give you barn but sixpence mac nay go away he sleepers third shepherd methink he peepers mac when he wakens he weepers i pray you go hence third shepherd give me leave him to kiss and lift up the clout what the devil is this he has a long snout first shepherd he is marked amiss we wait ill about second shepherd ill spun wept i wis i cometh foul out i so he is like to our sheep third shepherd how gib may i peep first shepherd i trow kind will creep where it may not go second shepherd this was a quaint gourd and a far cast it was a high fraud third shepherd yea sirs was it let burn this board and bind her fast a false scord hangs at the last so shall thou will ye see how they swaddle his four feet in the middle i saw i never in a cradle a horned lad ere now mag peace bid i what let be your fare i am he that him gat and yond woman him bear first shepherd what devil shall he halt mac lo god makes air second shepherd let be all that now god give him care i saw wife a pretty child is he a sits upon a woman's knee a dilly down by dee to make a man laugh third shepherd i know him by the earmark that is a good token mac i tell you sirs ha ah, his nose was broken since then told me a clerk that he was forespoken first shepherd this is a false work i would fain be rocken get a weapon wife he was taken by an elf i saw it myself when the clock struck twelve was he misshapen second shepherd you two are right deft same in a stead third shepherd since they maintain their theft let's do them to dead mac if i trespass eft gird off my head with you will i be left first shepherd sirs do my red for this trespass we will neither ban nor flight fight nor jite but seize him tight and cast him in canvas
they toss Mac for his sins. First shepherd, as the three return to the fold, Lord, how I am sore in point for to trust, in faith I may no more, therefore will I rest. Second shepherd, as a sheep of seven score he weighed in my fist, for to sleep anywhere methink that I list. Third shepherd, now I pray you, lie down on this green. First shepherd, on these thefts yet I mean. Third shepherd, where to should ye teen? Do as I say you. Enter an angel above, who sings Gloria in excelsis then says rise hired men hang for now is he born that shall take from the fiend that adam had lorn that warlock to shamed this night is he born god is made your friend now at this morn he behests to bedlam go see there lies that free in a crib full poorly betwixt two beasts first shepherd this was a quaint stephen that ever yet i heard it is a marvel to nevin thus to be scared second shepherd o oh god son of heaven he spoke up word all the wood like the levin methought that he guard appeared third shepherd he spoke of a ban in bedlam are you warned First shepherd, that betokens yonder stan, let us seek him there. Second shepherd, say, what was his song? Heard ye not how he cracked it? Three breebs to a long? Third shepherd, yea, marry, he hacked it. Was no crotchet wronged, nor no thing that lacked it. First shepherd, for to sing us among, right as he necked it i can second shepherd let us see how ye croon can ye bark at the moon third shepherd hold your tongues have done first shepherd hark after then second shepherd to bedlam he bade that we should gang i am full feared that we tarry too lang third shepherd be merry and not sad of mirth is our sang everlasting glad our road may we fang without noise first shepherd i we thither quickly if we be wet and weary to that child and that lady we have it not to slows second shepherd we find by the prophecy let be your din of david and esau and more than i mean they prophesied by clergy that on a virgin should he light and leave to pardon our sin and slake it our kind from woe for esire said so cite virgo concipiet a child that is naked third shepherd full glad may we be and abide that day that lovely to see that all mights may lord well for me for once and for i might i kneel on my knee some word for to say to that child but the angel said in a crib was he laid he was poorly arrayed both meaner and mild first shepherd patriarchs that have been and prophets before they desired to have seen this child that is born they are gone full clean that have they lorn we shall see him i ween ere it be mourned by token when i see him and feel then though I full wheel, it is true as steel that prophets have spoken. To so poor as we are that he would appear, first find and declare by his messenger. Second shepherd, go we now, let us fare, the place is us near. Third shepherd, I am ready, and ya, go we in fear to that light. Lord, if thy wills be, we are lewd all three, thou grant us of thy glee to comfort thy wife. 
THE SHEPHERDS ARRIVE AT Bethlehem. FIRST SHEPHERD Hail, comely and clean, hail, young child, Hail, maker, as I mean, of a maiden so mild, Thou hast wed, I ween, off the warlock so wild, The false guiler of teen, now goes he beguiled, Lo, he merry is, lo, he laughs, my sweeting, a welcome meeting, I have given my greeting. Have a bob of cherries? Second shepherd. Hail, sovereign saviour, for thou hast us sought. Hail, freely leaf and flower that all thing has wrought. Hail, full of favour that made all of naught. Hail, I kneel and I cower. A bird have I bought into my band. Hail, little tiny mop. Of our creed thou art crop, I would drink in thy cup, Little day on. Third Shepherd Hail, darling dear, full of God he, I pray thee be near when that I have need, Hail, sweet is thy cheer, my heart would bleed, To see thee sit here in so poor weed, With no pennies. Hail, put forth thy doll, I bring thee but a ball, have and play thee withal, and go to the tennis. Mary, the Father of Heaven, God omnipotent that set all on leaven, his son as he sent, my name could he never, and laughed as he went. I conceived him full even through might as God meant, and knew is he born, he keep you from woe. I shall pray him so. Tell forth as ye go, and mind on this morn. First shepherd, farewell, lady, so fair to behold, With thy child on thy knee. Second shepherd, but he lies full cold, Lord, well is me, now we go forth, behold. Third shepherd, forsooth, already it seems to be told, Full oft, first shepherd, what grace we have fun second shepherd come forth now are we one third shepherd to sing are we bum let take on loft end of the wakefield second shepherd's play by the wakefield master this recording is by tony addison Welcome Yule, read in English. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Welcome, be thou heavenly king. Welcome, born on this morning. Welcome, for whom we shall sing. Welcome Yule. Welcome, be ye Stephen and John. Welcome, innocence everyone. Welcome, Thomas Martyr one. Welcome, Yule. Welcome, be a good new year. Welcome, twelfth day both in fear. Welcome, saints loved and dear. Welcome, Yule. Welcome, be a candlemas. Welcome, be a queen of bliss. Welcome, both to more and less. Welcome, Yule. Welcome, be ye that are here. Welcome all, and make good cheer. Welcome all another year. Welcome, Yule. End of Welcome, Yule. Read by Kangaroo. Little Wolf's Wooden Shoes A Christmas Story by Francoise Coppée Adapted and translated by Alma J. Foster. Read in English. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Wolf's Wooden Shoes by Alma J. Foster. Once upon a time, so long ago, 
that everybody has forgotten the date in a city in the north of europe with such a hard name that nobody can even remember it there was a little seven-year-old boy named wolf whose parents were dead who lived with a cross and stingy old aunt who never thought of kissing him more than once a year and who sighed deeply whenever she gave him a bowlful of soup but the poor little fellow had such a sweet nature that in spite of everything he loved the old woman although he was terribly afraid of her and could never look at her ugly old face without shivering as this aunt of little wolf was known to have a house of her own and an old woolen stocking full of gold she had not dared to send the boy to a charity school but in order to get a reduction in the price she had so wrangled with the master of the school to which little wolf finally went that this bad man vexed at having a pupil so poorly dressed and paying so little often punished him unjustly and even prejudiced his companions against him so that the three boys all sons of rich parents made a drudge and laughing-stock of the little fellow the poor little one was thus as wretched as a child could be and used to hide himself in corners to weep whenever christmas time came it was the schoolmaster's custom to take all his pupils to the midnight mass on christmas eve and to bring them home again afterward now as the winter this year was very bitter and as heavy snow had been falling for several days all the boys came well bundled up in warm clothes with fur caps pulled over their ears padded jackets gloves and knitted mittens and strong thick-soled boots only little wolf presented himself shivering in the poor clothes he used to wear both weekdays and sundays and having on his feet only thin socks in heavy wooden shoes his naughty companions noticing his sad face and awkward appearance made many jokes at his expense but the little fellow was so busy blowing on his fingers and was suffering so much with chilblains that he took no notice of them so the band of youngsters walking two and two behind the master started for the church it was pleasant in the church which was brilliant with lighted candles and the boys excited by the warmth took advantage of the music of the choir and the organ to chatter among themselves in low tones they bragged about the fun that was awaiting them at home the mayor's son had seen just before starting off an immense goose ready stuffed and dressed for cooking at the alderman's home there was a little pine tree with branches laden down with oranges sweets and toys and the lawyer's cook had put on her cap with such care as she never thought of taking unless she was expecting something very good then they talked too of all that the christ child was going to bring them of all he was going to put in their shoes which you might be sure they would take good care to leave in the chimney place before going to bed and the eyes of these little urchins as lively as a cage of mice were sparkling in advance over the joy they would have when they awoke in the morning and saw the pink bag full of sugar plums the little lead soldiers ranged in companies in their boxes the menagerie smelling of varnished wood and the magnificent jumping jacks in purple and tinsel alas little wolf knew by experience that his old miser of an aunt would send him to bed supperless but with childlike faith and certain of having been all the year as good and industrious as possible he hoped that the christ child would not forget him and so he too planned to place his wooden shoes in good time in the fireplace midnight mass over the worshippers departed eager for their fun and the band of pupils always walking two and two and following the teacher left the church now in the porch and seated on a stone bench set in the niche of a painted arch a child was sleeping a child in a white woolen garment but with his little feet bare in spite of the cold he was not a beggar for his garment was white and new and near him on the floor was a bundle of carpenter's tools in the clear light of the stars his face with its closed eyes shone with an expression of divine sweetness and his long curling blonde locks seemed to form a halo about his brow but his little child's feet 
made blue by the cold of this bitter december night were pitiful to see the boys so well clothed for the winter weather passed by quite indifferent to the unknown child several of them sons of the notables of the town however cast on the vagabond looks in which could be read all the scorn of the rich for the poor of the well-fed for the hungry but little wolf coming last out of the church stopped deeply touched before the beautiful sleeping child oh dear said the little fellow to himself this is frightful this poor little one has no shoes and stockings in this bad weather and what is still worse he has not even a wooden shoe to leave near him to-night while he sleeps into which the little christ child can put something good to soothe his misery and carried away by his loving heart wolf drew the wooden shoe from his right foot laid it down before the sleeping child and as best he could sometimes hopping sometimes limping with his sock wet by the snow he went home to his aunt look at the good-for-nothing cried the old woman full of wrath at the sight of the shoeless boy what have you done with your shoe you little villain little wolf did not know how to lie so although trembling with terror when he saw the rage of the old shrew he tried to relate his adventure but the miserly old creature only burst into a frightful fit of laughter aha so my young gentleman strips himself for the beggars aha my young gentleman breaks his pair of shoes for a bare foot here is something new forsooth very well since it is this way i shall put the only shoe that is left into the chimney-place and i'll answer for it that the christ child will put in something to-night to beat you with in the morning and you will have only a crust of bread and water to-morrow and we shall see if the next time you will be giving your shoes to the first vagabond that happens along and the wicked woman having boxed the ears of the poor little fellow made him climb up into the loft where he had his wretched cubbyhole desolate the child went to bed in the dark and soon fell asleep but his pillow was wet with tears but behold the next morning when the old woman awakened early by the cold went downstairs oh wonder of wonders she saw the big chimney filled with shining toys bags of magnificent bonbons and riches of every sort and standing out in front of all this treasure was the right wooden shoe which the boy had given to the little vagabond yes and beside it the one which she had placed in the chimney to hold the bunch of switches as little wolf attracted by the cries of his aunt stood in an ecstasy of childish delight before the splendid christmas gifts shouts of laughter were heard outside the woman and child ran out to see what all this meant and behold all the gossips of the town were standing around the public fountain what could have happened oh a most ridiculous and extraordinary thing the children of the richest men in the town whom their parents had planned to surprise with the most beautiful presents had found only switches in their shoes then the old woman and the child thinking of all the riches in their chimney were filled with fear but suddenly they saw the priest appear his countenance full of astonishment just above the bench placed near the door of the church in the very spot where the night before a child in a white garment and with bare feet in spite of the cold had rested his lovely head the priest had found a circlet of gold embedded in the old stones then they all crossed themselves devoutly perceiving that this beautiful sleeping child with the carpenter's tools had been jesus of nazareth himself who had come back for one hour just as he had been when he used to work in the home of his parents and reverently they bowed before this miracle which the good god had done to reward the faith and the love of a little child end of little wolf's wooden shoes read by betty b